Reading 1. Behavioral Biases Behavioral Finance Micro, BFMI, examines behavioral biases of individual investors that differ from rational decision makers of traditional finance. BFMA, which is Behavioral Finance Macro, detects and describes market anomalies that distinguish markets from efficient markets of traditional finance. There are two types of BFMI, cognitive errors and emotional biases. Cognitive errors are basic statistical information processing or memory errors that cause the decision to deviate from rational decisions. Emotional biases arise spontaneously as a result of attitudes and feelings that can cause decision to deviate from rational decision. Cognitive errors are more easily corrected because individuals are better able to adapt their behaviors or modify their processes if the source of the bias is logically identifiable, even if not completely understood. There are altogether 15 types of behavioral biases in Reading 1. Nine types are of cognitive errors, and six types are emotional biases. The nine types of cognitive errors are divided into belief perseverance biases, aka cognitive dissonance, and information processing bias. Under belief perseverance, there are five. One, conservatism bias. Two, confirmation bias. Three, representativeness bias. Four, illusion of control bias and 5. Hindsight Bias. Under the Information Processing Biases, there are 4. Anchoring and Adjustment Bias, Mental Accounting Bias, Framing Bias, and Availability Bias. There are 6 types of emotional biases. 1. Loss Aversion Bias. 2. Overconfidence, aka Illusion of Knowledge which is intensified when combined with self-attribution bias, 3. Self-control bias, 4. Status quo bias, 5. Endowment, and 6. Regret aversion bias. Belief perseverance bias is a tendency to cling to one's previously held beliefs irrationally. It's closely related to cognitive dissonance, which is a mental discomfort that occurs when new information conflicts with previously held beliefs or cognitions. Information processing errors describe how information may be processed and used illogically or irrationally in financial decision making. Emotional biases most likely cannot be corrected, so you must recognize the bias and adapt to it in most cases. Now let's look at cognitive errors. First, belief perseverance bias. One. Conservatism bias. People maintain prior views of forecasts by inadequately incorporating new information, aspect of both statistical and information processing errors, overweight initial beliefs and underweight new information. Consequences are that they maintain or are slow to update a forecast, opt to maintain prior belief rather than deal with mental stress of updating beliefs given complex data, which is also called cognitive cost, the effort to process information, detection and guidance to overcome conservatism bias. The first step is to be aware that this bias exists. Are you ignoring new information? Are you not changing existing views or beliefs? Are you overreacting to easy information only, i.e. ones that have low cognitive cost? When there's new information, ask, how does this change my forecast? React decisively to new information. Conduct careful analysis incorporating new information and respond appropriately. If information is difficult, seek advice from a professional. 2. Confirmation bias. People tend to look for and notice what confirms their beliefs and ignores or undervalues what contradicts their beliefs. Has aspects of selective exposure, perception, and retention i.e. selection bias. Information is considered positive if it supports their belief. Consequences of the confirmation bias is consider only positive information and ignore negative information, develop screening criteria that ignores information that refutes validity of screening criteria, and as a result, 
fail to identify good investments while bad investments meet criteria. Under diversify portfolio by building large position in companies they're convinced are good investments, for example, stock of employer. And therefore, it leads to excessive exposure to risk. Detection and guidance to overcome bias may be corrected or reduced by actively seeking out information that challenges your beliefs. Get corroborating support for an investment decision to assure that a good investment is being made. For example, fundamental research on the company, industry, or sector information. Always do additional research. 3. Representativeness bias. People tend to classify new information based on past experiences and classifications. They believe their classifications are appropriate and place undue weight on them. When confronted with new information, they use those personal categories even if new information does not fit. New information is familiar or representative of elements already classified, but can actually be very different. There are two types of representativeness bias. One is base rate neglect, which is the probability of the categorization not being adequately considered. They rely on stereotypes to categorize and draw conclusions about the risks and rewards, and it's an easy alternative to diligent research. The second type of representativeness bias is sample size neglect. Incorrectly assumes that small sample sizes are representative of populations. Consequences of representativeness bias is overweighting new information and in small samples. Adopt a view or forecast based almost exclusively on new information or a small sample. When hiring an investment manager, may only look at one to three years of returns, leading to high investment manager turnover. Update beliefs using simple classification, for example, if investor bought stock based on high earnings growth period but company announces lower growth, investor could just sell it instead of deciphering fundamental impact. They buy into the fund immediately following rapid price appreciation because investor categorizes it as good funds based on recent information. Results in reliance on recent performance and excessive trading leading to inferior performance results. Detection and guidance to overcome representativeness bias includes using an asset allocation strategy to increase the likelihood of better long-term portfolio returns, invest in diversified portfolio to meet financial goal and stick with it. Questions to ask yourself are, how does the fund under consideration perform relative to similar sized and similar styled funds? What is the tenure of the managers and advisors at the fund? Are the managers well known or highly regarded? Has the fund consistently pursued its strategy or has its style drifted during different market conditions? Use the periodic table of investment returns to emphasize the importance of diversification because you can clearly see that asset class returns are highly variable over time. If base rate neglect or sample size neglect may be present, ask yourself, what is the probability that the investment belongs to this classified group versus another? 4. Illusion of control bias. People tend to believe that they can control or influence outcomes when in fact they cannot makes inferred casual connections where none exists, displays surprisingly great certainty in their predictions for the outcomes of chance events. Consequences of illusion of control bias includes trading more than prudent, leading to excessive trading and leading to lower realized returns, inadequately diversifying portfolios. Research shows that some investors prefer to invest in companies they work for, leading them to hold concentrated positions because they believe they have control over the firm. Detection and guidance to overcome illusion of control bias is, firstly, recognize that successful investing is a probabilistic activity. Seek contrary opinions and views. Ask yourself, why am I making this investment? Is this part of the overall plan? What are the downside risks? When will I sell? It is critical to keep records including rationale and important features of each investment made. 5. Hindsight bias. Bias in which people see past events as having been predictable and reasonable to expect. People tend to remember their own predictions of the future as more accurate than they actually were because they are biased by the knowledge of what actually happened. People fill in the gaps with what they prefer to believe. 
aspects of selective perception and retention. Consequences of hindsight bias are overestimate the degree to which they predicted an investment outcome, thus giving them a false sense of confidence, unfairly assessing money managers or security performance because performance is compared against what has happened as opposed to expectations. For example, money manager may rank high compared to peers, but unfairly compared to another sector. Detection and guidance to overcome hindsight bias include Ask yourself, am I rewriting history or being honest about my mistakes? Must recognize and come to terms with mistakes. Need to carefully record and examine investment decisions, both good and bad. Should constantly remind yourself that markets move in cycles and good managers stick to their strategies. All managers should be evaluated to the appropriate benchmarks and peer groups, and education is critical. Now moving on to cognitive errors of information processing biases. 6. Anchoring and adjustment bias. Look for this when there is a number given in the question as an anchor. It's a bias in which the use of psychological heuristic influences the way people estimate probabilities. People begin by envisioning some initial default number, i.e. anchor, which they then adjust up or down based on given information and analysis. The end result approximations are then biased, closely related to conservatism bias. They place undue weight on anchor because people are generally better at estimating relative comparisons than absolute figures. Consequences of anchoring and adjustment bias include they may stick too closely to their original estimates when given new information. Detection and guidance to overcome anchoring and adjustment bias includes Consciously ask questions that may reveal anchoring and adjustment bias, such as, am I holding onto this stock based on rational analysis, or am I sticking to a price I'm anchored to, such as the purchase price or high watermark? Is my forecast based on rational analysis, or am I anchored to last year's market levels of ending security prices? 7. Mental accounting bias. Bias in which people treat one sum of money differently from another, equal sum, based on mental accounts. If this arises from arbitrary classifications as the source of money, for example, salary, bonus, inheritance, gambling, or planned use of the money, for example, for leisure or necessities. Consequences of mental accounting bias is it combines assets with high correlations, therefore leading to higher risk. Irrationally distinguish returns from income versus capital appreciation. For example, chase income streams but invest in high risk to do that and this erodes the principle. Detection and guidance to overcome mental accounting bias includes recognize the drawbacks from this behavior such as high correlation in separate buckets leading to higher risk. Put all assets from different mental accounts on one spreadsheet to see the true allocation on a portfolio basis, focusing on total return. 8. Framing bias. Bias in which a person answers a question differently based on the way the question is asked or framed, i.e., how information is processed depends on how the question is asked. The framing is partly because of how the problem is formulated and partly because of the norms, habits, and personal characteristics of the decision maker. Narrow framing is when information is processed on a narrow frame of reference. People lose sight of the big picture and focuses on one or two specific points. Consequences of the framing bias is willingness to accept risk, which can be influenced by how situations are presented, for example, risk tolerance questionnaires, misidentify risk tolerance because of how questions about risk tolerance were framed, choose suboptimal investments, focus on short-term price fluctuations resulting in excessive trading, Detection and guidance to overcome framing bias. Ask questions such as, is the decision the result of focusing on the net gain or a net loss position? Try to be as neutral and open-minded as possible when interpreting investment-related situations. Number nine, availability bias. People take a heuristic or rule of thumb or mental shortcut approach to estimating the probability of an outcome because those approaches are readily available in their minds 
as thoughts, ideas, or images. Draw on our biased memory of more recent events. Sources of availability bias include retrievability, comes to mind more quickly, categorization, when solving problems, gather information based on familiar categorizations, narrow range of experience, uses too narrow a frame of reference because experience is limited, and resonance, which is how closely a situation parallels their own. Consequences of the availability bias are investment choices are influenced by how easily information is recalled. Investment is chosen based on advertising rather than on thorough analysis of options. Limit their investment opportunity because they use familiar classification schemes. Fail to diversify because their choices are based on a narrow range of experience. And fail to achieve an appropriate asset allocation because they invest in companies that match their personal likes and dislikes. Detection and guidance to overcome availability bias are Develop an appropriate investment policy statement. Carefully research and analyze investment decisions before making them and focus on long-term results. This disciplined approach will prevent investor from overemphasizing the most recent financial events based on easy recall. Establish suitable asset allocations based on return objectives, risk tolerances, and constraints. Ask questions such as, how did I decide on this investment? because of familiarity with industry or country, realize that we only remember the last few years. Also realize that events that get heavy media attention may not be as important as made out to be and could be inaccurate or biased. Now let's look at emotional biases. 1. Loss aversion bias. When people tend to strongly prefer avoiding losses as opposed to achieving gains, Utility derived from a gain is much lower than utility given up with an equivalent loss. Disposition effect. Holding or not selling investments that have experienced losses too long and selling investments that have experienced gains too quickly. Myopic loss aversion. Combination of loss aversion and a tendency of people to evaluate outcomes more frequently even if they have long-term investment goals. House money effect. Profit from a trade is viewed differently from other money, so engages in additional risky behavior with it. Consequences of loss aversion bias are holding investments in a loss position longer than justified by fundamental analysis, selling investments in a gain position earlier than justified by fundamental analysis, limiting the upside potential of a portfolio by selling winners and holding losses, trade excessively as a result of selling winners when combined with framing bias, people engage in more risk when they suffer loss, and when they have gained, they don't want to engage in any risk. Detection and how to overcome loss aversion bias is having a disciplined approach to investing based on fundamental analysis. 2. Overconfidence bias. People demonstrate unwarranted faith in their own intuitive reasoning, judgments, and or cognitive abilities overestimates knowledge levels, abilities, and access to information, aka illusion of knowledge bias. Overconfidence may be intensified when combined with self-attribution bias, which is a bias in which people take credit for successes and assigns blame for failures. And there are two types of self-attribution bias, self-enhancing, which is claiming credit, and self-protecting, which is denial of personal responsibility for failures. Has aspects of both cognitive and emotional, but primarily emotional, bias. There are two basic types of overconfidence bias. Prediction overconfidence, which incorporates far too little or narrow variation in expected payoffs, i.e. lower standard deviation of returns. And certainty overconfidence, which is probabilities assigned to an outcome is too high because they are too certain of their judgments. Consequences of overconfidence bias includes underestimating risks and overestimating expected returns, holding poorly diversified portfolios, trading excessively, experiencing lower returns than market. For example, average mutual fund performance always trails the market. Detection and guidance to overcome overconfidence bias includes should review their trading records, identify winners and losers, 
calculate portfolio performance over at least two years, which will force them to acknowledge that their belief of higher number of winners will be struck with reality. When engaged in excessive trading, calculate return of every trade to see detrimental effect of excessive trading. Provide more information and education because overconfidence is also cognitive bias. Be objective when making and evaluating investments. Perform post-investment analysis on both successful and unsuccessful investments. Ask questions such as, when did you make money? When did you lose money? Did you make an investment based on fundamentals? Or did you luck out by timing the market? Did you make an error selling the investment? Or was the market correcting? 3. Self-control bias When people fail to act in pursuit of their long-term overarching goals because they lack self-discipline. Lack of self-control may also be a function of hyperbolic discounting which is a tendency to prefer small payoffs now compared to larger payoffs in the future. Consequences of self-control bias includes saving insufficiently for the future, and upon realizing that their savings are insufficient, they accept too much risk to generate higher returns, or it causes asset allocation imbalance problems, for example, preferring income-producing in assets in order to have income to spend. Detection and guidance to overcome self-control bias includes should ensure that a proper investment plan is in place and should have a personal budget. Plans need to be in writing so that they can be reviewed regularly. Need to maintain a proper balance in asset allocations and adhere to savings plan and asset allocation strategies. 4. Status quo bias. When people choose to do nothing instead of making a change. They're more comfortable keeping things the same and thus do not necessarily look for opportunities where change is beneficial. The outcome is similar to endowment bias and regret aversion bias, but in status quo, positions are maintained because of inertia instead of conscious decisions. Consequences of status quo bias includes unknowingly maintaining portfolios with risk characteristics that are inappropriate for their circumstances and failing to explore other opportunities. Detection and guidance to overcome status quo bias includes education is essential and should quantify the risk reducing and risk enhancing advantages of diversification and proper asset allocation. 5. Endowment bias. When people value an asset more when they hold rights to it than when they do not. Ownership endows the asset with added value. They may irrationally hold on to securities they already own, which is particularly true with inherited investments, and are often resistant to selling even in the face of poor prospects. Consequences of endowment bias includes failing to sell off certain assets and replacing them with other assets, maintaining an inappropriate asset allocation, continuing to hold classes of assets they're familiar with, thinking they understand the characteristics of the investment more. Detection and guidance to overcome endowment bias includes In the case of inherited investments, ask If an equivalent amount was received in cash instead, how would I invest it? Moderate emotions by learning emotional intelligence resources. Review historical performance and risk of new and unfamiliar securities and start with small purchase to get comfortable. Finally, number six, regret aversion bias. When people tend to avoid making decisions out of fear that the decision will turn out poorly, they try to avoid the pain or regret from bad decisions. Error of commission is when there's regret from taking an action, and error of omission is regret from action that could have been taken. Consequences of regret aversion bias are hold on to positions too long because they fear the position will increase after they sell, Keep them out of market after sharp gains or losses, even though timing is right. They're too conservative in their investment choices as a result of poor outcome from past. Engage in hurting behavior in popular investments. Detection and guidance to overcome regret aversion bias includes education is essential. Quantify the advantages of diversification and proper allocation of assets. For example, reduces risk, enhances returns. 
recognize that losses happen to everyone and keep in mind the long-term benefits of including risky assets in portfolio. Reading 2. Behavioral Finance and Investment Processes The general uses of behavioral finance are an investor's background, past experiences, and attitudes can play a significant role in decisions made during the asset allocation process. Practitioners can attempt to recognize relevant behavioral tendencies before making investment decisions, and it leads to better investment outcomes. Limitations of investor types is behavioral patterns are not consistent. Individuals may exhibit both cognitive and emotional biases, so can't classify as one or the other. May be possible to determine which is more dominant, though. Individuals may exhibit traits of multiple investor types. Behaviors can change as people age. Treatment will have to be unique or tailored even if investor type is same as someone else. And people act irrationally and unpredictably at different times, for example, during market or personal stress. Models of investor psychographics and types. One of the old school of thought is the Barnwell two-way model. It's a simple investor type between passive and active investors. Passive is described as investors that became wealthy passively, for example, through inheritance, managers, corporate execs, lawyers or CPAs at large firms, etc. There is a greater need for security and low risk tolerance. Active investors are described as investors that actively created their wealth, risked their own capital, higher risk tolerance for risk than need for security. They believe in themselves, but if they sense loss of control, their risk tolerance goes down. The second old school of thought for investor psychographics is the Baylard Beal Kaiser five-way model. There are two axes. From left to right is careful and impetuous, whether the investor is methodical, careful, and analytical, or whether they're emotional, intuitive, and impetuous. And the top to bottom axis is confident, anxious. The top is confident. How confidently the investor approaches life, regardless of if it is their approach to career, health, money, etc. From left bottom, careful, anxious is a guardian. They're cautious and concerned about the future. They want to protect their assets and may seek advice from those that are more knowledgeable. Then top left is careful. But confident, which is an individualist. They're independent and confident, and they make their own decision after careful analysis, and they're pleasant to advise. Top right is confident and impetuous, which is an adventurer. They're confident, willing to take chances, may hold highly undiversified portfolios, reluctant to take advice, and they're challenging to advise. And bottom right is anxious and impetuous, which is a celebrity. They like to be the center of attention, hold opinions, but to a certain extent recognize their limitations and may be willing to take advice. And right in the middle is a straight arrow. They are sensible and secure, willing to take on some risk for commensurate return. Newer school of thought, more modern psychographic modeling, is Pompian's early works identifying four behavioral investor types, or BITs. But this approach uses bottom-up to diagnose and treat behavioral biases, which involved first testing for all behavioral biases of a client. So the new approach introduces a top-down approach to bias identification that's similar and more efficient, which is called the behavioral alpha process. It is essentially a shortcut to efficiently identifying biases to determine which type of bias dominates. More on behavioral alpha process. Step one is to test for risk tolerance and active passive traits. Initial Q&A with client to understand objectives, constraints, tolerance for accepting risk in the portfolio. Based on answers from the questionnaire, step two is to plot the investor on the passive to active scale. And also, on a low to high risk tolerance scale. Based on that, you can plot if their investment style is conservative on the left, or moderate, or growth, or aggressive on the right. 
then step three is to test for behavioral biases. And you can plot them based on primarily emotional on the left, primarily cognitive, primarily cognitive, or on the very right, primarily emotional again. You can also see what kind of biases are observed. On the left, emotional biases that are consistent with passive investors that have low risk tolerance and are conservative, but also primarily emotional, have endowment bias, loss aversion, status quo, regret aversion, and cognitively they have mental accounting and anchoring and adjustment. Then in the second column, if they are moderately passive, moderately low risk tolerance, moderate investment style, and have primarily cognitive bias, then their emotional bias observed has regret aversion, and their cognitive may be availability, hindsight, and framing. On the very right, investors that are very active and have high risk tolerance and are aggressive in their investment style and are primarily emotional, have overconfidence and self-control bias, and illusion of control bias. Based on those four columns, we can classify the investor into a BIT, or behavioral investor type. On the very left, we have passive preserver, then we have friendly follower, then independent individualist, and active accumulator. You can remember it as PFIA, P-P-F-F-I-I-A-A. Passive preserver wants financial security and preserve wealth. How to advise them is instead of detail, lay out the big picture, like what the money will accomplish, for example, legacy, education, etc. Then we have FF, friendly follower. They tend to follow leads like the most popular stocks. To advise them, be careful not to suggest too many hot ideas. They generally like to comply and likes to be educated because they're primarily cognitive. Then the third column is independent individualist. They are pretty active investors. They have pretty high risk tolerance. They have a growth investment style, primarily cognitive in bias. Independent individualists are comfortable taking risk. They don't like following plans and they maintain their own opinions. They're willing to listen if the advice respects their intelligence and you must have regular discussions with them. Finally, on the very right, we have Active Accumulator, AA. They have the most active investor type, high risk tolerance, aggressive investment style, primarily emotional bias. They're entrepreneurial, first generation to create wealth, strong-willed, confident, hands-on investing. And to advise them, you have to take control of the situation and prove your knowledge and ability. Give them less decision-making power. By adding behavioral factors to the IPS, benefits include insights that can strengthen client-advisor relationship. This allows advisor and client to comfortably adhere to portfolio that fulfills the client's long-term goals. However, investment advisors may not feel comfortable asking their clients psychological or behavioral questions, especially at the beginning, but this should not deter an advisor from asking and considering behavioral factors. There are four characteristics of a successful advisor-client relationship. One, advisor understands client's financial goals, and these are developed into the IPS. And behavioral finance can help advisors discern why investors set goals they do which can deepen the bond and produce better investment outcomes. Two, advisor maintains a systematic, consistent approach to advising the client. And behavioral finance can become part of that discipline, adding professionalism and structure to that relationship and allowing the advisor to understand the client better. Three, advisor invests as the client expects and results are communicated regularly. In many unfortunate instances, advisor doesn't deliver on client expectations because the advisor does not understand them. So, 
Behavioral finance helps advisor take a step back and understand the client's motivations. And four, the relationship benefits both client and advisor. Behavioral finance can strengthen the bond, which will also benefit the advisor's work life. Advisor can also get new clients and keep them if client feels that the advisor understands their goals. Some limitations of traditional risk tolerance questionnaires are Framing of questionnaire can generate different results when asked repeatedly to the same individual. Many risk tolerance questionnaires are only administered once, even though they should be regularly revisited. Risk tolerance can change as life stages change or events occur. Many advisors interpret the results too literally, may fail emotionally biased individuals, and thus questionnaire may work better as a diagnostic tool for institutional investors compared to individual retail investors. This is how behavioral factors influence portfolio construction. 1. Inertia and default. Per status quo bias, inertia makes them not change their asset allocations through time. They stick with the default option in terms of contribution rates in investment funds, even if it is not optimal in terms of risk return profile. Some companies have introduced autopilot strategies to counteract inertia. For example, for a DC pension plan, they have target date fund glide path, where at a certain date, fund allocation changes from risky to less risky assets. Two. Simple heuristics is used to naively diversify, for example, using 1 over n diversification equally among assets due to regret aversion. 3. Invests too much in their employer company stock because familiarity and overconfidence, naive extrapolation of past returns, framing from company and status quo bias, loyalty and financial incentives. 4 behavioral factor also results in excessive trading driven by overconfidence and investors tend to sell winners and hold on to losers which is the disposition effect and five home bias where investor invests 80 percent or more in securities in their country which is driven by availability confirmation illusion of control endowment and status quo bias Unlike the mean variance portfolio that is constructed as a whole, behavioral portfolios are constructed layer by layer where each layer is associated with a goal and is filled with securities that correspond to that goal and covariance between assets is overlooked that way. For example, imagine for a traditional mean variance portfolio, you have foreign stocks, large cap, small cap, bonds, cash, and all the covariance between assets are considered and diversified. But in a behavioral portfolio, because of a mental accounting approach where there are layers and each layer is invested differently, so diversification is not really achieved, but advisors can use this to construct an IPS where there are different goals. Let's discuss how analysts work, which includes research, judgment, forecast, decisions, and conclusions may be affected by behavioral biases and cognitive dissonance. The following are how they affect the analysts and remedial actions for that. Behavioral biases that affect analysts include overconfidence, i.e. unwarranted faith in their own intuitive reasoning, judgments, and or cognitive abilities. Illusion of knowledge. People generally do a poor job of estimating probabilities, but they believe they do it well because they believe they are smarter and more informed than they actually are, i.e. they have more access to information so they must be smarter, is what they think. Self-attribution bias. They take credit for successes and blame others for failures, which influence their analysis and forecasts. Representativeness. Analyst judges the probability of a forecast being correct by considering how much the outcome resembles overall available data. If additional information or detail appears to conform to the overall scenario, even if it is irrelevant, they'll be more confident because they use their own categorization. Availability bias gives undue weight to more accessible, readily recalled information. 
illusion of control, attempting to collect more information adds to overconfidence in their forecast, and because they think that collecting more information means they have more control, they think that they can out control the outcome. Hindsight bias, thinking I knew it all along effect, which can make analysts blind to future risks because they don't analyze post-investment. Remedial actions for overconfidence is prompt and accurate feedback combined with structure that rewards accuracy, which can help analysts to reevaluate their processes and self-calibrate. Providing incentives, which doesn't have to be financial reward. For example, if individual is directly accountable for the accuracy of the data. Analysts should make the conclusions as explicit as possible, provide at least one counterargument in the report, and consider if sample size is too small. Remedial actions for hindsight bias includes well-structured feedback with written documentation on decision or forecast and rationale, make unambiguous forecasts, feedback or systematic review process, Analysts should incorporate additional information with Bayesian approach, i.e. update their base rate probability with probabilities of new forecast. Analysts can also have behavioral bias when they come across company management's information in their analysis. For example, framing, anchoring, and adjustment. For example, management presentation describing specific successes or selecting favorable comparisons. Availability bias, for example, management starts with summary of results and achievements. And self-attribution from company executives or overconfidence, illusion of control biases, can have impact on analyst forecasts and judgment. Remedial actions include focusing on metrics and comparable data rather than descriptive or unverifiable information, and framing the issue appropriately instead of blindly following the management's framing. Analysts' bias in conducting research includes collecting too much unstructured, detailed information, which may lead to illusion of knowledge and control, overconfidence and representativeness, confirmation bias, confirming prior beliefs, probabilities, gambler's fallacy, misunderstanding that wrongly believes reversal to mean in the long term. Remedial actions include focusing on objective data such as trailing earnings instead of forward earnings, evaluating previous forecasts, collecting information in a structured, systematic way, using metrics and ratios for comparability, giving prompt feedback, and documentation of their forecasts, rationale, and data. Behavioral factors also affect investment committees. For example, social proof. Individuals are biased to follow the beliefs of a group. Groups may amplify individual behavioral biases. The group has more confidence in its decisions, leading to overconfidence. All individual biases can be present in investment committee decisions as well. Committees are notoriously known for not learning from experience. Individuals may moderate their views or just agree to reach consensus. Techniques for mitigating these effects include having a chair of the committee, ensuring effectiveness of the group's decision making. For example, assemble a group of diverse individuals with relevant skills and experiences and create a culture where members can express dissenting views and actively encourage alternative opinions. Members should actively contribute their information and knowledge and not fall into consensus for the sake of harmony. Respect each other and maintain analysts' self-esteem. Now switching gears, let's look at how behavioral factors and biases can lead to market characteristics. Market anomalies are persistent abnormal returns that differ from zero and are predictable in direction. Anomalies behavior can be indicative of shortcomings in the underlying asset pricing model. If a reasonable change in the method of estimating abnormal returns causes an anomaly to disappear, then it is reasonable to suggest that it is an illusion. Some apparent anomalies may be explained by small samples involved, 
a statistical bias in selection or survivorship, or overanalyzing, data mining for patterns that aren't true. From time to time, markets can present temporary disequilibrium behavior, unusual features that may disappear after a few hours. But the following are some market anomalies caused by investor behavioral biases that persist. First is momentum. This is more common in illiquid asset categories in which trading may not be continuous and investors believe that changes in prices may capture private information, so they partake in the investment, which adds to the momentum, i.e. herding behavior. Partly explained by short-term underreaction to relevant information and long-term overreaction. Availability bias or recency effect are observed where investor rationale for partaking in the investment momentum is based on recent experience they recall. Regret and hindsight bias are also observed, where investor feels they could have predicted something and don't want to regret again, so they fuel the momentum. Trend chasing effect, where investor buys investment they wish they had owned the previous year. Disposition effect, which includes an emotional bias to loss aversion which will encourage investors to hold on to losers, which is related to the gambler's fallacy, where investors hold on to losers because they believe the stock price will revert back to the mean. Second is bubbles and crashes. They are defined as periods of significant overvaluation or undervaluation that persist for more than one year, aka when a price index for an asset class trades more than two standard deviations outside its historic trend. Bubbles typically develop slowly versus crashes are typical of 30% fall within several months. In bubbles, investors exhibit overconfidence and are linked to confirmation bias and self-attribution bias and illusion of knowledge due to noise or irrelevant information. Regret aversion can also lead investors to partake in bubbles so they don't miss out. As a bubble unwinds, there can be underreaction caused by anchoring, which do not update beliefs and ignores losses. And the third is value or growth investing. Value stocks have tended to outperform growth stocks. Value stocks have low PE ratio, high book to market value ratio, and low price to dividend ratio. Growth stocks have low book to market value ratio, high PE ratio, and high price to dividend ratio. Also, small stocks tend to outperform large cap stocks. Halo effect could explain this where favorable evaluation of some characteristics extends to other characteristics, so good growth record and good previous share price performance might be seen as a good investment. This view is a form of representativeness and overconfidence can also be involved in predicting growth rates, potentially leading stocks to be overvalued. Home bias and availability bias are also shown here. Reading 3, Capital Market Expectations, Part 1, Framework and Macro Considerations. Capital market expectations are expectations concerning risk and return prospects for assets, essential input to formulating a strategic asset allocation. The role of CME is to help investor build a forecast about assets' long-term expectations and which asset classes to invest in that are within the permissible parameters outlined in the investor policy statement. Framework for building CMEs The main objective is to develop a set of projections with which to make informed investment decisions, specifically asset allocation decisions, because asset allocation is the primary determinant of long-run portfolio performance. Before getting into the framework, note that perfect precision is not realistic. More important than precision are to ensure consistency across asset classes. For example, cross-sectional consistency, and consistency over various time horizons, i.e. intertemporal consistency. Now, framework for disciplined approach to setting CME includes Step 1. Specify the set of expectations needed, including time horizon, 
formulate an explicit list of the asset classes and investment horizon for which projections are needed. The universe of asset classes should include all asset classes appropriate for the investor, but narrowed down to as small as possible. Step 2. Research historical records. This is to get some suggestions of possible ranges for future results. Beyond the raw historical data, analysts should seek to identify and understand the factors that affect asset classes. Analysts should slice the historical data in multiple dimensions, including by geography, i.e. global, regional, domestic versus foreign, which country, major asset classes, i.e. equity, fixed income, real assets, and sub-asset classes, i.e. equities by style, size, sector, industry, fixed income by maturity, credit quality, security, fixed versus floating, nominal versus inflation protected, or real assets by real estate, commodities, etc. How to approach this task depends on the hierarchy of decisions in their investment process. Step 3. Specify methods and or models to use and information requirements. For example, DCF is the most appropriate for long-term forecasting. If forecasts are also made for shorter, finite horizons, the method used should be calibrated so that its projections converge to the long-term forecast as the time horizon extends. Step 4. Determine the best sources for the information needed. This should be the most accurate and timely information. Large databases and reputable financial publications are best. Trade publications, academic studies, government and central bank reports, corporate filings, broker, dealer, and third-party research provide more specialized information. Appropriate data frequencies must be selected. Step 5. Interpret the data, methods, and apply judgment and experience. Apply a common set of assumptions, compatible methodologies, and consistent judgments in order to ensure mutually consistent projections across asset classes and over time horizons. Monitor and interpret every day. Step 6. Make the projections and provide reasoning and assumptions and document the conclusions. Step 7. Monitor actual outcomes and compare them with expectations, providing feedback to improve the expectations. When evaluating the forecast, Good forecasts are unbiased, objective, and well-researched. And forecasts should be efficient in the sense of minimizing the size of forecast errors and internally consistent, both cross-sectionally and intertemporally. But there are challenges to developing capital market expectations. One, limitations of economic data. There's a time lag between data collection, processing, and dissemination common to see one or more official data revisions, definition and calculation of methods change, suppliers of economic and financial indexes periodically rebase their indexes, i.e. the specific period used as the base of the index changes. 2. Data measurement errors and biases. Transcription errors, errors in gathering and recording data, survivorship bias, appraisal data, i.e. it's smoothed because not many are available, and as a result, volatilities tend to be lower and correlations are understated. 3. Limitations of historical estimates. Data may not be representative of the future period. Statistics calculated from the data may be poor estimates. Changes in technological, political, legal, regulatory environments, disruptions such as wars, other calamities, changes in policy, for example changes in regime, can all alter the risk-return relationship. And this can lead to the problem of non-stationarity, i.e. different parts of a data series reflect different underlying statistical properties. Analysts should use longest data history for which there is reasonable assurance of stationarity. And note that using higher frequency data for example, monthly rather than annual, does not necessarily provide more precise sample mean estimates, but it may improve precision of sample variance, covariance, and correlations, 
and are more sensitive to asynchronous data. Also, note where data is not normally distributed and have fat tails, because interpreting this data can be more complex and costly. 3. Ex post risk can be a biased measure of ex ante risk. Asset prices may reflect the possibility of a very negative event that did not materialize during the period. High ex post returns that reflect fears of adverse event that didn't occur is a poor estimate of ex ante expected returns projections. 5. Biases in analysts' methods. The preventable biases include data mining bias, which is repeatedly searching a dataset until a statistically significant pattern emerges, and time period bias, where using data that is specific to that time period. 6. Failure to account for conditional information. Regimes in certain economic and market environment can be the condition to which a dataset is relevant. If regime changes, dataset or relevancy of information also changes, so the forecast should be updated. 7. Misinterpretation of correlation. Relationship could be misjudged to be there when there really isn't, i.e. spurious relationship. 8. Psychological biases. Anchoring, status quo, confirmation bias, overconfidence bias, availability bias, Prudence bias, which is a tendency to temper forecasts so they don't appear extreme, or being too cautious because it could damage their career or reputation, are all biases that make capital market expectations challenging. 9. Model uncertainty. Uncertainty in conducting an analysis includes model uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, and input uncertainty. Next. Exogenous shocks that may affect economic growth trends. Economic growth trend is the long-term average growth of GDP around which the economy experiences semi-regular business cycles. Analysts need to understand and analyze both trends and cycles. Some trend changes are fairly easy to forecast because they happen slowly, but exogenous shocks are impossible to foresee and difficult to assess. Exogenous shocks include 1. Policy changes, such as fiscal policy, minimal intrusions on private sector, encouraging competition, support for infrastructure and human capital development, and sound tax policies are all pro-growth, and everything else is bad. 2. New products and technologies. 3. Geopolitics. Diverting resources to less economically productive uses, for example, accumulating weapons, discouraging beneficial trade, is bad. 4. Natural disasters. 5. Natural resources or critical inputs, for example, discovery or reduction in supply. But if there's a reduction in usage, this won't be a shock. And number 6. Financial crises. All six of these exogenous shocks, policy change, new products and technology, geopolitics, natural disasters, natural resources or critical inputs, and financial crises are all regime changes. Economic growth trend rates are used in a variety of ways. 1. Input to DCF models. 2. Country with higher trend rate of economic growth may offer good return to equity investors if growth has not yet been priced into the market. 3. Higher trend rate allows actual growth to be faster before accelerating inflation becomes a significant concern, i.e. actual catches up to trend. And 4. Average level of real government bond yields is linked to the trend rate. The more developed the country becomes, the more likely growth slows. An economy's trend growth rate can be measured or analyzed by looking at GDP growth, which is measured by looking at real long-term GDP growth, i.e. economic trend growth rate, equals long-term growth rate of labor force, which is broken into growth in labor force size and growth in labor force participation, plus long-term growth rate of labor productivity, which is comprised of growth from increasing capital inputs, and growth in total factor productivity, TFP, i.e. technological improvement. 
The economic trend growth rate, i.e. the long-term GDP growth rate, can be used as an anchor for estimating bond returns and for long-run equity appreciation, i.e. VE, which is the aggregate market value of equity, is equal to nominal GDP growth rate times S, which is share of profits in the economy, i.e. earnings per GDP, plus PE ratio plus dividend yield. Over long periods, share of profits and PE cannot continually increase or decrease, so the growth of equity is linked to the growth rate of GDP. Economic trend growth rate is a long-term average and reflects only the supply side of the economy, but most macroeconomic forecasting focuses on short to intermediate term fluctuations, i.e. the business cycle. To gauge where we are in the business cycle, economic forecasting is done. The main approaches available for tracking and projecting movements of the business cycle are 1. Econometric modeling 2. Economic indicators and 3. The checklist approach The economic modeling approach is an application of statistical methods to model relationships among econometric variables. Structural models specify functional relationship, reduced form models, our looser connection to theory. The economic indicators approach is using economic statistics published by official agencies. Leading economic indicator, LEI, moves ahead of business cycle by a fairly consistent time interval. They're supposed to provide information about upcoming changes in the economic activity, inflation, interest rates, and security prices. Individual LEIs can also be combined into a diffusion index. For example, if 7 out of 10 LEIs are pointing upward, then the economy accelerating has high probability. And the third checklist approach is continually monitoring a whole range of economic data to assess the economic future. For example, the data can be extrapolated into forecasts via objective statistical methods such as a time series analysis. Let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of each. Econometric modeling. Strengths are that it constrains the forecaster to a certain degree of consistency and challenges the modeler to reassess prior views. Models can be robust with many variables. New data may be collected consistently and repeatedly and generate quick output. Output is quantitative. But weaknesses of econometric modeling is that it requires users to find adequate measures for real-world activities which may not be available. It is susceptible to estimation error. It's complex and time-consuming. Its relationship among variables may change. It may give false sense of precision, and it can't forecast turning points in the business cycle. The second leading economic indicators i.e. the diffusion index, strengths are that it's simple and intuitive. It can identify turning points in the business cycle. It's available from third parties, and it's easy to track. But weaknesses of leading economic indicators are that history is subject to frequent revisions, so current data is not reliable. It can provide false signals. It doesn't provide guidance beyond yes or no directional and it's subject to look-ahead bias. And the third checklist approach, strengths are, it's simple and flexible, it has breadth because it can include virtually any topic, perspectives, theories, and assumptions, but weaknesses are that it's subjective and arbitrary, it's very time-consuming because you have to go through the checklist, all of them one by one, and it's a very manual process, so it limits depth of analysis. There's no consistency imposed from one analysis to the next. Let's see how business cycles affect short and long-term expectations. The business cycle is not a specific, well-defined cycle. It's the result of mainly intermediate frequency cycles that together generate variation in aggregate economic activity, such as GDP. At a basic level, the business cycle arises in response to the interaction of uncertainty expectational errors, and rigidities that prevent instantaneous adjustment 
to unexpected events, such as technological breakthroughs, weather patterns, natural disasters, political and geopolitical shifts, shocks in one part of the world that are yet to spread to another part of the world. Numerous variables can be used to monitor the business cycle, including GDP growth, industrial production, employment, unemployment, purchasing managers index, orders for durable goods, output gap, GDP trend versus actual, leading economic indicators. Business cycle's primary phases are contraction, which on average is about 17 months, and expansion, which on average is about 39 months. And it's subdivided into five phases. Now first imagine the graph going from zero, slowly going up to a peak and then coming back down. And the trough meets the first part of the zero in the beginning of the graph. At the beginning of the graph is initial recovery and business confidence here is high. Spending on housing and durables is high. Stimulus policies still exist from the contraction earlier on. Inflation is decelerating and negative output gap is still large because it's recovering from contraction and recession. Capital market effects because of that is short-term rates are low in order to stimulate the economy to spend more money. And as a result, the government bond yield is also low because it's effectively short-term rates. And stocks are high. Stock prices are high because people are spending and buying up stocks in low interest rate environment. And cyclical assets like risky small cap bonds are high. Then in the early expansion phase, the business confidence is high, production and investments are high, profits are rising, and housing demand is increasing. The central bank starts to withdraw stimulus now because the economy has recovered. Unemployment starts to go down, output gap is negative, and consumers borrow and spend more. Short-term rates are moving up now, little by little, and government bond yields as a result are either stable or rising a little bit, stock prices are going up, and yield curve is starting to flatten because short-term rates are going up. In the late expansion phase, profits are strong, investment spending is also high, central bank is aiming for a soft landing while fiscal balance improves, output gap is closed, unemployment is low, Wages and inflation are starting to go up, and debt coverage is going down because companies' profits are high. Short-term rates are rising, rising. Government bond yields are also rising. Stock prices are going up and up, but very volatile at this point. And monetary policy becomes restrictive, and cyclical assets are starting to go down. In the slowdown, which is right after the peak, there are fewer investments. Debt is going up and accumulating because businesses' profits are going down. Central bank continues to exert upward pressure on short rates in order to slow down the economy from the previous expansion phase. Inflation is now going up high as firms raise prices due to rising costs. Short-term rates are high at this point. Government bond yields top out. Stock prices are going down. Interest-sensitive stocks perform the best here. And credit spread is also going up. And lastly, in the contraction or recession phase, almost at the trough, production is going down. Business profits are going down. Central bank eases monetary policy now. Unemployment is going up, inflation is going down, output gap is large. Short-term rates are going down because the monetary policies kick in. The government bond yields as a result are down. Stock prices initially are going down, but towards the end of the recession, it starts to go back up and credit spread continues to widen. If an investor can identify the current phase of the cycle and correctly predict the next phase timing, that would be great, but it's not that simple. 
Phases vary in timing. It's not easy to distinguish between cyclical forces and secular forces, and there's a lot of uncertainty. All that uncertainty and variation implies that business cycle analysis generates noise that may not be helpful or relevant. But business cycle turning point signals are most reliable over horizons within the expansion and contraction phase. Let's talk more about inflation now. First, actual inflation and inflation expectations are different, and they affect the economy cycles differently. In terms of the business cycle, inflation is pro-cyclical, meaning it accelerates in the later stages during expansion of the business cycle when the output gap has closed and decelerates during a recession or the early years of the cycle recovery when there is a large output gap. Deceleration puts downward pressure on wages and prices. Because cyclical pattern of inflation is well known, inflation expectation will also be pro-cyclical, i.e. it follows the same cycle. Short horizon inflation expectation tends to have about the same amplitude as actual inflation. Very long-term inflation expectations should not be affected though by cyclical fluctuations. Now let's look at inflation versus short-term interest rate relationship. When inflation is high, the Fed or central bank will increase interest rates so that people decide to save more money to take advantage of higher interest rates. This leads to less spending, which decreases prices of goods and therefore brings inflation back down. So basically, when you're looking at the graph and the different phases, start out with inflation and short-term interest rates because they are both pro-cyclical. They rise when the cycle is rising and they go down when the cycle is going down. When inflation is rising, but it's within expected range of inflation, there's no effect on cash. In this context, cash is short-term interest-bearing instrument, like inflation-protected asset that earns a floating interest rate with zero duration. And bonds, short-term yields, rise more than long-term yields, but have less price impact as a result of shorter duration and will rise with inflation expectations. Floating rate assets will be attractive in this case. Stocks have there's little effect because both expected future cash flows, like earnings and dividends, and discount rates fluctuate within the inflation expectations, which are baked into the stock prices already. And for real estate, rental income will rise with expected inflation, but asset values will remain stable, and there's little effect overall. When inflation rises above and beyond expected range of inflation, for cash or short-term interest rates, this causes temporary fluctuations in the realized real return. Central bank will increase short-term interest rates, so cash becomes attractive. Longer-term yields may rise more sharply as investors reassess likelihood of a change in the long-run inflation level, and yield curve may steepen at this point. In terms of stocks, when inflation rises above and beyond expected range, it signals that central bank needs to act to slow the economy, so it threatens companies that can't pass along the higher costs to their customers. For real estate, this will coincide with high demand for real estate, so rents will increase faster than general, inflation along with property values. Real estate with long-term leases will suffer. Real estate with substantial long-term fixed rate debt will do well. And when there is persistent deflation, cash is inflation linked and binding on nominal interest rates, so it is attractive. For bonds, it benefits the highest quality bonds because it increases the purchasing power of cash flows, but it is likely to impair creditworthiness of lower quality debt. For stocks, especially detrimental for asset-intensive, commodity-producing firms because they earn on raw material costs and can't charge higher. Also negatively affects highly leveraged firms because they earn less, so they have a harder time paying back debt. For real estate, deflation will put downward pressure on expected rental income and property values, especially for less-than-prime properties, which may lead to rents being sharply cut 
to avoid rising vacancies. Fiscal policy can be used to counteract cyclical fluctuations in the economy via government spending and taxation, but aside from extreme situations, for example like the Great Depression in the 30s and global financial crisis in 2007-2009, fiscal policy typically addresses objectives other than regulating short-term growth because fiscal decision-making takes too long to make timely adjustments to aggregate spending and taxation short-term. And it would be disruptive to ongoing funded government services. Having said above, fiscal policy does play a role in mitigating cyclical fluctuations. For example, if a place has progressive tax regimes, this implies that effective tax rate is cyclical because it rises as economy expands. Similarly, means-based transfer payments vary inversely with the economy via automa automatic stabilizers. Both progressive tax regimes and transfer payments are pro-cyclical and therefore positive for trend rate of growth, i.e. the GDP growth. As for monetary policy, monetary policy is used by central banks as intervention in the business cycle to moderate growth and inflation in both directions. But impact of monetary policy is subject to long and variable lags, as well as uncertainty that it would work, and the risk that it exacerbates the situation is greatest at the top of the cycle. Tightening or restrictive monetary policy is when the Fed raises interest rate to slow down the economy against rising inflation. Restrictive because it restricts liquidity, making it more expensive to get loans. Note that the federal fund rate, i.e. the short-term interest rate, that the central bank raises or reduces is a nominal rate, i.e. it includes inflation, aka policy rate includes inflation. Quantitative easing, on the other hand, is a form of loosening monetary policy, and it's when central bank buys government bonds and other financial assets to inject money into the economy to expand the economy. Taylor Rule can be used as a tool to assess central banks' stance and as a guide to predict their future stance on policy rate. I equals R neutral plus expected inflation plus 0.5 times expected GDP growth minus trend GDP growth plus 0.5 times expected inflation minus target inflation, where I star is equal to the target nominal policy rate. Again, the target nominal policy rate is R neutral, which is the real policy rate that would be target if growth and inflation were on target, plus expected inflation, plus half of the difference between expected and trend growth rate, plus half times the difference between expected inflation minus target inflation. What happens when interest rate is zero or negative? In theory, negative nominal rate and zero nominal rate works similarly in that businesses and consumers are encouraged to hold or save less and spend more in order to stimulate the economy. But what can happen in a negative rate environment is that banks are charged the negative rate for holding deposits and are encouraged to lend out the deposits. This could erode bank profitability. Also, note that if the target policy rate is negative and or lower than the neutral rate, then you can see from the Taylor rule that the expected inflation rate is higher in the long term, and thus saving is more costly because the purchasing power of the cash erodes at a faster rate than the interest earned for holding on to the cash. Negative policy rates are expected to produce asset class returns similar to the zero or low interest rate phases of the business cycle, i.e. during the contraction and early recovery phase. Key considerations when forming capital market expectations in negative rate environment includes historical data less likely to be reliable, limited useful data empirically, Models can break. 
Forecasting should account for differences in the macro environment, effects of other monetary policy measures occurring simultaneously, for example, quantitative easing, may distort market relationships like the yield curve or impact on stocks. Impact of monetary and fiscal policy inflation and their interest rates. Imagine a 2 by 2 matrix. On the left, you have loose monetary policy and tight monetary policy. And on the top left, right, you have loose fiscal policy and tight physical policy. In a loose, loose environment, you have high expected inflation because of a loose monetary policy and high real rates because of loose fiscal policy, which means there's high government borrowing and spending, which is increasing the demand for money and therefore increasing the interest rate. So as a result, if you have high high, you have high nominal rates. In a tight monetary policy and a loose fiscal policy, you have low expected inflation because of tightening monetary policy, and you have high real rates because of a loose fiscal policy, and therefore you have mid-nominal rates. In a loose monetary policy and a tight fiscal policy, you have high expected inflation from loose monetary policy and low real rates because of tight fiscal policy since government is not spending or borrowing and therefore the supply of money is increasing and the demand of money is decreasing and therefore you have mid-nominal rates. And in a tight monetary policy and a tight fiscal policy, you have low expected inflation and low real rates and therefore low nominal rates. The yield curve is steep in the initial recovery, but short term rates start to rise and it's upward sloping. In the early expansion, the yield curve is steep for short term rates and it flattens in the long-term maturity. In the late expansion, the short-term rates also rise and therefore the curve starts to flatten overall. And in the slowdown phase, yields peak, then start declining sharply so the curve may be flat or inverted. In the contraction or recession, the curve steepens to an upward slope again as rates decline in the short term. Inverted yield curve is when long-term yields are lower than short-term rates. This indicates that the central bank expects impending economic doom or gloom and bakes in low inflation or deflation into long-term nominal yields. Next, a country's surplus or deficit on current account, which is net exports of goods and services minus investment income flows, in unilateral transfers always matches deficit or surplus on capital account, which is financial account, i.e. net investment flows for foreign direct investment, which are purchase and sale of productive assets across borders and portfolio investment flows involving transactions and financial assets. A country's current and capital accounts are linked to the broader economy via net exports, contributing directly to aggregate demand for the country's output. What that means is net exports, i.e. the goods and services exported minus imported, equals savings minus investment by the people plus government surplus. Net exports always equals net savings plus government surplus. So anything that changes net exports also changes net savings and or government surplus. Current account changes more slowly and tends to reflect secular and business cycle. So in the short run, interest rates, exchange rates, and financial asset prices must adjust to keep the capital account in balance with current account. Interest rates around the world need don't need to be equal, but they are linked because global savings must always equal global investments, so the interest rates tend to move together. 
With floating exchange rates, interest rates must be higher in a currency that is expected to depreciate and vice versa. This can lead to exchange rate overshooting in order to bake in the expectation of movement in the other direction. An investor cares about real rates in their currency, but in terms of foreign assets, they care about nominal returns and the change in exchange rates. Yield curves of default-free bonds would be perfectly correlated across country if it weren't for a lack of fixed exchange rates. Reading for Capital Market Expectations Part 2, Forecasting Asset Class Returns. Approaches to setting expectations for fixed income returns. There are one DCF approach, where you discount back the fixed income of the bond using yield to maturity that equates to the present value of the bond's cash flows to its market value. For a portfolio of bonds, YTM is usually calculated as simple average, which is not exactly accurate, but a reasonable approximation. Assuming cash flows were received in full and on time, there are two main reasons why realized returns may not equal the initial yield to maturity. One, if the investment horizon is shorter than the amount of time until the bond's maturity, any change in interest rates, i.e. the yield to maturity, will generate a capital gain or loss at the end of the investment horizon. Two, cash flows may be reinvested at rates above or below initial YTM. These two forces work in opposite directions, i.e. rising rates lead to capital losses because higher yields means lower present value or price of the bond, but higher yields also increases reinvestment income. When investment horizon is shorter, the capital gains or loss from the impact of changing interest rate will outweigh reinvestment impact, and vice versa for longer investment horizon. The second approach to fixed income returns, capital market expectations, is the building block approach, i.e. using risk premiums. Basically, it's an expected return in terms of required compensation for specific risk. The four components are 1. The default free rate, and this compensates for interest rate risk. It is the rate on the highest quality, most liquid bond that matches the forecast horizon. It's usually government zero coupon bill of a maturity that is issued frequently, for example, like three months. The rate is tied to the policy rate, so it mirrors cy cyclical fluctuations of monetary policy impact. Second is term premium. This compensates for duration risk. It's the difference between what you'd get for locking up your money for a long time versus if you kept rolling over short-term debt for the same amount of time. It is increased with maturity and are roughly proportional to duration and vary over time. The four main drivers of term premium are higher inflation uncertainty, ability to hedge recession risk, i.e. if the asset can perform well in a weak economy, then term premium is lower, supply and demand of short maturity and long maturity default free bonds, which influences the slope of the yield curve, i.e. the steeper the yield curve, the higher the term premium baked into the long maturity YTM, because steep yield curve is based on supply and demand. And business cycle, steep yield curve at trough, which means higher term premium reflected in the longer maturity YTM. The third risk is credit premium, which compensates for credit risk. This is the premium for bearing the risk of default losses. Steep yield curve predicts both a high term premium and credit premium. Higher implied volatility in the equity market, but leads to higher risk premiums across all markets. One would expect that the risk of default losses is greater the longer you wait for maturity, but it's not always the case. Historically, credit premiums are pretty high at the short maturity yield part of the yield curve. This could be due to event risk in the sense that, no matter when it is, a default is a default and it would be a huge loss. 
Also, it could be due to e-liquidity because many short maturity bonds are old issues that rarely trade anymore as they gradually approach maturity. And the fourth risk premium is liquidity premium, which compensates for e-liquidity. Few bond issues trade actively for more than a few weeks after issuance. In general, liquidity tends to be better for bonds that are priced near par, already reflecting current price levels, relatively new, that are from a large issue, that are from a well-known frequent issuer, standard simple in structure, high quality. These factors decrease risk for dealer to find buyer. Analysts should look at yield spread between highest quality issuer, i.e. the government bond, and, and the next highest quality bond, and then make adjustments. Each step lower that you do this in credit quality is likely to have a bigger impact on liquidity than the prior step down. When you have a fixed income building blocks example problem, this is how to think through it. For example, if the question says, Revise key building block components for a major European bond market. Last year's values are risk-free rate of a three-month government bill is 3.5%, term premium for a five-year duration is 0.5%, credit premium is 0.9%, liquidity premium is 0.15%. Other facts given, although inflation rose modestly, central bank cut its policy rate by 50 bips in response to weakening growth. So the solution for that would be reduction in policy rate and a flattening of interest rate futures curve. Therefore, reduce the short-term rate component, i.e. the risk-free rate. Aggregate corporate bonds remained solid. Defaults on leveraged loans unexpectedly high. For this one, increase in loan defaults suggests that credit losses are likely to be higher next year since defaults tend to cluster. Next fact, confidence surveys weakened. The solution for this would be to increase term premium. Next fact, equity option volatility spiked mid-year but ended somewhat lower. The solution for this would be equity options volatility coming back down to lower levels at the end of the year suggests that investors are not demanding a general increase in risk premiums. Next, interest rate futures curve flattened but are still upward sloping. This also suggests reduction in policy rate and flattening of interest rate futures curve. So the view should change to reducing the short term rate. Next fact, 10 year government yield declined only a few bips. This would suggest steepening of the yield curve i.e. long-term maturity only responded by a few bips in response to policy rate cut by 50 bips, and this indicates an increase in both term premium and credit premium. Next fact, yield on comparable government agency bonds remained unchanged. The solution for this would be modest widening of government agency bonds spread to government bonds, so higher liquidity premium. And finally, Next fact, corporate spreads widened. This indicates increase in credit premium. Next, let's look at risks faced by investors in emerging market fixed income securities. Investing in emerging market debt involves all the same risks as investing in developed country debt, such as interest rate movements, currency movements, and potential default. But in addition to that, there are risks categorized under the two categories, of economic risks, which are the emerging market's ability to pay being low, and political and legal risks, which are emerging markets' willingness to pay that is low. When there are economic risks, i.e. the emerging market's ability to pay is low, then the characteristics of the market are greater concentration of wealth, income, and less diverse tax basis, dependence on only one or a few industries, like commodities, restriction on trade, capital flows, currency conversion, poor fiscal co control and monetary discipline, less educated skilled workforce, poor infrastructure, lower level of technological advancement, reliance on foreign borrowing, 
often in hard currencies not their own, small, less sophisticated financial markets and institutions, and susceptibility to capital flight. During country risk analysis, questions to ask are, analysts should examine track record of country to see if there have been crises in the past. If so, how were they handled? Has the sovereign debt defaulted? Is there restructured debt? How have authorities responded to fiscal challenges? Is there inflation or currency instability? A few indicative guidelines to examine the health of the country include fiscal deficit to GDP ratio persistently over 4% is cause for concern. Debt to GDP ratio over 70 to 80% is bad. Annual real growth rate less than 4% persistently is bad. Current account deficits at least 4% of GDP indicate lack of competitiveness. Foreign debt that is at least 50% of GDP or over 200% of current account receipts is bad. Foreign exchange reserves less than 100% of short-term debt is risky. It should be at least 200% to be good. When all else fails, call upon external support. Does the country have access to IMF, the World Bank, or any other institutions? Under political and legal risks, which are when the emerging market's willingness to pay is low, the characteristics of the country are inability to enforce claims or recover investments because of weak property rights and weak enforcement of contract laws, very difficult to force a sovereign borrower to pay its debts, confiscation of property, nationalization of companies, industries, and corruption, coalition government poses instability problems, imposition of capital controls or restrictions on currency capital, may make it impossible to repatriate capital. Country risk analysis under political and legal risks are, is there a history of nationalization, expropriation, or other viola violation of rights? How have international disputes been resolved? And under which legal jurisdiction? Is the integrity of judicial system shady? Are political institutions stable? For example, recognized as legitimate and have reasonable checks and balances? Has the transfer of power been peaceful, orderly, and lawful? Do fragile coalitions come to power whenever events or political processes are strained? And does that coalition inevitably collapse? Is there corruption likely if regulations are relaxed? Per capita income decrease indicates political stress. Three approaches to setting expectations for equity investment market returns. One, historical statistics approach. Two, DCF approach, which one is the Gordon constant growth and the second is the Grinnold Kroner model, which reflects supply of equity returns. And the third is risk premiums approach using CAPM and the Singer Terhart model. And actually there is one more. The fourth is equity versus bond risk premium. Let's look at each approach in detail. The first one, historical statistics approach. There is empirical work that includes historical asset returns in 21 countries for a 118 year period from 1900 to 2017. Theoretically, you can use mean real return for each market that shows within 95% confidence interval to predict future returns, but sample averages even derived from long histories are very imprecise estimates unless volatility of the data is very small, which is not the case for equity returns. Shrinkage estimators, which combines the sample mean with a second estimate of the mean return, also confirms that there is no true expected returns for countries using the historical statistics approach. The second approach is DCF. Gordon constant growth is P equals D over R. Dividend discount model, which is solved for the required rate of return to formulate the long-term expected return of equity markets. The big advantage over historical stock 
returns estimate is that Gordon constant growth doesn't look at noisy fluctuations inherent in P-E ratio and earnings to growth. Since earnings is in the denominator of P-E and numerator of E over R, earnings cancels out over time, leaving the relationship to be equity market appreciation and GDP growth. And GDP growth is much less volatile and hence relatively predictable. Another DCF approach is the grinnold kroner model, which takes the Gordon growth model and adds impact of share repurchases because share repurchases have become an important way for companies to distribute cash to shareholders. The formula is expected return equals D over P, which is the annual income return, minus percent change of share repurchase, plus percentage change of nominal earnings, plus percent change of P over E, i.e. P-E ratio. Note that the cyclical P-E may be used to adjust for business cycle fluctuations. The current price is divided by 10-year average of earnings instead of current earnings. The last two terms, percent change in nominal earnings and percent change in P-E ratio, together are expected capital gains. Note that the percent change of nominal earnings bigger than GDP growth rate would not make sense in practice, especially for the long run, because that implies a shrinking private sector earnings for GDP growth to be less than equities earnings growth. Also on the percentage change in share, share repurchases, share repurchases means number of shares outstanding is going down, so the percentage change in share repurch shares will be a negative number. Hence, the formula has a minus in front of it so that you add the impact of share repurchase. The reason why share repurchase adds to expected return is because it increases earnings per share since shares decrease in the denominator. In the very long run, what's plausible is that the percentage change in nominal earnings is equal to the nominal GDP growth. And percentage change in share repurchase and PE are both zero. Note also that the grinnold kroner model assumes an infinite horizon in theory. In the case of finite horizon or long run, the analyst must use the correct input accordingly. The third is the risk premium approach, which is CAPM formula using Singer Terhar. Refer to the formulas for this. The conclusion of the Singer Terhar model and the CAPM is that the higher the integration, the lower the expected return required return. As prices adjust to lower required return, the market should deliver a higher return than expected as more investors move towards emerging markets because more are integrated. Most of the issues underlying the risks of emerging market bonds also present risks for emerging market equities, but the risks take on somewhat different forms because of the different nature of equity versus debt claims. Political, legal, regulatory weaknesses may affect manipulation of capital structure of companies and the misuse of business assets due to weak corporate governance. Accounting standards may allow management and other insiders to hide or misstate important information. Weak disclosure rules may impede transparency and favor insiders. Seizure of private property, nationalization of companies, unpredictable regulatory actions. Whereas the emerging market debt investors have to worry about the country's ability and willingness to pay specific obligations, emerging market equity investors have to worry about how their ownership claims can be taken away from them by the government, corporate insiders, or dominant shareholders. Next, real estate returns. To forecast directly held real estate returns, one way is to use historical real estate returns. But these prices are based on appraisals rather than transactions in valuing properties. These appraisals tend to reflect slowly moving averages of past market conditions. 
This averaging significantly distorts estimates of volatility as it dampens it and correlations. The published return series is too smooth. In order to do any meaningful analysis of real estate as an asset class, the analyst must first deal with unsmoothing the appraisal based returns using a time series model. Another way to forecast real estate returns is using capitalization rates. Cap rate is equal to NOI in the current period divided by property value, which is the standard valuation metric for commercial real estate. It is not a cash flow yield because a portion of operating income may be reinvested in the property. The estimate of the long run expected required rate of return can be delivered using the cap ratio by applying the Gordon growth. Expected return of real estate is equal to cap rate plus nominal NOI growth rate minus percent change in cap rate. The long run steady state NOI growth rate for commercial real estate as a whole should be reasonably close to the growth rate of GDP. Over finite periods, it is appropriate to adjust the equation to include the anticipated rate of change in the cap rate. There is a clear pattern of high cap rates for riskier property types, lower quality properties, and less attractive locations. Brick and mortar stores have been under increasing competitive pressure from online retailers like Amazon, raising cap rates for all types of malls, whether high productivity or low productivity. Note also that cap rate is basically the discount rate or the borrowing rate. So if the debt supply in the market is high, then the cap rate will go down. Economic factors on real estate returns. Cap rates reflect long-term discount rates. As such, we would expect them to rise and fall with the general level of long-term interest rates, and thus cap rates are pro-cyclical. However, cap rates are also sensitive to credit spreads and the availability of credit. The counter-cyclical nature of credit spreads mitigates the cyclicality of cap rates. Real estate both drive and are driven by the business cycle. Demand for the services provided by real estate rises and falls with the pace of economic activity. Supply of real estate is vast, but essentially fixed at a given point in time. As a result, there is a strong cyclical pattern to property values, rents, and occupancy rates. High quality properties with long leases will tend to have little turnover so the actual rents and occupancy rates don't fluctuate much. In contrast, demand for low quality properties is more sensitive to the economy, which leads to high fluctuations in occupancy and rents. Properties with short leases will see rents adjust to current supply and demand. For low quality hotels, room rates and occupancy will be the most volatile. Boom bust cycle. Boom happens when there is a perception of rising demand, property values, lease rates, and occupancy, which induces development of new properties. This investment spending helps drive and or sustain economic activity, which in turn reinforces the perceived profitability of building capacity. Then inevitably, the burst happens where optimistic projections lead to overbuilding and declining property values lease rates, and occupancy. It may take many months or years for the excess supply to be absorbed. Risk premium in the expected return for real estate. As a long-lived asset, real estate is quite sensitive to the level of long-term rates. It has a high effective duration. Hence, real estate has significant term premium. Also, income earning properties are exposed to the credit risk of the tenants and therefore landlord must demand a credit premium. Real estate must also earn a significant equity risk premium since the owner bears the brunt of fluctuations in property values, as well as uncertainty about rent growth, lease rollover and termination, and vacancies. Combining the bond-like components, i.e. the term premium, credit premium, with a stock-like component, i.e. the equity risk premium, implies a risk premium for real estate that's somewhere between those of corporate bonds and equities. 
For liquidity, it's not really a question of whether one can sell the asset quickly, but rather at what price with respect to real estate. For real estate, think of e-liquidity as a total inability to sell the asset. A liquidity premium of 2-4% to is reasonable for commercial real estate. Real estate in equilibrium. Real estate can be incorporated into an equilibrium framework, such as singer terhar model in a market-level context. But smoothing must be removed from risk-return data first, and need to add liquidity premium. Real estate investors have home bias, and therefore real estate is location-specific, and thus more local economic and market factors are more relevant than global. Comparing public versus private real estate. Investors with smaller portfolios must typically choose between limited, undiversified direct real estate or real estate exposure through REITs. Comparing these is difficult because of return smoothing, heterogeneity of properties, and variation in leverage, so you must first get transaction-based returns for unleveraged direct real estate holdings, get firm-by-firm deleveraged REIT returns based on their individual balance sheets over time, and match them by property characteristics. Deleveraging the REITs substantially reduces the mean returns and their volatilities. Looking at actual data from 1994 to 2012, in aggregate, REITs, the unlevered REITs, outperformed direct real estate by 49 bips per year with lower volatility. For REITs, retail had highest return and industrial had lowest return. For directly owned properties, apartments had highest returns and offices had the lowest. In terms of diversification benefits, REITs are more highly correlated to equities in the short term, whereas direct real estate is not. But in the long term, REITs are more highly correlated with direct real estate and less highly correlated with equities over multi-year horizons. Thus, although REITs tends to act like stocks in the short run, they do act like real estate in the long run. Now let's look at capital market expectations around exchange rates. Exchange rates are difficult to forecast because there are multiple factors any one of them can affect exchange rates, including quantities, price, or values within one currency or another and currencies are tied to government, financial systems, legal systems, and geographies. The laws, regulations, customs, and conventions within and between these systems also influence exchange rates. So the best we can do to try to forecast exchange rates is to identify the forces that are likely to be exerting the most powerful influences. These forces that affect exchange rates should be seen as complementary and not as alternatives. There are three forces from goods and services, trade, and current account that affect exchange rates. First, trade flows. Trade flows do not exert a significant impact on exchange rates, but if it becomes large relative to financing or investment flows, it's likely that a crisis is emerging. Second is purchasing power parity. Purchasing power parity is based on the notion that the prices of goods and services change at the same rate across currencies, i.e. the expected percentage change in exchange rates is equal to the percentage change in inflation rates. Or put another way, if inflation goes up, then the currency value goes down. Free and competitive trade should force alignment of PPP, but it is slow and, and incomplete. So evidence shows that PPP is a poor predictor of exchange rates over the short to intermediate horizons, but it's a better guide to currency movements over longer multi-year horizons. Purchasing power parity is most evident when inflation differentials are large, persistent, and driven primarily by monetary conditions. The second force from goods and services, trade, and current account is current account or this is the third one. Prices, quantities, and exchange rates have to adjust so that trade is always balanced. And since prices of goods and services, production levels, 
and spending decisions tend to adjust only gradually, the onus of adjustment falls on exchange rates, but allowing for capital flows mitigates this pressure on exchange rates. But still, any imposition of restriction on capital flows between countries will increase sensitivity of exchange rates to current account, especially if it persists. Small current account balances, i.e. less than 2% of GDP, are sustainable for many years, so it would have little influence on exchange rates. But large imbalances that are expected to be transitory may not have lasting impact on currency. Current account deficit, i.e. national investment minus national saving, that is bigger than zero, due to strong profitable investment spending is more likely to be sustainable than deficit due to household spending, low business profits, or government deficits. If a change in nominal exchange rate is to bring about a necessary change in the current account balance, it will have to induce changes in spending patterns, consumption, saving decisions, and production decisions. These adjustments occur very slowly. Now, forces from capital flows that affect exchange rates. First is capital mobility due to expected returns. Money follows where there are more expected returns, so in a perfect world, expected change in exchange rate is equal to the excess risk-adjusted expected return on domestic portfolio over foreign portfolio. What happens when returns are higher in one currency is the overshooting mechanism. So first, exchange rate will appreciate as capital flows towards the attractive market, i.e. the one with the higher risk-adjusted return. In the intermediate term, investors begin to question the high exchange rate and start expecting it to come down. And in the longer run, exchange rate does come back down. So put another way, if a currency's interest rate is higher, minus adjusting for risk premiums, then the exchange rate or the currency value should increase. Second, uncovered interest rate parity and hot money flows. UIP is basically the first part of the capital mobility due to expected returns without the risk premiums, i.e that expected percentage change in the exchange rate should be equal to the nominal interest rate differential. But contrary to UIP, carry trades, i.e. borrowing in lower rate currencies and lending in high rate currencies, earn more profits on average, so UIP does not hold as a predictor of exchange rates. When there is hot money flow, i.e vigorous inflow or outflow of capital to one country, central bank intervenes to combat or offset impact to exchange rate. Each country or currency has a unique portfolio of assets that make up the global market portfolio, and exchange rates adjust relatively to the size of the portfolios accordingly, i.e. this is the portfolio balance perspective. Again, a currency that has a higher interest rate will see investors flocking to that currency, which will appreciate that currency in the short term, but more and more people will do that, and so it will eventually decrease, or the exchange rate will decrease over time in the long run. Next, methods of forecasting volatility. Analysts need to forecast the variance-covariance matrix, i.e. the volatility, in order to analyze the risk of the portfolios. There are five methods. One, sample statistics. This is just the variance covariance that are computed from historical return data. Rule of thumb is the number of observations should be at least 10 times the number of assets in order for the sample VCV matrix to be deemed reliable. Pros and cons. It's simple and most heavily used, but it cannot be used to estimate the VCV matrix for large number of assets because it's subject to sampling error. Second method is multi-factor models. It is when you add 
the asset sensitivity to a factor return, i.e. beta, times factor return for many different factors, and the variance of that asset. Pro is number of assets can be very large relative to the number of observations, and less estimation error than sample statistics, and it can improve cross-sectional consistencies. But con is its biased and thus not accurate measure of true VCV matrix of returns. And it won't work if factors are redundant or returns can be completely determined by common factors. Third method of forecasting volatility is the shrinkage estimation, which is when you combine information from the sample data, sample VCV matrix, and a alternative estimate and average that. Pros are that its mean squared error is smaller, but con is that it is biased. Fourth method is estimating volatility from smooth returns. So for private real estate and private equity and hedge fund returns that are smoothed, the raw data underestimates risk, so the impact of smoothing needs to be adjusted. Otherwise, it leads to poor asset allocation decisions and non-optimal diversification. And the fifth method of forecasting volatility is using the ARCH model. Asset returns tend to exhibit volatility clustering at certain periods of time, for example, during high and low volatility periods. ARCH stands for Autoregressive Conditional Heteroscedacity, which addresses the time-varying volatilities. Arch models the variance over time in a time series and tries to forecast volatility by forecasting clusters reflective of real-world market returns and volatilities. Next, let's talk about macro factors. Macro factors give rise to reallocation of a global investment portfolio, whether that's changing allocation between equities and bonds or between countries or adjusting the credit quality average of bond portfolios, or adjusting duration of position on yield curves, or adjusting exposure to currencies. Examples of a change in macro factor that would induce you to adjust the weights in a global portfolio are as follows. Let's say there's an increase in trend growth, i.e. GDP, particularly if growth is due to productivity. Then you should increase the weights in equities because higher trend growth implies more rapid long-run earnings growth. Let's say there's an increase in global integration. Then we should expect required return to go down, according to Singer Terhar, because as prices adjust to a lower return, the market should deliver an even higher return. If that happens, then the global portfolio should be adjusted to have higher weight toward markets that have higher integration. Let's say the economy is approaching the trough of the business cycle. At this point, the adjustment to make in the global portfolio is to increase weights in equities and decrease weights in bonds. Let's say there's a structural policy change, for example, a shift from interest rate targeting to money growth targeting, quantitative easing, restructuring of the tax code, etc. Adjustments are, analysts must determine how, what, why the underlying linkages have changed and identify the value-added opportunities. Let's say there's an increase in current account deficit and will tend to put upward pressure on real required returns in order to induce a higher savings rate in the deficit country and to attract the increased flow of capital from abroad to fund the deficit. Note that purely cyclical fluctuations in the current account are just part of the business cycle. It's the longer term trends in the current account that require adjustments. Then in the global portfolio, recalibrate or reallocate portfolio away from countries with secularly rising current account deficits to those with secularly rising current account surpluses, or narrowing deficits. And finally, let's say currencies are primarily influenced by capital flows, 
So where there is perceived to be a currency that offers a higher risk adjusted expected return, then in the global portfolio, reallocate towards a currency where a meaningful appreciation is yet to come, but assess to see if assets have already been overshot. Also take into account currency hedging. Reading 5, Overview of Asset Allocation The strategic asset allocation takes place after the formation of capital market expectations. It's often the first or early decision in portfolio construction, and is widely considered to be the most important decision in the investment process. Along with developed CMEs, objectives and constraints in the IPS are defined, and those two sets of inputs inform what the portfolio construction should be, or asset allocation, and the investment governance provides feedback to the portfolio construction on an ongoing basis. At high level, effective investment governance ensures that assets are invested to achieve investment objectives within risk tolerance and constraints. It's in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations, Decisions are made by individuals or groups with the necessary skills and capacity. Asset allocation is aligned with implementation, and there is a clear mission, a plan, and a review process for short and long-term objectives. Common governance structure has three levels of hierarchy. The governing investment committee, investment staff, and third party consultants and independent investment managers. At a tactical level, effective governance models perform the following tasks. 1. Articulate long and short-term objectives of the investment program. For example, ensure that plan assets are sufficient to meet current and future pension liabilities, provide for retirement, earn a rate of return in excess of the return required to fund, after inflation, ongoing distributions consistent with endowment's mission, a return requirement is often considered the essence of investment objectives. 2. Delegate decision rights and responsibilities among governance hierarchy based on group's knowledge, capacity, and time, and position in the hierarchy. For example, direction and selection is approved by the committee, execution is done by the investment staff, and there are various areas where third-party inputs are involved. 3. Specify processes for developing and approving the IPS. 4. Specify processes for developing and approving the strategic asset allocation and rebalancing, i.e. formal asset allocation study is done that incorporates objectives, constraints, and simulates possible outcomes, evaluates risk-return characteristics of allocation strategies, this is done by the investment staff with third-party resources and approved by the investment committee. 5. Establish a reporting framework to monitor program's progress toward goals and objectives, including performance evaluation, benchmarking, management reporting, governance reporting, what's working, what's not, compliance with investment guidelines, and progress toward achieving the objectives. And 6 periodically undertake a governance audit by independent third party. Can the investment program survive an unexpected market turmoil? Are members effective? That's the question that the audit should answer. Economic balance sheet includes practical assets and liabilities and extended portfolio assets and liabilities not found on conventional balance sheets. Extended portfolio assets and liabilities include for individual investors, human capital, i.e. present value of future earnings, present value of pension income, present value of expected inheritances, and liabilities include present value of future consumption. For institutional investors, extended portfolio assets include underground mineral resources, present value of future intellectual property royalties, and liabilities include present value of prospective payouts for foundations. Three asset allocation approaches are asset only, liability relative, aka liability driven investing, and goals based. The inputs in the asset only approach only focuses on the asset side of the balance sheet, 
liabilities are not modeled. The mean variance optimization is used to model expected returns, risks, and correlations of asset classes. Typical example objectives are maximize sharp ratio for accepted level of volatility. Risk for asset only approach includes focusing on asset class risk and effective combinations of asset classes, using volatility of portfolio, i.e. standard deviation, as primary measure of risk, which is a function of asset class volatilities and correlation. Also looks at downside risk, peak to trough, maximum drawdown, extreme tail, etc. Value at risk, for example. Typical uses and owners of the asset-only approach include foundations, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, and individual investors. The second allocation approach is liability relative. The inputs are explicitly accounting for liabilities, focused on funding liabilities, for example, matching cash flows that are required to be made in the future. Typical example objectives, fund liabilities and invest excess assets for growth. Highest probability of meeting desired return criteria, for example, 5% for endowment. Focuses on the risk of having insufficient assets to pay obligations when due, like shortfall risk. Also considers volatility of contributions needed to fund liabilities. Typical uses and owners of liability relative approach are banks, defined benefit pensions, and insurers. Goals-based asset allocation approach inputs are explicitly accounting for liabilities focused on goals, specifying asset allocations for sub-portfolios, each of which is aligned to a specific goal. Typical example objectives, achieve goals with specified required probabilities of success. Risk focuses on the risk of failing to achieve goals. Risk limit can be quantified as the maximum acceptable probability of not achieving a goal. There can be multiple future points in time, so overall portfolio risk is the weighted sum of those risks of sub-portfolios. Typical uses and owners is for individual investors. Systematic risk is market risk that affects the market as a whole, like macroeconomic factors such as inflation, interest rates, currency fluctuations, environment factors, social factors, etc. To reduce as much systematic risk impact as possible on the portfolio, asset classes that have different exposures to varying systematic risks are selected via asset allocation. What are all the asset classes? There are three super classes of assets. One is capital assets, which are ongoing income stream or value, like interest or dividends that can be valued by NPV. Second is consumable or transformable assets. These are assets that can be consumed or transformed as part of the production process into something else of economic value, but don't yield a stream of value. For example, petroleum, timberland. And third is store of value assets. These are neither income generating nor an economic production input. For example, currencies, art, precious metals, this value is realized through sale. In the current professional practice, asset classes are divided into the four categories, global public equity, global private equity, global fixed income, and real assets. Real assets are assets that provide sensitivity to inflation, such as private real estate equity, private infrastructure, and private real estate equity and commodities. Sometimes a global inflation-linked bonds are classified as real assets instead of fixed income because of their sensitivity to inflation. Note that investment vehicles like hedge funds are classified as strategies to asset classes and are not themselves asset classes. Criteria for specifying asset classes for the purpose of asset allocation are that Assets within an asset class should be relatively homogenous. Asset classes should be mutually exclusive, 
i.e. no overlapping of same or similar assets in more than one asset class. Asset classes should be diversifying. Asset classes as a group should tend to increase expected return for a given level of risk. Asset classes selected for investment should be able to cover liquidity and transaction costs. Asset classes should be diversifying during asset allocation. In evaluating an investment's value as a diversifier at the portfolio level, it is important to consider an asset in relation to all other assets as a group rather than in a one-by-one -one pairwise fashion. Examining return series' correlations during times of financial market stress can provide valuable insight into potential diversification benefits. Sources of risk, and therefore exposure to risk factors, are better distinguished for more broadly defined asset classes than narrowly defined subgroups. How much to allocate between equity versus fixed income is more important than how much to allocate precisely between subclasses of equity and fixed income. Note that there will be overlap in sources of risk across asset classes, but should be as few overlap as possible and only modest correlations. There are asset allocation methods that focus on assigning investments to the investor's desired exposures to specified risk factors. Traditional asset class-based asset allocation tends to obscure the portfolio's sensitivity to overlapping risk factors such as inflation risk, so controlling risk exposures may be problematic. In contrast, multi-factor risk models, aka factor-based asset allocation, helps to control systematic risk exposures in asset allocation. Begin with specifying risk factors and desired exposure to each factor. Asset classes are listed with their sensitivity to each factor. Asset class portfolio is constructed that isolate exposure to each risk factor. These factor portfolios involve both long and short positions. The risk factors are associated with expected return premiums. Long and short positions in the assets may be needed to isolate the respective risks and associated expected return premiums. Examples of how risk factor exposures can be achieved. Inflation. Going long nominal treasuries and short inflation-linked bonds isolates the inflation component. Real interest rates. Inflation-linked bonds provide a proxy for real interest rates. U.S. volatility. Volatility index futures provide a proxy for implied volatility. Credit spread it. Going long high-quality credit and short treasuries government bonds isolates credit exposure. Duration. Going long 10-plus year treasuries and short 1-3 to three year treasuries isolates the duration exposure being targeted. Selection of a strategic asset allocation generally involves the following steps. Step 1. Determine and quantify the investor's objectives. Always start with objectives. Step 2. Determine the investor's risk tolerance and how risk should be expressed and measured. Step 3. Determine investment horizons. Step 4. Determine other constraints and requirements, for example, tax status, environmental and social considerations, legal, regulatory, political, political sensitivities, etc. Step 5. Determine the approach to asset allocation most suitable for investor. For example, use asset only, liability relative, goals based. Step 6. Specify asset classes and develop a set of capital market expectations for the specified asset classes. Step 7. Develop a range of potential asset allocation choices. Step 8. Test the robustness of the potential choices by using simulations like Monte Carlo, sensitivity analysis, when CME variables change. And step nine, iterate steps seven to nine until asset allocation choice is selected. Revisiting the three asset allocation approaches. For each asset allocation approach, the following are what to assess and consider when selecting the most appropriate asset allocation among options that are presented. Under asset only, Sharpe ratio is a key measure when ranking choices among asset allocation options, but should not be the only measure when selecting the most appropriate asset allocation 
because it does not capture other characteristics important to the asset owner. Make sure portfolio's volatility and VAR measures are within tolerance specified. Proposed asset allocation is more diversified if it has allocation of non-domestic equities and nominal and inflation-linked bonds. Increase in equity exposure has merit because it gives more exposure to such factors as GDP growth. Inflation-linked bonds could be expected to hedge the inflation risk. Further step once a proposed asset allocation is selected is to examine the inflation risk of forecast by changing the CME assumptions and simulating shocks to such variables as inflation. Financial theory suggests that investors should consider the global market value-weighted portfolio as a baseline asset allocation in context of asset-only approach because this portfolio sums all investable assets, i.e. global stocks, bonds, real estate, etc., and reflects supply and demand across markets while minimizing diversifiable risk. At a minimum, using it as a baseline serves as a starting point for discussion as to rationale for moving away from the global capitalization market weights. It can also be a reference point for a highly diversified portfolio and provide discipline to mitigate investment biases like home country bias. However, implementation hurdles are non-public assets don't have information so it's impossible to estimate their size in the portfolio. And it's not practical to invest in some assets like direct real estate. Practically speaking, proxies for global market portfolios include more like ETFs. Now under the liability relative, does the proposed allocation include an allocation to an X amount of fixed income portfolio that is very closely matching of interest rate sensitivity to the present value of plan liabilities? Is there an equities allocation that has the potential to give more buffer between meeting liabilities and the surplus beyond that with assets? Even if a proposed allocation mix is less efficient than another mix, it may be selected if it has less risk to funded status. Constructing a portfolio that hedges interest rate sensitivity, i.e. duration, inflation, and credit risk suggests that risk factor modeling is a good idea. If a fund was underfunded, it might consider a liability glide path, which is a technique in which the plan sponsor specifies in advance the desired proportion of liability hedging assets and return seeking assets as funded status changes and contributions are made. Under goals-based, goals-based asset allocation approach systemizes mental accounts. Subportfolios are created with each representing a goal. For example, a family's portfolio might be divided into three based on each of these goals. Lifestyle minimum, which provides protection for the family's lifestyle in a disaster scenario. Lifestyle baseline, which are needs beyond just living and surviving. And lifestyle aspirational, which reflects all the desires that make up a higher lifestyle like museum gifting, for example. Each subportfolio has an assigned time horizon and required probability. When there is an amount required for consumption in the future with desired expected return of X percent, you discount to present value to figure out how much to put in the fund now. If you want a higher probability of achieving that amount, you can lower the discount rate so that the present value is higher. To mitigate longevity risk, outliving your assets, you can purchase annuity insurance. Drawback of goals-based approach is that subportfolios and add complexity and goals may be ambiguous and the portfolio as a whole may not be efficient. After establishing the strategic asset allocation policy, the next step is implementation. During implementation, you have to decide whether to employ passive or active management. There are two dimensions of passive versus active management. First, actively managing the weighting to different asset classes versus passively keeping the weights matching the strategic asset allocation. And secondly, actively managing which assets to invest in within an asset class versus passively keeping individual asset selection the same as benchmark. And we'll see this in attribution analysis later 
where you are looking at the allocation effect, which is the weighting difference of the portfolio from benchmark, and the selection effect, which is actually selecting different stocks than the benchmark. When asset class weighting differs in active management, there is tactical asset allocation, which is deliberate short-term deviations from strategic asset allocation to exploit perceived deviations from equilibrium, which involves market timing. Usually mandated to keep deviations from strategic asset allocation within rebalancing ranges or within risk budgets. For example, response to price momentum, perceived asset class valuation, or particular stage of the business cycle. Then there's dynamic asset allocation, which are deviations from the strategic asset allocation motivated by longer term valuation signals or economic views. Then when it comes to individual asset selection, under passive management, portfolio composition does not change in reaction to changes in CMEs or information into individual investments. Note that if portfolio is constructed to track returns of an index and portfolio composition adds or drops equities in response to the index composition changing, then this is passive management, not active, i.e. reconstitution of the fund. Indexing is a common approach to passive investing. Another example, buying holding fixed portfolio of bonds to maturity. But under active management for individual security selection, change the portfolio composition of assets in response to changes in CMEs or new information. Objective is to achieve, after expenses, positive excess risk adjusted returns relative to passive benchmark. Realistically, implementation choices fall on a passive to active spectrum, not black and white passive or active. On the spectrum, with more active management, there is an increase in tracking risk and increase in active shares relative to the benchmark. For pure passive, indexing to a broad global market portfolio, it's a buy and hold investment, non-cap weighted index. Then a little bit to the right, we have a portfolio with mostly developed market equities index and small weighting in actively managed emerging market equities. A little more to the right, we have traditional, relatively well-diversified active strategies. A little more leaning towards active is an allocation to equities in ETFs tracking an index, and it has both passive and active elements because decision to overweight in the ETFs is active, while weighting index tracking is passive. Then you have full active management, which has unconstrained mandates and various aggressive and or diversified strategies. Factors that influence whether to invest passively or actively and where on the spectrum are 1. Availability of investments. For example, is there an index that you can passively track? 2. Scalability of active strategies being considered. Does active strategy add value? 3. There are client-specific constraints, for example, investors' ESG criteria. 4. Beliefs in whether there is market informational inefficiency that can be exploited. 5. Incremental costs, i.e. investment management costs, trading costs, turnover-induced taxes, etc. And 6. Tax status. Taxable investors have more hurdles. Risk budgeting. Risk budgeting approach to asset allocation is an approach that specifies how risk is to be distributed across assets in the portfolio without consideration of assets expected returns. Risk is measured in volatility and can be stated in absolute or relative terms and in money or percent terms. For example, Overall risk budget for a portfolio is 20% of return volatility, with 5% from equities, 10% from emerging market bonds, and 5% from real estate index. Risk budget can accompany another asset allocation approach, i.e. it doesn't have to be an exclusive asset allocation approach. Active risk budgeting addresses 
how much benchmark relative risk on an investor is willing to take in seeking to outperform a benchmark. Along the passive active spectrum, active risk can be defined relative to strategic asset allocation benchmark. And benchmark may be the strategic asset allocation weights applied to specified indices. Within asset classes, active risk can be defined relative to asset class benchmark. Rebalancing is the discipline of adjusting the portfolio weights to more closely align with the strategic asset allocation. Key part of monitoring and feedback step of portfolio construction. Rebalancing policy generally documented in the IPS. Normal changes in asset prices cause the portfolio asset mix to deviate from target weights. Rebalancing is the set of portfolio adjustments triggered by such price changes. Note that other portfolio adjustments, even systematic ones, are not rebalancing. Never rebalancing results in high return, and presumably higher risk, assets to grow and dominate the portfolio. Because rebalancing is counter-cyclical, it is fundamentally a contrarian investment approach. Thus, rebalancing is a discipline to better align with the strategic asset allocation. Framework for rebalancing. One way is to do calendar rebalancing at set times, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, but it is an arbitrary rebalancing point. Another way is to do range-based rebalancing. This is based on trigger points or thresholds. It can be percentage-based. For example, if target allocation is at least 50% of portfolio value, it can be fixed width, for example, if target allocation is outside of the 35% to 45% weighting, or it can be volatility based. For example, if asset class volatility is outside of 5 to 10%. Considerations in rebalancing. Are there governance resources and staff to rebalance? Higher transaction costs means rebalancing ranges should be wider. More risk-averse investors will have tighter rebalancing ranges. Less correlated assets have tighter rebalancing ranges. Beliefs in momentum favor wider rebalancing ranges, whereas mean reversion encourages tighter ranges. Illiquid investments complicate rebalancing. Derivatives create the possibility of synthetic rebalancing. Taxes discourage rebalancing and encourage asymmetric and wider ranges because rebalancing triggers capital gains or losses. Once the portfolio is evaluated and an unacceptably large deviation from strategic asset allocation is found, the investor must determine what the rebalancing trade size should be, the timeline for rebalancing implementation, and rebalancing back to target weights to range edge or to halfway between range edge trigger point and the target weight. Reading six, principles of asset allocation. First, let's talk about the asset only asset allocation approach. Mean variance optimization. MVO is a framework for determining how much to allocate to each asset in order to maximize the expected return of the portfolio for an expected level of risk. It requires three inputs, returns, risks, i.e. standard deviation, and correlations for every pair of assets pairwise in the opportunity set. Formula for investors' utility for an asset mix is expected return minus 0.005 times lambda, which is the investor's risk aversion coefficient, times standard deviation squared, i.e. variance. Tip to remember, lambda looks like an upside down V, and you have to multiply it by variance, which is the standard deviation squared, not just standard deviation. Also note that this formula is already expressed in percentage, so if the return is 5%, then input it as 5. Basically, this formula says that the value of an asset mix for an investor is equal to the expected return of the asset mix 
minus the trade-off of lowering the variance equal to one half of the expected variance, which is determined by the investor's risk aversion coefficient. So it means less risk means less expected return. The risk aversion coefficient is between 1 and 10. Moderate risk averse investor is about 4. Determined by examining the investor's preference for risk, i.e. willingness, and capacity for taking risk. Then the MVO, optimized asset mixes based on risk and return, are plotted on the efficient frontier. Constraints of optimized efficient frontier are typical budget constraint, i.e. weights must sum to 100%, no shorting, weights and asset allocation must all be positive, only long positions, no short or negative positions. Remember that in the efficient frontier graph, the very left bottom point is the global minimum variance portfolio, and the plot shows expected return on the left and standard deviation on the x-axis, so the slope is the sharp ratio. Note that the asset-only approach looks only at assets, which includes the extended assets i.e. the present value of human capital. Monte Carlo simulation simulates the likelihood of meeting various goals, the distribution of the portfolio's expected value through time, and the potential maximum drawdown. Also, it's a tool to investigate trading and rebalancing costs and taxes and how econo economic and financial market variables interact with asset allocation. Now this is pretty important and shows up a lot on the exam. Criticisms of MBO are 1. The outputs, i.e. the asset allocation, are highly sensitive to small changes in inputs. And this can be addressed by reverse optimization or Black Litterman because these two approaches improve the quality of inputs and constrain the optimization, which we'll see later. Another criticism of MBO is that the asset allocations tend to be highly concentrated in a subset of the available asset classes. Again, this is addressed by reverse optimization and Black Letterman. Third criticism of MBO, many investors are concerned about more than the mean and the variance of returns. This is addressed using Monte Carlo with additional constraints and other non-normal optimization approaches. The fourth criticism of MBO is that the sources of risk may not be diversified. This is addressed by risk budgeting and factor-based allocation. The fifth and sixth criticisms of MBO are that MBO doesn't address the liability or consumption needs. MBO is a single period framework, so it doesn't take into account trading or rebalancing costs or taxes. These next approaches address the criticisms of MBO. First, reverse optimization. Reverse optimization is a technique that addresses the first two criticisms of the MBO, which are that the asset allocation is highly sensitive to small changes in inputs, and that asset allocations tend to be highly concentrated in a subset of the available asset classes. So reverse optimization improves the quality of inputs it constrains the optimization, and it treats the efficient frontier as a statistical construct. In MBO, the efficient portfolios are more sensitive to expected returns than volatilities or correlation. So the reverse optimization helps address that. The reverse optimization tool takes as inputs a set of asset allocation weights that are assumed to be optimal and with the additional inputs of covariances and the risk aversion coefficient, it solves for expected returns. Reverse optimization works opposite direction of MBO, i.e. the MBO solves for asset allocation weights in asset classes versus the reverse optimization uses the weights and solves for expected return using additional inputs. The most common set of starting weights is the observed market cap value of the assets and asset classes. World 
market portfolio has non-overlapping asset classes, so it can be used as the market weight, as the starting inputs. But those who object to using the global or world market portfolio can use any starting weights like the existing policy portfolio weights, average asset allocation of peer groups, or other. Then use CAPM to find expected return, market risk premium, times beta plus the risk-free rate, for each asset or asset class, and sum the weighted expected return for the portfolio. By using the reverse optimization, we're consistently relating assets expected returns to their systematic risk. Another approach that addresses the criticisms of MBO, which is similar to reverse optimization, is the Black-Litterman model. Black-Litterman model uses the expected returns from the reverse optimization and adds the investor's unique forecasts and views of expected returns for each asset or asset class. It also solves for expected return not the asset class weights, just like the reverse optimization versus MBO solves for asset class weights. Again, both Black Litterman and reverse optimization start from the global market weights, so the allocation is closer to the market portfolio, whereas MBO is concentrated in just a few asset classes. So this is why it addresses the criticism that asset allocations for MBO are highly concentrated in a subset of the available asset classes, but reverse optimization and Black Letterman helps diversify that. As a tip to remember, if there are investor views that as an input, then it's Black Letterman, but if it's not and just follows the market portfolio as the inputs, then it's reverse optimization. Another approach to addressing the criticism of MBO is adding an additional set of constraints and resampled MBO. First, typical additional constraints in the optimization process include specifying a set allocation to an asset, for example, only 8% in real estate, specifying an asset allocation range to an asset, for example, only have 5 to 20% in emerging market equities, specifying an upper limit due to liquidity cons considerations, for example, must have less than 10% to hedge funds, specifying a relative allocation of two or more assets, for example, emerging market equities should be less than developed market equities, and in a liability relative or surplus optimization, hold assets hedging liabilities. But note that if there are too many constraints, you're no longer optimizing, but rather specifying an asset allocation based on these constraints. So there needs to be a balance. And this is where resampled MVO comes in. Resampling uses Monte Carlo to estimate a large number of potential capital market assumptions and constraints, basically a large scale sensitivity analysis. Criticisms of this includes some frontiers have concave bumps where expected return decreases as expected risk increases. The riskier asset allocations are over diversified at this point. Asset allocation inherits estimation errors because it uses Monte Carlo and it, the approach lacks a foundation in theory. So far we looked at reverse optimization Black Litterman, adding additional set of constraints, and resampled MVO. Finally, the fifth approach to addressing the constraints of the MVO approach to asset allocation is using other non-normal optimization approaches. MVO only measures return, mean, and variance because it's normally distributed. Whereas non-normally distributed optimizers will also include skewness i.e. the degree to which either downside or upside is asymmetrical, long tail, and kurtosis, which means high f how frequently extreme events occur, i.e. fat tail. Historically, asset class returns are not normally distributed. Some non-normal optimizers include 
mean semivariance, mean conditional value at risk, mean variance skewness, mean variance skewness kurtosis. Now let's discuss asset class liquidity considerations in asset allocation. Large institutional investors can invest in less liquid asset classes like direct real estate, infrastructure, and private equity. E-liquid assets may offer an expected return premium and diversification benefits, but determining an asset allocation has challenges. Low-cost passive investment vehicles do not exist for private equity, for example, and PE index do not capture risk nor return attributes of private equity. In addressing asset allocation to less liquid asset classes, practical options include just excluding less liquid asset classes altogether and investing in real estate funds, infrastructure funds, and private equity funds. Attempt to model the less liquid asset inputs to represent specific risk characteristics associated with the likely implementation vehicles. Or attempt to model the less liquid asset inputs to represent the highly diversified characteristics associated with the true asset classes. Or use real estate indexes, listed infrastructure and public equity indexes as proxy, which I think I already listed above. Another asset allocation approach other than asset only is risk budgeting. It identifies the total amount of risk and allocates the risk to a portfolio's con constituent assets. Optimal risk budget allocates risk efficiently, i.e. it maximizes return per unit of risk. It helps better understand the sources of risk, and knowing marginal risk allows you to approximate the change in portfolio risk due to changes in holdings. It helps you determine which asset positions are optimal, and it allows you to create a risk budget to optimize the use of risk. For each asset or asset class in the portfolio, determine its MCTR, which is the marginal contribution to risk, and then multiply the marginal contribution to risk to asset weights in the portfolio to get the absolute contribution to total risk, or ACTR. Again, MCTR, which is the marginal contribution to risk, is the asset in the portfolio's beta times the portfolio's standard deviation. Beta I times standard deviation of portfolio. And multiply the MCTR by each asset weight to get that asset's ACTR. Then the ratio of excess return to MCTR is to take the expected return minus the risk-free rate divided by the MCTR. Basically, an asset allocation is optimal when the ratio of excess return to MCTR is the same for all assets. Next, other than asset only and risk budgeting asset allocation approaches, the third one we'll talk about is factor-based. Typical factors used in asset allocation include market, equity exposure, size, valuation, momentum, liquidity, duration or term, credit, and volatility. Other than market factors, these are return drivers that help explain returns not explained by CAPM. Other than the market factor, getting exposure to each risk factor is done by a self-financing investment or a $0 investment where you combine a long and a short position. For example, getting exposure to size factor is done by combining short large cap stock and long small cap stock return. That way you have $0 investment or it's self-financing, but you have risk exposure to the small cap which is the size factor. Constructing factors in this manner removes the market exposure from factors because it only involves the offsetting long-short position. Therefore, the factors have generally low correlation with the market and with one another. Note that the total return context 
is when you include the risk-free asset to the return. So make sure to include the risk-free return. Additional examples of the pairwise self-financing risk exposure includes, well, for treasury bonds or the risk-free rate, it would just be the long-term treasury bonds. For market factor, it would be long total market return and minus or short cash. Size factor would be long small cap and short large cap. Value factor would be long value and short growth stocks. Credit factor would be long corporate bonds and short the treasury bonds. Exposure to the duration risk factor would be long treasury bonds and short treasury bills, the short term maturity. And the mortgage exposure would be long the mortgage backed securities and short the treasury bonds. Limitation of factor based asset allocation approach is that it concentrates risk exposure only to the selected factors and not to other factors per present in the market portfolio. Next, we'll talk about liability relative asset allocation approach. We've so far looked at asset only, risk budgeting, and factor based. Now, liability relative. Types of liabilities affect the choice of appropriate discount rate to calculate the present value of liabilities and thus how the assets are allocated. Liabilities characteristics determine the composition of the liability matching portfolio and the portfolio's basis risk, which is the degree of mismatch between hedging portfolio cash flow and the liabilities. Thus, the characteristics of liabilities are important as the first step to determining the asset allocation in a liability relative approach. These characteristics of liabilities are 1. Is it fixed or contingent cash flows? Is it a legal or quasi liability? What is the duration and convexity of liability cash flows? What's the value of liabilities compared to the size of the fund and the sponsoring organization? What are the factors driving future liability cash flows? Is it inflation, economic conditions, interest rates, risk premium? What is the time consideration such as longevity risk? Regulations affecting liability cash flow calculations. As a pre-step before liability relative asset allocation approach, first, you have to calculate the portfolio's funding ratio and the surplus if it's overfunded. Those steps are, first, calculate the market value of the assets in the portfolio, then project the liability cash flows via actuarials for pensions, then determine appropriate discount rate for the liability cash flows. Note, in many cases, Regulations and traditions set the discount rate for you. And then compute the present value of the liabilities and the surplus, which is the market value of assets minus the present value of the liabilities. And also calculate the funding ratio, which is the market value of assets divided by the present value of liabilities. Note that the surplus and funding ratio are highly dependent on the discount rate assumption. The three approaches under the liability relative asset allocation approach are 1. Surplus optimization 2. Hedging slash return seeking optimization, also called the two portfolio and 3. Integrated asset liability or ALM. We'll talk about each. 1. Surplus optimization. This applies the MBO for the surplus only. Step one is to list the assets in the portfolio and estimate the expected returns and volatilities for assets and the present value of the liabilities. Then you add the constraints and then estimate the correlation matrix and volatilities and then use the MVO optimization program to plot the efficient frontier. Is the current portfolio efficient? And then asset allocation graph. If there is no surplus, then it would only be hedging the liabilities. So only where there is assets minus liabilities and there's an excess of that, that surplus would be optimized using MBO. 
The second approach under liability relative is the hedging return seeking optimization. This has separate portfolio for hedging and a separate portfolio for return seeking assets. You hedge the cash flows via the cash flow matching, duration matching, or immunization, and you can do partial hedge or dynamic versions where hedging increases as the funding ratio increases. You need to identify the discount rate and assets driven by the same factors as the liabilities. For example, increase the discount rate, increase the funding ratio, since present value of liabilities goes down in the denominator and it may decrease the contributions. Limitations are that it can't hedge if the funding ratio is less than one. And true hedging may be unavailable and it is only for single period. Again, remember that for the hedging return seeking optimization, you can only do this if the funding ratio is above one. So really for the first and the second, the surplus optimization and the two portfolio hedging return seeking optimization, both of them would look the same if the funding ratio was less than one because both would only hedge. The third liability relative approach is the integrated asset liability or ALM. It jointly optimizes the liability and doesn't come before assets. Used by banks, long short hedge funds and insurance companies, it can be used for any funding ratio and it can be used for multi-periods and can be used for all levels of risk. But the complexity is very high. Note that factor-based approach can be used with any of these three approaches of liability relative approach. Next, we'll talk about goals-based asset allocation approach. Inputs in the goals-based asset allocation approach are one, the time horizon, two, the investor's required return or volatility for each goal or cash flow, and three, the investor's required probability of success of getting the return at the end of the time horizon. Other considerations include taxes. Overall portfolio needs to be divided into sub-portfolios for each goal. The advisor will typically not create a specific sub-portfolio for each goal, but will select from a pre-established set of modules that already have an asset allocation. Besides different return risk profile, each module differs and ranges in the liquidity requirements and the inclusion of certain asset classes or strategies. Modules are put together based on CMEs and MVO is used with various constraints, which include liquid assets are included only, normal distributions, and drawdown control is included to alleviate problems potentially arising from market conditions that make it too risky. Determining the cash flows required for the goal is not difficult. The difficult part is the issue of urgency of the goal and therefore the probability required to meet the goal. To address this, first label each goal by need, want, wish, or dream, and ascribe a required probability to meet each goal. For example, if it is a need, then apply 90 to 99% probability. If it's a want or a wish, then somewhere between 60 and 90. And if it's a dream, the probability can be less than 60%. Module options presented should satisfy the following. It should cover a wide spectrum of the investment universe, ranging from a portfolio that has nearly all cash to a portfolio that's all equity. And also the portfolios are all sufficiently differentiated to avoid la overlap should be a requirement. Modules need to be revisited periodically. Goals-based asset allocation should also be periodically reviewed. Two considerations in particular are, one year later, the time horizon might still be the same. For example, five-year goal of having $1 million to donate. Well, one year later, Instead of four years left, the investor may still want the goal to be met five years later at that time. And another consideration is the need for rebalancing when certain goals appear excessive, 
but could be costly for taxable investors. Other than the approaches of asset allocation that we discussed, which are asset only, risk budgeting, liability relative, goals based, and factor based, other approaches and heuristics that are used to allocate assets among asset classes are 1. 120 minus your age rule, which is basically using 120 or sometimes 100 minus your age is how much to allocate to stocks. So if you're 25 years old, then 120 minus 25 is 95, so 95% should be in stocks versus fixed income. The second is the 60-40 stock bond approach. And there is some evidence that the global financial asset market portfolio is close to the 60-40 split between stocks and fixed income. Third is the endowment model, which is high allocation to non-traditional assets like alternative assets, private equities, and actively managed with long time horizons. This is the opposite of the Norway model, which is highly committed to passive investment through public securities and has zero to very little alternative asset allocation. The fourth is the risk parity approach, which basically the formula is the weighting of each asset class should be one over N times the variance of the portfolio times the covariance of the asset to portfolio. The total portfolio risk should be equally allocated across assets in the portfolio. And the fifth approach is one over N rule, which is just the equal allocation to all asset classes in the portfolio. We'll now wrap up this section with rebalancing. Benefits and costs need to be weighed against each other when rebalancing. Disciplined rebalancing tends to reduce risk while incrementally adding to returns and incrementally earning diversification return and return from shorting volatility since rebalancing keeps reducing volatility. Due to costs and other factors, the rebalancing range threshold, or also called corridor, should be wider or narrower in order to rebalance back to the strategic asset allocation. The following are example factors affecting optimal corridor width of an asset class. If transaction cost is high, then have a high corridor width. If risk tolerance is high, then have a high quarter width. If correlation with the rest of the portfolio is high, then have a high corridor width because when asset classes move in sync, further divergence is less likely. And if the volatility of the rest of the portfolio is high, then have a narrow corridor width. And this is because if asset class is not brought back to the optimal range, then the chance of an even further divergence of a high volatility asset class is greater. As a recap, all of the above listed is increase means increase in corridor width, except for volatility. If there's an increase in volatility, then decrease the corridor width. In a volatility based rebalancing, corridor width is set proportionally to the asset class's own volatility. When there are opposing forces that would make the optimal corridor width be wider or narrower, consider which one is the stronger force. For example, volatility of domestic bonds increases. Assume that domestic bonds are relatively illiquid. Since they are illiquid, the increase in volatility suggests widening the rebalancing band because containing transaction costs is more important than the expected utility losses from allowing a larger divergence from strategic asset allocation. So in this case, transaction cost is more costly, so this is the stronger force and therefore increase the corridor width. Reading 7, Asset Allocation with Real World Constraints Asset size that's too large or too small will create constraints on the ability to allocate to certain assets. For example, let's say you have cash asset class and money market funds. For large asset pool owners, constraints are that there are no size constraints actually. But for small asset pool owners, 
there's also no small no size constraints because it's just cash when it comes to equity constraints for large asset pool owners is that it's generally accessible but optimal allocation might be too large with not enough available or liquid assets available to meet the optimal allocation particularly for small cap and emerging market equities there might just not be enough assets to purchase and constraints for small asset pool owners is that it's generally accessible but they're more limited in governance and infrastructure and thus it's too small to adequately diversify across a range of asset classes and small asset pool owners also have staffing constraints and limited managers when it comes to bonds large asset pool owners generally have no constraints and all bonds are generally accessible but for small asset pool owners the same as equity applies to bonds as well which is they might have limited governance infrastructure and so not enough staff to oversee it or have expertise or they might not be able to adequately diversify across a range because what their assets allow them is too small uh, also it's complex strategies for bonds may be beyond the reach of small asset pool owners because of lack of investment expertise on the staff or oversight committee and in some asset classes and strategies commingled investment vehicles can be used to achieve diversification and actually all of these constraints also apply to the small asset pool owners when it comes to equity when it comes to alternative investments including hedge funds private debt private equity infrastructure timberland and farmland for large asset pool owners there may not be enough funds available if the assets managed are too large if size available is too small or not liquid enough investment won't contribute materially to affect the risk return profile of the portfolio and the asset pool owners might have lack of expertise at the staff or board level to conduct due diligence or lack of resources for staff to oversee the investment for small asset pool owners they may have legal minimum qualifications that can exclude small asset owners when it comes to alternative investments for example in the US accredited investors must have at least 5 million dollars in investments and companies must have at least 25 million dollars and investment managers must have at least 25 million dollars in AUM but they can use commingled investment vehicles however these also typically require high minimum investments also they may lack the expertise and knowledge and there may not be enough staff or managing resources and not enough budget to hire them another real world constraint when it comes to asset allocation is liquidity you must consider two dimensions of liquidity for asset allocation first liquidity needs of the asset owner and liquidity characteristics of the asset class in addition to the evaluation of these liquidity characteristics you have to also evaluate the potential liquidity needs in the context of an extreme market stress event another real world constraint is time horizon as time passes characteristics of both assets human capital or financial capital and liabilities change and prioritization of goals also change which changes time horizon constraints regulatory and external constraints apply to each of these types of investors for insurance companies there are certain accounting treatment requirements risk-based capital requirements example risk-based capital measures include yield liquidity potential for forced liquidation of assets to fund negative claims development credit ratings additional allocation requirements imposed by regulators are for example maximum limit on equity exposure of 10% many countries are moving towards solvency to regulatory standards which harmonizes risk based capital requirements for insurance companies across countries for pension funds they're subject to a wide array of funding accounting reporting and tax constraints 
For example, U.S. public pension accounting rules favor equity investment because higher equity allocations support a higher discount rate and thus lower pension cost. Funding and financial statement considerations such as anticipated contributions, volatility of anticipated contributions, or forecasted pension expense or income. Regulatory and tax constraints on minimum and maximum contributions or minimum required funded levels. Constraints can be factored into simulations to see how the constraints affect risk reward trade-offs. For endowment and foundations, they're established with the expectation that they will exist in perpetuity and thus they can invest in a long investment horizon. Tax incentives, like many countries provide tax benefits tied to ta certain minimum spending requirements. Credit considerations for endowment and foundations are that lenders often require that the borrower, university that owns endowment or foundation organization, maintain certain minimum balance sheet ratios. And for sovereign wealth funds, each is unique to their own country, but generally, they don't exist to meet a set of liabilities or obligations. For example, Korean sovereign wealth funds cannot invest in Korean won-denominated domestic assets, and Norwegian sovereign wealth funds are not permitted to invest in alternative asset class other than the real estate. Sovereign wealth funds are publicly owned assets, so are typically subject to broad public scrutiny and tend to have lower risk asset allocation. There may also be cultural or religious constraints. Real world constraints include tax and how tax affects portfolios. Pre-tax and after-tax risk and return profiles of asset classes are very different. Different countries have different tax rules and rates, but some high-level commonalities are interest income is taxed typically at highest tax rate and then dividend income comes next. And then capital gains taxes receive the most favorable tax treatment. After-tax portfolio optimization requires adjusting each asset class's expected return and risk for expected tax. For expected return on equity, you have to take into consideration the tax on dividends using the dividend tax rate and tax on the price appreciation, which is the capital gains tax. For fixed income or bonds, it's just tax on interest income. Taxes also affect standard deviation of each asset class. The after-tax standard deviation is basically the pre-tax standard deviation times one minus the tax rate, just like for returns. How taxes affect portfolio rebalancing. Rebalancing is discretionary, i.e. it's not a must. So taxable asset owners should consider the trade-off between the benefits of tax minimization and the merits of maintaining the target asset allocation by rebalancing. Because after-tax volatility is less than pre-tax volatility and asset class correlations remain the same, it takes larger asset class movements to materially alter the risk profile of the taxable portfolio. This suggests that rebalancing ranges for a taxable portfolio can be wider than those of a tax-exempt portfolio with a similar risk profile. Rebalancing range also changes due to the tax effect. For example, if the threshold is 10%, then find the after-tax component of that by dividing the 10% by 1 minus the tax rate, so it would be higher. Strategies to reduce the tax impact include tax loss harvesting, which is intentionally trading to realize a capital loss, which is then used to offset a current or future realized gain in another part of the portfolio, and strategic asset location, which is placing less tax efficient assets in accounts with more favorable tax treatment, such as retirement savings accounts or tax deferred accounts, as a general rule, the assets that are eligible for lower tax rates and deferred capital gains tax treatment should first be allocated to the taxable account. For example, equities should generally be held in taxable accounts 
while taxable bonds and high turnover trading strategies should generally be located in tax-exempt and tax-deferred accounts. One important exception is for assets held for liquidity needs in the near term, which should be put in easily accessible taxable accounts, even if they are bonds. Many institutional investors typically revise the asset allocation policy at least once every five years through a formal asset allocation study, and all asset owners should affirm annually that the allocation is appropriate given their needs and circumstances. Circumstances that might trigger a special review of the asset allocation policy are due to goals, constraints, and beliefs changing. In terms of goals, there might be changes in business conditions affecting the organization supporting the fund and therefore expected changes in the cash flows. A change in the investor's personal circumstances that may alter the risk appetite or risk capacity. For constraints, any material change in a constraint, whether it's time horizon, liquidity, needs, asset size, regulatory, or external constraints. And beliefs, such as changes in the economic environment, beliefs about CMEs and other forecasted expected returns, volatilities, correlations of the asset classes. Changes in trustee or committee members, bringing their own beliefs and biases regarding certain investment activities. In these situations, conducting an asset allocation study to educate these members and introduce them to the investment philosophy and process that the organization follows will smooth their integration into the governance in place. And there might be certain life milestones that can trigger for implementing a change in the asset allocation policy and a glide path can be set up as a tool. Now let's talk about short-term shifts in asset allocation. Tactical asset allocation might be justified based on cyclical variations within a secular trend, for example, stage of business or monetary cycle, or temporary price dislocations in capital markets. Note that secular means long-term, like 10 years without a periodic fluctuation, like a cycle. Tactical asset allocation has the objective of increasing return, risk-adjusted return, by taking advantage of short-term economic and financial market conditions. Most common risk constraint is meeting the allowable range for each asset class's policy target weight. Other constraints include trading within tracking error budget versus the strategic asset allocation or a range of targeted risk, for example, allowable range of predicted volatility. Whether TAA was successful can be evaluated by comparing sharp ratio under TAA versus what it would have been realized under the SAA. Comparing information ratio or T-statistic of the average excess return of TAA portfolio versus SAA portfolio, or plotting the realized return and risk of the TAA portfolio versus SAA portfolio's efficient frontier. The trade-offs to consider whether to deviate from SAA by trading via tactical asset allocation are higher trading costs and taxes, increased concentration risk relative to policy portfolio, reduced diversification of risk contributions. Difference between discretionary TAA and systematic TAA. Discretionary TAA is based on manager skill in predicting and timing short-term market moves away from SAA. It relies on a qualitative interpretation of political, economical, and financial market conditions. Short-term forecasts consider many data points, including valuations like PE, PB, ratios, dividend yield, inflation expectations, leading economic indicators, term spreads, credit spreads, central bank policy, GDP growth, earnings expectations, economic sentiment indicators, and market sentiment, which are indicators of optimism or pessimism about the market. For example, for margin borrowing, if rate of change of borrowing increases, then the market is bullish. Systematic TAA uses signals or quantitative approach to capture anomalies in asset class returns that have been shown to have some predictability and persistence. 
value and momentum are example factors that have been determined to offer some level of predictability. Value factor, return of value stocks over the return of growth stocks, or momentum factors are examples. Value ratios have been shown to have some predictability in the future equity returns. Behavioral factors that might arise in asset allocation include loss aversion, which may interfere with investors' ability to maintain chosen asset allocation through periods of negative returns, illusion of control, mental accounting, representativeness bias, framing bias, availability bias, and more. Mitigation methods when there are biases include framing the risk in terms of shortfall probability or by funding high priority goals with low risk assets, which frees up other sub portfolios to take on more risk. Using the global market portfolio as a starting point and then deviating away from that and having justification. Having a formal asset allocation process that optimizes constraints with strict policy ranges. Goals-based asset allocation. Governance framework with expertise and well-documented beliefs help evaluate objectively. Having an objective asset allocation process and governance. Presenting possible asset allocation choices with multiple perspectives of risk reward and stress tests like Monte Carlo simulation. Reading eight option strategies derivatives. For put call parity, put call forward parity, synthetic long forward position, synthetic short forward position, synthetic long put and synthetic long call, refer to the formulas practice or simply create a payoff table that shows the stock price at expiration at different prices and what the payoff or the total value would be. Now let's talk about the Greeks. First, implied volatility. Implied volatility is unobservable volatility from an option pricing model like Black Scholes Merton. Implied volatility indicates whether there is likelihood that price of the underlying will change a lot or not. If the call option implied volatility is 60%, for example, then there are a lot of investors bullish on the underlying, and that may change the underlying price to go up or down. Delta is the change in option price in response to a dollar change in the underlying stock price. For example, if stock price changes by 0.1, from 1504 to 1594, and the delta is 0.335, and option price is 0.65, then the new option price is 0.65 plus 0.335 times 0.1, which is 0.617. Delta for a call is always positive, and delta for a put is negative when they're both long. Long call increases in value as the underlying increases because the call buyer can gain more and as a result delta of call ranges from 0 to 1. Conversely, short call has the opposite sign so it's between 0 and negative 1. A long position in an underlying stock has a delta of 1 because obviously a change in the underlying is the change in that stock. When the share price is close to the strike price, i.e. it's at the money, delta is about 0.5 for a call and negative 0.5 for a put. A position delta is the combination of delta from each holding. For example, if the portfolio has a long stock and a short call, then long stock has a delta of 1, short call at the money has a delta of about 0.5, so the position delta is 1 minus 0.5, which is positive 0.5. So if underlying stock's price goes up, delta is less than 1. And profit is capped, but also the delta of 0.5 means it will have less downside than 1 if the underlying price goes down. Delta is also the probability of option expiring in the money. For example, delta of 0.4 is interpreted as 40% chance of expiring in the money. So lower the delta means lower the probability of it being in the money. 
for example, someone who wants to protect their asset but is risk averse, then they should sell a covered call with low delta, which will give them less premium for shorting the call that's out of the money, but there's low odds that the call will be in the money. Gamma is the change in delta per change of a dollar price of underlying stock. It's always positive for a long call and put. Negative for short call or short put. It is the curvature of delta. As underlying changes, the gamma changes the delta. Therefore, the option price changes. At the money, gamma is the highest, and it decreases if the option is in the money or out of the money. Gamma indicates how fast delta will change. Option price will change as the underlying price changes. Theta is the time decay of option price. For example, negative 0.02 theta means that the option price will decrease by negative 0.02 daily. And theta is always negative because time decay means that the option's value becomes more and more worthless as it approaches expiration. Vega is the change in option price per 1% change in implied volatility. For example, if implied volatility changes from 150% to 50% and Vega is 0.017, then option price changes from 0.65 to 0.65 plus 0 0.017 times negative 100 equals negative 1.05, i.e. it becomes worthless. If an option's implied volatility is high, then check Vega 2 because a large fall in the implied volatility will result in a huge decline in option value. Vega is positive for long calls and long puts. Implied volatility changes due to many factors, like political conditions, weather, or just before earnings call, it's very high. Spike in the implied volatility, and depending on Vega, it could be very good or very bad news for your option value. Remember, Vega volatility, Vega volatility. Theta starts with T, just like time. For option strategies and how they're structured, refer to the formulas, but for each option strategy, I'll talk about the investment objectives. First, basics. If a stock symbol is PBR and the quote says PBR October 16 call sells for $1.42, it does not mean that the expiration date is October 16th. It means that the stock PBR expires in October with an exercise price of $16. Remember, the longer the term until expiration, the higher the option premium, because you have more chances during that longer period of time to benefit from the option. By convention, option listing shows data for a single call or put, but in practice, the most common trading unit is one contract covering 100 underlying shares. For example, if you have a thousand shares of the underlying that you want to have downside protection for, you would buy a long put for 10 contracts. Time value as it relates to options is the, the call or the put premium minus the intrinsic value. So for example, if the call price is $1.64 and the stock price at expiration is $15.84 and the expiration price is $15.00, then the intrinsic value is 1584 minus 15. So the time value is $1.64 of the call pre premium minus the difference between 1584 and 15, which is 80 cents. Now let's look at option strategies. Again, for each structure, refer to the formulas and for payoffs, write out the payoff table. Covered call, long stock, short call. The call is short, so you have to cover the short call with a long stock. Investment objectives. Investor believes stock price is likely to remain flat over the next few months, so write a call to make some money from the premium. The portfolio has become overweighted in certain stocks, so write a call to reduce the exposure. Or investor believes stock is properly priced now, i.e. it hit the target, 
and wants to sell the stock anyway in the future, i.e. realize gains. But by writing a call at the similar price level, investor can make money from call premium and sell it per initial goal to make some money. Next, protective put. Long stock, long put. Investment objectives, guard against price decline like buying an insurance, paying premium for the right to sell the stock at the st strike price. When you add a long put, which has a negative delta to a long stock, then the position delta of that combination becomes less than one or less than the stock's delta. So you have reduced the risk. Protective put also provides downside protection only for a few months though. So you have to trade off between the cost by continually buying the put or if you really need the risk reduction. Cash secured put is when you write a put and you deposit the same amount of the exercise price into escrow in case the put is called. Investor is bullish on stock or wants to acquire shares at a certain price, similar to a covered call. When you do a long call on short position of stock, then you want to offset risk of short position on the stock. If you have a short stock and you have a short put, then you want to generate income from the premium of shorting the put. Bull spread, buy low, sell high in a bullish market. So bull spread is when you long a call with a lower exercise price and short a call with the higher exercise price, or you can do the same with put where you buy the put with low exercise price and write the put with high exercise price. A bull spread is a directional bet where the investor believes that the stock will be higher in the future. Bear spread is when you're bear in the market, you want to buy high and sell low. So you buy a put with a high strike price and sell a put with low strike price or with a call, you can do the same where you buy a call with a high strike price and sell a call with the low strike price. It is also a directional bet, but in this case, the spread becomes more valuable as the price of the underlying declines. So the investor believes that the price is gonna go down. A straddle is when you buy a put or buy a call at the same exercise price, that's a long straddle, and it has a upward pointing V as the payoff. Or a short straddle is when you write a put and write a call, and that has an upside down V payoff. It's a directional bet on the underlying volatility. For a long straddle, the investor believes that the stock will have large price changes, either up or down, i.e. there is a high volatility, implied volatility, and a short straddle is when the investor believes the stock will not move a lot. Caller is when you have a long stock and you write a short call at the exercise price above the stock price and long a put at exercise below the current stock price. You get downside protection via protective put and finances the put cost by selling a call. Zero cost caller is when the put and call premiums are the same and so you have no initial payment. Calendar spread is when you buy a longer term call and sell a shorter term call for a long calendar spread. Or the short calendar spread is when you buy a near term call and you sell a long term call. Or you can do the same with puts, calls, call and call, or put and put. Long calendar spread is when you're long the long, so you buy the long. In this case, investor believes stock will move, but not in the near term, so they take advantage of making a premium on short-term call for a long calendar spread. Or for short calendar spread, the investor believes there will be high volatility in the short term and then become stable later. Now more on volatility. Again, implied volatility is derived from an option pricing model like Black-Scholes. It incorporates investors' expectations about future consensus on asset returns direction and the level of market uncertainty. If the implied volatility of the option is high, then there is a greater chance of the stock price moving up or down in big swings 
because there is higher uncertainty. And when that happens, then there is a higher probability that the option will pay off. Realized volatility uses the actual historical variance of returns and square root, and then compared to implied volatility. When you plot an option by its implied volatility and the corresponding strike price as the x-axis, you can observe different shapes of the implied volatility curve. Theoretically, it would be flat, but in the real world, it has curves. Volatility smile is when you plot the implied volatility on the y-axis and the strike price on the x-axis, and you get a u-shape or a smile. As a put or call is more in the money or out of the money, basically to the left or to the right, and moving away from the at the money strike price, implied volatility goes up. At the money is when the implied volatility is the lowest in the middle. Demand drives prices, which also increases implied volatility. So this could indicate market sentiment that extreme events can occur. Volatility skew is on that same graph. You plot the implied volatility against strike price and it is upward sloping or downward sloping. If it's downward sloping, that means, which is a more commonly observed phenomenon, there is more demand for puts with strike prices below the underlying's current price, i.e. At the, at the money, and therefore it raises the prices of puts due to the demand, which in turn increases the implied volatility. It implies that the market sentiment is bearish. Or if it's upward sloping, that means that there's higher implied volatility for a strike price that is higher than at the money. That means there's more demand for calls and therefore call prices goes up and therefore implied volatility for calls with strike prices above the current underlying price, i.e. at the money, goes up and therefore market sentiment is bullish. Term structure of volatility is when you plot the implied volatility over the expiration in months, not strike price. The strike price is the same for all of these on the plot. It reflects the market sentiment on future implied volatility. So if it's upward sloping, that means the market sentiment is that there's going to be more volatility in the future. And finally, implied volatility surface is a 3D plot of implied volatility, strike price, and the expiration in months. It combines volatility smile or skew and the term structure of volatility at the same time. It shows varying expectations and sentiment of the market. For example, demand for certain options, whether they're bearish or bullish for a certain horizon of time. Based on the volatility trend observed, investor can make decisions to hedge the underlying or other option strategies. One common strategy is the risk reversal, which is the opposite of a caller and therefore it's a long call and a short put on the same underlying. When a trader thinks that the put implied volatility is too high relative to the call implied volatility, they will be long risk reversal. The trader expects the call will rise more in implied volatility relative to the put. Now imagine a three by three matrix. On the left, the rows are going to be expected move in implied volatility, and the top columns are going to be outlook on underlying asset price movement. The first row is that implied volatility expectation is gonna go down, and the second row is it's going to remain unchanged, and the third row is that implied volatility is expected to be high i.e. price is likely to change by a lot. Then the first column, the left column, is outlook on the underlying asset price movement is bearish, the middle column is neutral, and the right column is bullish. If implied volatility is expected to go down or be low, and you're in a bearish market, then you would write a call because you don't expect the price to go up and therefore, when you write a call, you don't think that the call that you wrote is going to be exercised, especially because volatility is low. And if you expect that the volatility is going to re 
remain unchanged and you're still bearish, then you would write a caller, i.e. you would write a call and you would also buy a put to protect yourself if it does go down. When your outlook on the market is bearish and you expect the implied volatility to be high, then you would buy a put to protect yourself from the underlying stock price going down. Now looking at the second column, let's say your outlook on the market is neutral and that you don't expect the underlying asset price to move very much. If you believe that the implied volatility is going to be low, then you would do a short straddle. If you believe that implied volatility is going to remain unchanged, then you would do a calendar spread. If you believe that the implied volatility is going to go up or be high, then you would do a long straddle. Then the third column, if your outlook on the market is that the underlying asset price is going to go up and you're bullish, and you believe that the implied volatility is expected to be low or go down, then you would write a put to make some money off of the put because you don't believe that the stock price is going to go down. If you believe that the implied volatility is going to remain unchanged, then you would buy a call and write a put. And if you believe that the implied volatility is going to be high and you're bullish, then you would buy a call. Oh my God, I'm going to pass out. Reading nine, swaps, forwards, and futures strategies. Interest rate swaps. Interest rate swaps are used to modify portfolio returns and risk exposures, i.e. hedging and directional bets. Two parties agree to exchange cash flow at specified dates, periodically and at expiration. Notional amounts are not exchanged. Payments swapped are commonly fixed versus floating payments. Swap tenor is when swap expires. Payments, periodically or at expiration, are netted at settlement if it's in the same currency. It's a way to achieve target duration and manage interest rate risk. So this is the formula with modified duration, MDUR. When a bond is fully hedged, its value is immunized with respect to change in yields. So the change in the value of the portfolio is equal to the notional principle of the swap times the change in value of the swap. It's a measure for change in the value of bond portfolio for a change in interest rate, which is measured by modified duration. You can use modified duration of the portfolio, the target, and swap to achieve a target duration. The duration of a floating rate bond is near zero because it has real-time matched interest rate, so there's almost no interest rate risk. But the duration of a fixed payment bond will not be zero. So a pay fixed will have negative duration because you're exposed to interest rate risk that's not immunized to match duration of zero from the pay fixed perspective. Remember, when you owe a payment, then it is negative duration. When you're going to receive a payment, it is positive duration. For example, let's say a firm has sold $20 million of a three-year floating rate bond that pays a semi-annual coupon equal to the six-month market reference rate plus 50 bips. A few days later, the firm's view changes and expects higher rates in the future. So, the company wants to enter into a swap of three years and semi-annual payments, paying fixed par swap rate of 1.25% and receive a six-month reference rate. Again, the situation is that the firm has issued floating rate bonds, so they are pay floating rate. And they want to manage the risk since the interest rate might go up. So the firm enters into a swap to receive floating and pay fixed. Remember, when you're calculating the periodic payment, multiply the notional amount by the reference rate times the number of days the coupon payment is due divided by 360. So since this is a semi-annual coupon, multiply the reference rate plus 50 bips by 180 over 360 times the 20 million to calculate at the floating rate. The formula for interest rate swap is NS, the notional amount of the swap, equals MDR target minus MDR portfolio divided by MDR swap times the market value of the portfolio. 
Next, interest rate forwards. Forwards are used mainly to hedge a loan expected to be taken out in the near future or to hedge against changes in the interest rates. It can be customized, but they have counterparty risk. Interest rate futures, also used to hedge against interest rate movements, but unlike forwards, futures are exchange traded, so they're standardized and guaranteed by a clearinghouse, and therefore the counterparty risk is zero. Fixed income interest rate futures can be used to hedge interest rate risk exposure. They have a limited number of maturities. The nearest month's contracts have higher liquidity than the larger tenors. Therefore, these are used commonly to hedge short-term bonds, up to two to three years remaining to maturity. Typically, a strip of futures contracts is used. Most futures contracts are closed before delivery or rolled into the next contract. If delivered, then the seller has the obligation to deliver and the right to choose which security to deliver. So obviously, the seller will choose the cheapest bond to deliver in this case. CTD is cheapest to deliver bond. We can see this in the formula. Step one is to calculate the BPV or the basis point value of the target, which is equal to the modified duration of the target times 0.01% to get the BPV times the market value of the portfolio. Then the second step is to find the hedge ratio or the number of contracts to buy or sell of the futures. So BPV of the hedge ratio is equal to the target BPV minus BPV portfolio divided by BPV CTD, the cheapest to deliver, times the conversion factor. Note that to find one contract of a futures basis point value, you can calculate that by multiplying the face value of one futures contract times the number of days divided by 360, which is the number of days of the money market instrument of the futures contract times 0.01% or one BIPs. Bond futures arbitrage or carry trade or trading the basis is when the spot rate and the futures rate are different. So you buy the cheaper one and sell the more expensive one. Currency swap. Currency swaps are similar to interest rate swaps, but they're different because one, interest rates are in different currencies. And two, the notional principal amounts may or may not be exchanged at the beginning and at the end of the swap's life. For example, the cross-currency basis swap ex exchanges notional principles because the goal of the transaction is to convert the amount that I have to get to a different currency. Note that a basis rate is the additional rate tacked onto the interest payments, so you receive less than the floating or the fixed interest rate that you originally owe, i.e. it is the fee for the swap. And also note that the exchange rate at initiation and at maturity when the notional principles are swapped, they're both set at the beginning of the swap. Imagine that a Canadian firm needs 40 US million dollars. The rate on USD is semi-annual reference rate plus 100 bips. Firm can borrow more cheaply in a local Canadian market, so decides to borrow Canadian 50 million dollars for three years semi-annual payments at the Canadian floating rate uh, plus 65 pips. Then they enter into a Canadian USD cross-currency swap with a New York dealer to exchange Canadian $50 million to US. The three-year swap is quoted at minus 15 bips at a rate of USD to CAD of 0 0.800. And USD is at reference rate in US. At inception, you swap the currency amounts. So the firm pays the swap dealer $50 million in Canadian and the swap dealer gives to the firm $40 million US. The periodic payments will be the firm gives the swap dealer US 40 million times 2.5%, which is the reference rate, times 180 divided by 360 because it's a semi-annual coupon. Then the swap dealer gives the firm Canadian 50 million times the Canadian reference rate plus the basis rate, which is 1.95% reference rate minus 
the 0.15%, which and then times it by 180 divided by 360. And then at the maturity of the swap, the firm pays the swap dealer US $40 million back, and the swap dealer gives the firm the original $50 million Canadian. In this example, the exchange rate is the same at 0.8 at maturity, but if the exchange rate changed, then apply the current exchange rate at the time of maturity. Currency forwards and futures. Currency forwards and futures are used to hedge against undesired exchange rate movements by buying and selling a specified amount of foreign currency at a defined time in the future and at an agreed on price at contract negotiation. Corporations use currency forwards to customize the manage the risk of cash flows in foreign currency and currency futures are standardized. Note that basis risk is equal to zero if the futures price is the same as the spot price. Equity swaps. Equity swaps are when two parties agree to exchange or swap a series of cash flows relating to equity. There can only be one single payment or there can be periodic payments. One option is to receive equity return and pay fixed interest rate. Second is receive equity return and pay floating interest rate. And third is receive equity return and pay another equity return. This can also be in the form of a total return swap where it includes all the dividends paid during the tenor in addition to the equity's price appreciation or depreciation. Equity swaps are OTC derivative instruments, so each counterparty bears credit risk, i.e. it's not standardized, and therefore usually collateralized, but they can be customized. It's a good way to get synthetic exposure to stocks without owning the stocks. Let's imagine an investor holds a $100 million portfolio of US stocks indexed to S&P 500. The investor expects the index to fall in the next six months and wants to reduce the equity exposure by 30%. So the investor enters into an equity swap with a notional principle of $30 million, whereby they agree to pay the return on the index to receive floating rate reference rate minus 25 bips. At settlement, let's say equity rises by 5%, then the investor is going to give the counterparty $30 million times 5% for price appreciation, which is $1.5 million. And the counterparty is going to give the investor $30 million times 2.25% of the reference rate minus 25 bips for the basis times 180 over 360, which is $300,000. And in this case, the investor's net payment to the counterparty at settlement is 1.5 million minus 300,000, which is 1.2 million. Equity futures and forwards. The formula for equity futures uses beta, beta for market sensitivity, and the formula is number of futures contracts equals beta target minus beta of the current portfolio divided by beta of the futures times the market value of the portfolio divided by the value of the futures. Forwards are OTC contracts that are used if they need to customize agreement. And so we will look at equity futures. Equity futures are low cost instruments to implement tactical allocation decisions used to achieve portfolio diversification, get international exposure, there are standardized contracts listed on exchange. If underlying is a stock index, then only cash settlement is available at expiration. If underlying is a single specified stock, then settlement can be in cash or the physical stock. Futures contracts is quoted in price and multiplier. Realistically, the portfolio will have a beta not equal to one, and the investor can change the target beta of the portfolio using futures to add or take off beta. Cash equitization is cash securitization or cash overlay, 
which is when you equitize a cash position to boost returns. It replicates the performance of equity without physically holding the stock or the index. And with the formula, you put zero for the current value of beta so that you can have a beta target divided by beta futures times the value of the portfolio divided by the value of the futures to get the number of futures that you need to buy. Volatility Futures Chicago Board Options Exchange, CBOE Volatility Index, or VIX, aka Fear Index, measures implied volatility in the S&P 500 over the next 30 days. It makes a bet on the size of volatility as opposed to the direction of whether the stock's going to go up or down. Implied volatility bakes in the investor sentiment. So buying or selling the VIX futures is betting that realized volatility or actual volatility is going to be higher or lower than implied volatility. The term structure of a VIX futures graph looks at the VIX futures prices on the y-axis and the expiration of the futures on the x-axis. If the curve is sloping downward, then it's backwardation. And if the curve is sloping upward, then it's contango. The curve is always changing, reflecting the current volatility environment and the investor's expectations on future volatility levels and buying or selling activity in the VIX futures contracts. If the curve is in backwardation, then the market sentiment expects more volatility in the short term. If the curve is sloping upward or is in contango, then the market expects more volatility in the long term. Variance swaps. The buyer of the contract will pay the difference between variance strike and realized variance, annualized, on the underlying over the period specified multiplied by the variance notional. The variance swap is used instead of volatility swap because it can be replicated with a static hedge, so it's easier to hedge. Variance is equal to volatility squared, or standard deviation squared. Basically, swapping future realized variance on an underlying asset in exchange for today's implied volatility, because the investor thinks the volatility will be higher or lower than the implied. For example, suppose an investor believes that the implied volatility is too low, i.e. they think there will be higher volatility and wants to hedge against the possibility of a higher volatility. Let's say today's implied volatility is 16%, therefore variance is 16% squared. The investor enters into a swap with the counterparty to pay the variance of 16 squared fixed, and in exchange receives the realized, the actual variance, at expiration. Let's say 90 days later at expiration, the realized variance is 20% squared. Then the investor pays the counterparty the fixed variance of 16% squared, which was the strike, and receives 20% squared, which is the realized. The net amount for the investor is going to be 20% squared minus 16% squared times the variance notional. That is the settlement amount. An N variance or notional variance is calculated by taking Vega notional divided by two times the strike price. In the middle of the variance swap before settlement, you can mark to market valuation of a variance swap. At any time before expiration, the valuation of a variance swap can be calculated using a timeline and the present value factor. At expiration, we know that the variance swap is equal to n variance times realized volatility squared minus strike volatility squared. But before expiration, the variance swap value will be equal to n variance, the variance notional, times the present value factor, which is 1 divided by 1 plus the rate r reference rate times the number of days it's passed divided by the total number of days until expiration multiplied by and there are three terms in the big bracket which is realized volatility squared 
times the number of days it's already passed divided by the total number of days of the variance swap plus the number of days still left before expiration times implied volatility squared minus the strike price squared. Basically, the realized variance term if from the settlement amount turns into two sets of realized variance up until now and the implied variance for the remaining time until expiration. And the present value factor is applied as well. Some example scenarios of using derivatives. Let's say an investor owns 100,000 shares trading for 14 euros per share. Owned the shares for many years and thus has a low tax basis. Objective is to safeguard the value of the position and not sell the stock in the potential case that the stock price goes up. The strategy would be to use an equity swap to pay the stock's return and receive the floating rate reference interest rate. Another scenario. Let's say the fund manager has invested in the UK stocks that is indexed to the FTSE 100. The fund has 250 million pounds of total assets, including 20 million pounds of cash invested at three months, British pound floating rate of 0.63% annualized. The manager does not have expectation on the direction of the stocks, but is keen to minimize tra tracking error risk. So the objective is to minimize tracking error risk, and therefore the strategy is to do cash equitization to replicate the performance of the index. Next, using derivatives to infer the market expectations. To infer market expectations for market volatility, you can look at VIX futures, i.e. term structure of VIX curve. To infer expectations for inflation rates, you can look at CPI swaps. To infer federal funds rate by the Federal Open Market Committee, which you can use to derive potential Fed interest rates, you can use the Fed Funds Futures Contracts. Fed Funds Futures Contract price is equal to 100 minus the expected Fed Funds interest rate. Then, use this Fed Funds Futures Contract price to determine the probability of a change in the federal funds rate. The probability of a federal funds rate changing is equal to Fed Funds Futures Contract Price Rate, which we just figured out, minus the current federal funds rate, all divided by Fed Funds Rate with Rate Hike minus current federal funds rate. Reading 10, Currency Management. Basic Concepts hierarchy of which currency is quoted as the base currency. Euro, GBP, AUD or NZD, and then USD. So these are ranked in hierarchy of what goes in the base. The base currency is going to be the one unit, and whatever you're buying or selling is going to be the base currency. Usually quoted to four decimal places, the spot exchange rate is usually for settlement on the second business day after the first trade, referred to as T plus 2 settlement. Bid offer is expressed as the price of currency per base currency. So USD slash EUR 1.3648 slash 1.3652 means that the bid is the left number, which is the dealer is will willing to pay USD 1.3648 to buy one euro. And the offer on the right hand side is dealer is willing to sell one euro for USD 1.3652. The difference between the bid ask or bid offer is the spread, aka the dealer's spread or market width. Forwards for currency are agreements to exchange one currency for another on a future date and at an exchange rate agreed on today. Any transaction that occurs with settlement longer than T plus two days, basically. They are quoted in points. For example, one month forward price is minus 5.6 slash minus 5.1, and they are divided by 10,000 and added to the spot exchange rate. Note that the price per 
base currency might be flipped. So make sure you get these flipped correctly and in the right order before you add or subtract. Although there is no cash flow on a forward until settlement date, it is often useful to do a mark-to-market valuation on a forward position before settlement in order to judge the effectiveness of a hedge based on forwards contracts and to measure the profitability of speculative currency positions at points before the contract maturity. To close out a forward position, it must be offset with an equal and opposite forward position using the spot exchange rate and forward points at the time of settlement. Imagine you have a timeline today, three months from now, and six months from now. Today, let's say the investor at initiation bought 10 million pounds for delivery against Australian dollars in six months at a forward rate of 1.6100 AUD to GBP. At three months before expiration, because it was a six month forward, to close out the forward contract, the investor is going to go opposite and sell the 10 million pounds at the three month forward rate, which is the 1.6340 AUD to GDP. Settlement is going to be the two rates spread times the 10 million pounds, basically how much the investor bought it for and sold it for. However, this settlement amount is not going to be settled until six months later. So at the three month mark, however, how much ever is going to be the settled amount that you just calculated is going to be discounted back to the three month using reference rate. FX swaps. Base currency is bought or sold at spot and sold or bought at forward. These two transactions are legs of the swap. The legs can be equal sized, which means they're going to be matched, or different sizes, which means they're going to be mismatched. Different from currency swaps because FX swaps have no interim interest payments unlike currency swaps. And FX swaps are much shorter term than currency swaps. But similar to currency swaps, FX swaps exchange principal amounts in different currencies at swap initiation and then is reversed at swap maturity. Portfolio returns and risk. Domestic currency return on a foreign asset includes both the foreign currency return on that asset and the percentage movements in the spot exchange rate between the home and foreign currencies. For a single asset, the return in domestic currency is equal to 1 plus the foreign currency return times 1 plus the foreign exchange rate difference minus 1. Note that for the RFX rate, you must use the foreign exchange rate as the base unit because that is the amount that you are hedging against or long position in. So you're buying and selling the foreign asset currency. For a portfolio with multiple current foreign assets, you're going to figure out what the RDC is going to be before you minus one, and then multiply all of those by its own weight in the portfolio, and then sum it up, and then finally you minus one. Note that if you're short selling, and if, it's, if that's allowed in the portfolio, then the weighting can be less than zero. Risk volatility for a single asset is going to be equal to standard deviation of RDC squared is equal to standard deviation of RFC squared plus standard deviation of RFX squared plus two times the standard deviation of RFC times the standard deviation of RFX times the correlation of RFX and RFC and square root it to find the expected risk or volatility. Risk is typically measured in standard deviation, so that's why you square root it. And for a portfolio with multiple assets, the RDC portfolio standard deviation squared is equal to weighting of one asset squared times the standard deviation of RDC of that one asset squared, plus you repeat and then plus two times the weighting one, weighting two times 
volatility of RDC times volatility of RDC for the second asset times the correlation of those two assets. How much currency exposure should you have in a portfolio? Currency risk management within the IPS will usually address target proportion of currency exposure to be passively hedged, and the latitude for active currency management around this target is figured out. Frequency of hedge rebalancing, currency hedge performance benchmark to be used, and hedging tools permitted, for example, types of forwards, options, etc. Within these guidelines in the IPS, the first decision is to determine the optimal hedge to existing foreign currency exposures and then how much to relax the full hedged returns, i.e. the decisions to be made in each step are Step 1. Decide optimal amount of foreign currency exposure hedge Forecast expected returns and risk, capital market expectations and calculate the expected efficient frontier for each RFC, RFX, standard deviation of each and the correlation for each asset. Then step two is determine the optimal all allocation to assets to fully hedge the returns of the existing foreign currency exposure. And then step three is to then decide on how much to relax the full currency hedge along the spectrum. Passive hedging, for example, is going to keep the currency exposure equal to the benchmark, minimizes tracking errors and it needs periodic rebalancing. Discretionary hedging. The portfolio manager has some discretion on how much to veer away from the benchmark, but within mandated limit. Stay within mandated limit. For example, hedge ratio between 95% to 105%. Then along the spectrum, active currency management is when the manager has more discretion than discretionary hedging. And it still needs to be within mandated limit, but the goal is to add alpha to the portfolio, so there is a lot more that the manager can do. And then on the very right-hand side is currency overlay, which is when the currency management is outsourced to a firm specializing in currency exchange, currency movements and management, with the goal of seeking alpha at their discretion. This can be overlaid on top of a portfolio that is fully hedged. Things to consider in where on the spectrum to be. Diversification considerations. One belief is that returns of different classes have different correlation patterns with foreign currency returns, which may help diversification. Other beliefs include mean reverting to expected percent change of the foreign exchange equals to zero, due to the purchasing power parity in the long run. Therefore, they believe that foreign currency hedging might be not partaken. This will depend on time horizon in IPS. Cost considerations. Costs need to be considered in whether hedging makes sense. The costs are bid offer spread offered by banks. If options expire out of the money, then the costs are unrecoverable. Rolling forward contracts will require cash outflow sometimes. Opportunity costs include foregoing the rate, currency rate increase. And also there are admin costs for trading, like personnel, tech systems, etc. Generally, currency exposure hedging should be fully hedged, or at least more hedged, with the following. Short-term investment objectives. More risk-averse more immediate the income and or liquidity needs. More fixed income assets are held in a foreign currency portfolio. More cheaply a hedging program can be implemented. More volatile the financial markets are. More skeptical the investor or the committee are of benefits of active currency management. Methods to form directional views about the FX market and strategies to make tactical decisions on active currency management. One, economic fundamentals. Based on the assumption that in the long run, the real exchange rate will converge to its fair value, but in the short and medium term, factors will shape the convergence path to the equilibrium, i.e. real purchasing power between two countries. All else equal, 
the base currency's real exchange rate should appreciate if there is an upward movement in its long-run equilibrium real exchange rate. Interest rates, real or nominal, because it'll attract foreign capital, is high. Expected foreign inflation, which would depreciate the foreign currency and appreciate the base currency. Foreign risk premium, which would make the foreign assets less attractive compared to the base currency's domestic assets, and also if it's currently below its long-term equilibrium value. Secondly, technical analysis can also be used to form directional views. There are three broad themes. One, one, liquid, freely traded historical price data informs future price movement. Two, Historical patterns tend to repeat. And three, determines where price will trade, not should. For example, when technical analysis indicates markets have been overbought or oversold, it means they're vulnerable to a trend reversal or correction. Also tries to identify support levels, bottom, and resistance levels, top, Technical analysis uses visual cues for market patterns as well as quantitative technical indicators. For example, the 200-day moving average. Thirdly, a method to form directional views about the currency market is using a carry trade, which is a trading strategy of borrowing or selling in low-yield currencies and investing or buying in high-yield currencies. It exploits uncovered interest rate parity when it does not hold, i.e. if interest rate parity holds, then the percentage change in the spot exchange rate between the currency of high yield and cur lo currency of low yield is roughly equal to the interest rate differential between high yield and low yield in respective currencies. But in reality, high yield currency appreciates because people flock to the higher interest rate currency. Therefore, the interest rate parity does not hold. And therefore, carry trade invests or buys in high yield currency. Then you can benefit from the higher yield and appreciation of the country or currency. Carry trade is also equivalent to the strategy of forward rate bias. Trading the forward rate bias involves buying currencies selling at a forward discount and selling or borrowing at a forward premium. And guess what? Currency with forward premium has a low yield and forward discount currency has a high yield. So carry trade and trading the forward rate bias are essentially the same, except carry trade uses only the spot exchange rates and trading the forward rate bias uses forward rates. Again, for carry trade, you buy or invest in the high yield currency at the spot exchange rate, and you sell or borrow in the low yield currency spot exchange rate, which exploits the uncovered interest rate parity. And for the uh, trading forward rate bias, it buys or invests the forward discount currency at the forward rate, and sells or borrows the forward premium currency. And that's because for carry trade, when you buy or invest in the high yield currency, high yield currency means the price is going to be lower. And when you sell or borrow the low yield currency, it means low yield currency is going to be more expensive. Higher the yield, decrease in price and vice versa. Volatility trading. You can use volatility trading based on delta and vega to manage currency exposures and bet on the direction or the size of volatility of currency changes. Using delta, delta hedging hedges away the option position's exposure to delta, which is the sensitivity of the option price to changes in the spot exchange rate in this case. Delta hedging is done using a forward contract or a spot transaction. For example, for a long call option on USD to EUR with a nominal value of 1 million euros and a delta of 0.5, the delta hedge would be a short forward in USD per euro of 0 0.5 million euros. Once the delta hedge is set to zero, the trader can use other Greeks to make directional bets. More important is Vega. 
Vega is a volatility trading in which the trader can make bets on the future volatility of exchange rates, not directional views. For example, a straddle is going to be a combination of at the money put and call. A strangle is a similar option structure in which a long position is buying out of the money puts and calls with the same expiration date. The cost of the premiums are cheaper because they're out of the money, but also does not pay off until the spot rate passes the out of money strike levels, so there needs to be high volatility to pay off. There can also be volatility overlay programs for actively traded portfolios like currency overlay, but outsourced experts trade on volatility of currencies. In FX, the convention for delta quoting is 25 dash delta, for example, which is 0.25 delta. So far, we looked at ways traders use to determine if it's worth betting on the direction of a currency and tactically how they can. Let's say the trader has decided to take part in active currency management and have a directional market view. So now we look at trading strategies that hedge 100% of the currency exposure. First, forwards. Forwards and futures are the most basic form of hedging 100% of a single asset currency exposure. Forwards are preferred by institutional investors because they can be customized there is more availability of currency pairs than futures, and forwards doesn't require a front margin like futures do. Remember that point. Forwards for currency management does not require margin deposits like futures. A static hedge is an unchanging hedge which avoids transaction costs, but it tends to accumulate the unwanted currency exposures as the value of the currency changes which is pure currency risk. And in actuality, actual hedge ratio typically drifts away from the desired hedge ratio as market conditions change. So instead, a dynamic hedge is implemented, which rebalances the portfolio periodically by adjusting the size, number of contracts, maturities of the forwards, or a combination of all of them. For example, let's say the investor domiciled in Switzerland has 1 million euros. To hedge the exposure of 1 million euros, the investor sells 1 million euros using one month forward against the CHF. Let's say one month later, the spot exchange rate has gone down to 950,000 euros. At this time, you're going to roll forward the hedge by selling 950,000 euros and settling near the leg of the swap and buying another 1 million euros. This is a mismatch in legs because they are different amounts. Or let's say in another example, the original forward is three months and at time zero, you long a million euros and hedge that long exposure by selling a million euro three months forward. One month later, let's say spot has gone down to 950,000 euros and settlement is not yet because hedge is three months, so there's two months left. To rebalance the hedge, since spot has gone down by 50, you're going to buy another 50,000 of CHF per euro two months forward to make up the lost 50,000 in spot. Rebalancing a dynamic hedge will keep the actual hedge ratio close to the target hedge ratio, but also leads to higher transaction costs. Trader will have to assess the cost-benefit trade-offs, but higher degree of risk aversion makes frequent hedge rebalancing back to the neutral hedge ratio to make sense. But if there is a particular market view or greater tolerance for active trading, then it's more likely that the actual hedge ratio will veer away from the neutral hedge. The more active, the less rebalancing. Now let's look at rolling forward a currency forward to earn a roll yield, aka a roll return. Roll yield returns from forwards being priced higher or lower than spot rate at the time you roll forward a forward contract. On a forward curve, let's say you buy a three month forward. One month later, 
you look at the forward curve at the two month time to settlement because one month has passed. If that new forward price at the two months mark is lower, that means the forward curve is sloping upward. And if it's sloping upward, then it is in contango. At time zero, when you're buying a three month forward, you're effectively buying at a forward premium because since it's upward sloping and you're buying at a later maturity date and it's sloping upward, the price is higher on that curve. So you are rolling down the curve and results in a negative roll yield. On the other hand, if the forward curve is downward sloping and is in backwardation, then you're buying at a forward discount and this results in a positive roll yield because at closer to maturity, you go up to the left of the curve. This is trading the forward rate bias or carry trade. When you buy at a discount and you sell it at a premium, but the negative roll yield is the opposite because you buy at a forward premium. Watch out for if trader is buying or selling the forward in terms of positive or negative roll yield benefits, i.e. for a trader selling the forward, they're selling at forward premium, so that is a negative roll yield, which is good. But for a trader who is buying the forward, if they buy at a forward premium, then that's bad. Also, you need to balance trade-off between rolling forward even with a cost of hedge, i.e. roll yield, versus the view that currency will appreciate or depreciate. Now, currency options. Options are another way to fully hedge currency exposure by 100%, for example, if you buy a protective put. But options have a cost, i.e. premium, and the time value, or theta, dictates that option value decays day by day. Therefore, you must balance the cost benefit of options-based strategies. Now let's look at trading strategies that have less than 100% hedge and that veers away from the neutral hedge, which reduces cost, but also has less downside protection since it's less than 100% hedge and limits the upside potential. One strategy is forwards, what we've been talking about except you're using it just to over or under hedge. For example, if a trader has a view on the market and IPS allows discretion, the trader can under hedge to less than 100% or over hedge to above 100%. This is one way to reduce cost while hedging your currency exposure because profit from being right about the market view will offset as an earning on hedging. Next is OTM options. If you use protective put or other options that are out of the money, for example, 25 or 10 delta options, the smaller the delta, the more out of the money. This limits upside potential though, and has less downside protection, but it reduces cost of hedging because it's cheaper than at the money options. Another option to hedge but reduce cost is risk reversal, i.e opposite of that is caller. If you long a call and short a put, which is long risk reversal, or long a put and short a call, which is a short position and risk reversal, it reduces cost because you can sell an option to earn the premium while offsetting buying an option. Another is put or call spread. You buy an out of the money put and sell another put with deeper out of the money or you buy an out of the money call and sell another call with deeper out of the money. That way, when you sell an option that is deeper out of the money, you earn a premium to offset the cost of buying the option. For this, the structure is not a zero cost because the deeper the OTM put being written, the cheaper it will be, so you won't be making as much premium as the premium you're buying. The approach gets closer to zero cost though if the manager alters the following. Strike prices, i.e. if you move them closer together. Or change the notional amounts, i.e. write larger notional amounts for the deeper out of the money option. Or third is to combine the two. Another option that reduces cost is seagull spread. With an existing protective put, that's long position, which is the core of the hedge, 
you can add short call and short deeper out of the money put, effectively two wings on either side of the seagull. Other ways to hedge currency and reduce cost is exotic options. They are used by more sophisticated players like currency overlay managers, and they're designed to customize risk exposure at lowest possible prices. One exotic option is knock in, knock out, which is a vanilla option that gets triggered when spot exchange rate touches a pre-specified level or ceases to exist or knock out at a barrier level. This is more restrictive than regular vanilla options, hence it's cheaper and therefore you're reducing cost of the hedge. Another exotic option is digital options. These are all or nothing options. They're digital because it's like binary one zero one zero, all or nothing. If the spot rate touches exercise level at any time before expiry, even by one pip, then it pays off the fixed amount. This has extreme payoffs, so that's how you can reduce the cost. Remember a few things when you're doing currency problem sets. As a reminder, you are buying or selling the base quote. So if it is, let's say, USD slash EUR 0 0.8000, then that means one euro is 0 0.8000 USD, and the currency that you're buying or selling is euro, which is the base, and the price unit is the USD. And also remember that if your portfolio already has a long exposure to a certain currency, then you want to hedge it by shorting that, or vice versa. Hedging multiple foreign currencies. When there are multiple foreign currencies, you must now also consider the correlation between the currencies when hedging. For example, let's say a US investor has exposures to both Australian dollars and New Zealand dollars. The two economies are similar, i.e. USD per AUD and USD per NZD will move together. So instead of shorting both as a hedge, you can have net long exposure in AUD and net short position in NZD, which cancel each other out in terms of exposure. The type of hedge involving multiple currencies that you can use are cross hedge or proxy hedge. Cross hedge is an exposure to one currency that changes to exposure to a different currency as a hedge, aka it's a macro hedge because it hedges on entire portfolio as opposed to individual, i.e. hedging with gold. The basis risk for this is the risk of price movement of underlying and cross hedge instruments moving away from each other, i.e. the beta coefficient in the minimum variance hedge. Proxy hedge is exposure to any currencies that are hedged away back to the home currency, for example, to the US currency. Emerging market currency management. The challenges of managing emerging market currencies are higher trading cost, thinly traded, so there's higher bid offer spreads, and the likelihood of extreme market events and severe illiquidity. In some countries with capital controls, you can't use regular forwards, but often it's possible to use non-deliverable forwards, NFTs, not NFT, NFDs, non-deliverable forwards. Now that I'm looking at it, it might be NDFs, I'm not sure. Where only cash settled, and it's usually settled in USD, using the spot rate to convert to USD. Reading 11. Overview of Fixed Income Portfolio Management Everyone's favorite, Fixed Income Roles of Fixed Income Securities 1. Diversification and Risk Reduction because fixed incomes have low correlation to other asset classes such as real estate and commodities. Within the Fixed Income Asset Class, the correlation between Fixed Income Indexes will be driven largely by interest rate, i.e. duration, and by geography. Correlations are not constant over time. For example, during periods of market stress, investors might exhibit flight to quality 
by buying safer assets such as government bonds, which increase their prices, and sell riskier assets such as equities and high yield bonds. So this may decrease correlation between government bonds and equities, and between government bonds and high yield bonds, and increase the correlation between riskier assets like equities and high yield bonds. Volatility of asset class returns may also vary over time. If interest rate volatility increases, bonds with long-term maturities can show higher near-term volatility than usual. The second role of fixed income securities is regular cash flows. This assumes no credit event like the issuer missing a scheduled payment or other market events. And the third role of fixed income securities is inflation hedging. Bonds with floating rate coupons can protect from inflation because the market inflation rate, or MRR, should reflect it, but the principal payment at the end of maturity is not adjusted. Adding inflation index bonds to diversified portfolios result in superior risk-adjusted real portfolio returns. Next, let's look at fixed income mandates in the IPS. One mandate that the managers may have is to follow liability-based mandates. Fixed income investments are made to match expected liability payments. Types of immunization or matching the liabilities in include cash flow matching, duration matching, and contingent immunization. We'll look at each more later. Another fixed income mandate might be total return mandates. It is a managed fixed income to either trade or outperform market-weighted fixed income benchmark. Approaches include pure indexing, where you match the benchmark return and risk as closely as possible. Enhanced indexing, where you seek modest excess return of 20 to 30 bips above the benchmark and keep active risk less than 50 bips and active management, where you seek excess returns of at least 50 bips above the benchmark. Another example fixed income mandate might be ESG considerations. Fixed income portfolio measures. Macaulay duration, or MCDUR, is the weighted average of time to receipt of all of the bond's promised payments, i.e. the maturity. And you can remember it because all the other durations are sensitivity of interest, but Macaulay is time, like how Macaulay Culkin grew up over time. Modified duration is when you take McDur and divide it by one plus the YTM over the period. So it is a sensitivity of how much the bond price changes given a change in yield to maturity. Effective duration is sensitivity of the bond price when there is a parallel shift in the yield curve. And this is a parallel shift, so the formula starts with PV, remember that one, PV minus minus PV plus over 2 times change in the yield times PV0. Average modified duration is the weighted average of modified duration for each bond in the portfolio based on the market value weights of the bond in the portfolio. Key rate duration is the bond's sensitivity to change in the benchmark yield curve at a specific maturity point or segment. And that's calculated as the change in price per the change in the yield at the specific maturity. And you divide it by the price of the bond today and multiply it by negative because as the yield goes up, price goes down, it's an opposite effect. Empirical duration is the bond's interest rate sensitivity calculated from observing actual market data by running a regression of bond price returns on changes in the market interest rate, benchmark interest rate. Money duration is when you take duration and you multiply it by the bond portfolio amount in dollars price value of a basis point, PVBP, the change in bonds price given a one basis point change in the yield to maturity, and it's calibrated to a bond's par value of 100, for example, 8 cents per 100 points. BPV, basis point value, is the money duration or how much the value of the portfolio changes 
for 1% change in the interest. So you take money duration and you multiply it by 0 0.0001. And remember that money duration is just duration times the market value of the portfolio. So basis point value is market value of the portfolio times the duration times 0 0.0001. Convexity is the second order effect that describes the bond's price behavior for large yield movements. Positive convexity tells you that the expected return of a bond will be higher than lower convexity. Average convexity of the portfolio is when you take the market value of each bond, weight that over the market value of the portfolio, and multiply it by each bond's convexity and you sum it. Effective convexity is with the same as the effective duration when you take the P in parallel shift, so PV minus plus PV plus minus 2 times PV0, all divided by change in curve squared times PV0. Spread duration is the portfolio's sensitivity to change in credit spreads, i.e. percent change in the yield spread. Duration times spread is when you take duration and you multiply it by the change in the spread. And portfolio dispersion is variance of the timing of the cash flows. So for example, if you have one bullet payment, then the portfolio dispersion is very low. But if you have a barbell portfolio where you have one in short term maturity and one in long term maturity, then dispersion would be high. Additional considerations for fixed income portfolio measures are portfolio managers can adjust the duration of a bond portfolio if they have certain views about the yield curve shapes changing. For example, if they expect interest rates to rise and yield curve to steepen, they can reduce the longer maturity bonds and thereby reduce the duration, i.e. the sensitivity of the bond portfolio to a change in yield. Portfolio managers use relative value analysis to rank the securities based on valuation, issuer fundamentals, and markets supply and demand. Let's look at bond market liquidity. Fixed income securities vary greatly in their liquidity. Compared with equities, fixed income markets are less liquid. Fixed income markets are OTC dealer market driven, therefore there are search costs to find a willing counterparty. When buying or selling, investor may have to get quotes from various dealers to get the best pricing. Liquidity, search costs, and price transparency are closely related to the type of issuer and its credit quality. Bond liquidity is highest immediately after issuance, i.e. when it's on the run bonds, and they have narrow bid-ask spreads. Investors require higher yields for investing in illiquid securities, i.e. liquidity premium. How much premium depends on issuer, issue size, and time to maturity. Sovereign government bonds are more liquid than corporate bonds due to the larger issuance size, use as benchmark bonds, acceptance as collateral in the repo market, and well-recognized issuers. Side note, repo market is when you borrow money or finance to buy a bond and using the bond as collateral, then pay back at a higher amount X days later. Liquidity concerns influence fixed income portfolio in the following ways. 1. Pricing. Lack of transparency and illiquidity presents challenges for pricing bonds. One solution is to use the matrix pricing method that uses observable liquid benchmark yields of similar maturity and duration, as well as benchmark spreads of bonds with comparable maturity, credit quality, sector or security type to estimate a bond's price or yield. 2. Portfolio Construction Investors with liquidity needs may choose to invest in lower yield, shorter term maturity bonds and avoid small issues and private placements of corporate bonds. Illiquidity increases bid-ask spreads of bonds 
which increases the cost of trading and could deter portfolio managers' willingness to adjust their portfolios because they don't want the high costs. And third, liquidity concern influencing the, force, the fixed income portfolio is invest instead in alternatives to direct investment in bonds. For example, mutual funds. In the case of open-end mutual funds, new shares may be issued or redeemed each trading day, so it's quite liquid. ETFs. There is greater liquidity than mutual funds. Exchange-traded derivatives, like futures and options on futures, provide exposure to underlying bonds instead. And OTC derivatives, which include interest rate swaps and total return swaps, can have bond exposure without actually investing in fixed income if you need high liquidity. And advantages of total return swap is that it has a small initial cash outlay, lower swap bid-ask spread cost, but considerations are that investor doesn't really own asset and costs have increased these days. Next, fixed income returns. When you decompose fixed income returns, you have five different components. Expected return of fixed income is equal to one, coupon income, two, roll down return, which combined together is called rolling yield, three, expected change in price due to investors' view of benchmark yield, four, expected change in price due to investors' view of yield spreads or credit spreads, and five, expected change in price due to investors' view of currency value changes. To calculate coupon income, you can just take the annual coupon payment and divide it by the current bond price. To calculate the roll-down return, you can take the bond price at the end of the time minus bond price at the beginning of time divided by the bond price at the beginning of time. To calculate the third term, which is the expected change in price due to investors' view of yield curve spreads, is minus mod dir times change in yield plus half times convexity times change in yield squared. Expected change in price due to investors' view of credit spreads looks very similar, which is minus mod dir times change in spread plus half times convexity times change in spread squared. And the expected change in price due to investors' view of currency value changes is the RDC equals 1 plus RFC times 1 plus RFX minus 1 for the single asset or portfolio, which is the weighted average of RDCs minus 1. Limitations of using the return decomposition is that it's just an approximation. Only duration and convexity are used to summarize the price yield relationship. It assumes that all cash flows are reinvested at the yield to maturity. It ignores other factors such as local richness and cheapness effects and potential financing advantages, i.e. local richness cheapness effects are deviations of individual maturity segments from the fitted yield curve. Leverage can boost returns if returns are higher than the cost of borrowing. The leveraged portfolio return is equal to return on the invested amount times bracket equity plus borrowed funds close bracket minus borrowed funds times the rate of borrowing all divided by the value of equity. Methods for leveraging fixed income portfolios, i.e. via derivatives and collateralized money markets, include 1. Futures contracts. Futures can be obtained with a margin deposit. Futures leverage is the ratio of the futures exposure in excess of the margin deposit, normalized by the amount of margin required to control the notional amount. So the leverage of futures is equal to notional amount minus margin, all divided by the margin. 
Second method for leveraging fixed income portfolio is using swap agreements. In an interest rate swap, the fixed rate payer is effectively short a fixed rate bond and long a floating rate bond. So a long short bond is like a leveraged exposure to bonds. The only capital required to enter into a swap agreement is the collateral required by the counterparties, which occur through a clearing house. And third way to leverage fixed income portfolio is repurchase agreements or repos. Sell a security and buy it back at a specified amount. Therefore, it is effectively a collateralized loan. The interest rate on the repo agreement, i.e. repo rate, is the difference between the security's selling price and the repurchase price. For example, overnight repo at a repo rate of 5% is day zero from the perspective of the borrower. The borrower gets $15 million in cash by selling their government bond to the lender. And the next day, the lender of the money gives back the government bond, which was the collateral, and the borrower pays back to the lender $15 million and $2,083. The $2,083 is the dollar interest which was the 5% repo rate times one day over 360 days times the loan amount of 15 million. There are two types of motivation for a repo transaction. One can be cash driven transaction. If the party that owns bonds wants to borrow cash, then they can put up the securities commonly accepted by dealers, such as treasury bonds on the repo market or security-driven transaction. If, in this case, the lender of the money typically seeks a particular security, then the motive may be for hedging, arbitrage, or speculation, and they would look for that specific security and lend money for that in exchange. Credit risk is a concern in a repo agreement, but protection against default by the borrower is provided by the underlying collateral bonds. However, there still is credit risk. Fourth way of leveraging a fixed income portfolio is security lending. The security borrower, in this case borrower, borrows the security, not money. Security borrower wants to typically short a stock they don't own. So they borrow the security and pays the lender, usually a long only fund, a fee equal to the percentage of the value of the securities loaned. If that security is readily available, the fee to the lender is small. The lender can earn an additional return by reinvesting the cash collateral, or the security can be lent in exchange for another security as collateral instead of cash, for example bonds. In this case, while the lender has the bond in possession as collateral, the lender earns the coupon income on the bond but the lender usually shares a portion of the interest earned on the bond collateral with the borrower, which is called the rebate rate. Rebate rate is equal to collateral earnings rate, i.e. interest minus the security lending rate. That's different from repo rate. The rebate rate happens because the income earned from the collateral is usually higher than the security lending rate. Unlike repos, security lending transactions are usually open-ended, meaning the security lender can recall the securities back at any time. This may force the borrower to deliver the bonds by buying them back or borrowing from another lender. Risks of leverage. A heavily levered portfolio may incur significant losses even when portfolio assets suffer only moderate valuation declines. Leverage can lead to forced liquidations. If the value of the portfolio decreases, the portfolio's equity relative to borrowing levels is reduced and the leverage increases. Portfolio assets may be sold off in order to pay off borrowing and reduces leverage, hence forcing liquidation. And the forced liquidation could happen even if the market conditions are unfavorable for selling, i.e. a fire sale. Fixed income taxation. For taxable investors, coupon payments, i.e. interest income, are typically taxed at the investor's normal income tax rate, 
whereas capital gains are taxed at lower effective tax rate. In some countries, government bonds may be taxed lower or not even taxed. Two sources of investment income from fixed income for taxes are coupon and capital gains. Capital losses reduce capital gains in the tax year in which they occur. In some countries, short-term capital gains are taxed at a different rate, usually higher, than long-term capital gains. Investment vehicle taxes. In a pooled investment vehicle, aka collective investment scheme, such as a mutual fund, interest income is generally taxed at the final investor level when it occurs, regardless of whether the fund reinvests interest income or pays it out to investors. In other words, for tax purposes, the fund is considered to have distributed interest income even if not actually paid out to investors. Some countries use a pass-through treatment of capital gains in mutual funds, where realized capital gains in the underlying securities are treated as if distributed to investors in the year that they arise, and investors need to report the gains on their tax returns. Use capital losses to offset capital gains, but don't intentionally minimize capital gains or intentionally make capital losses. Reading 12, Liability-Driven and Index-Based Strategies, Still Fixed Income. Liability-Driven Investing versus Asset-Driven Liabilities, ADL. Both are types of ALM, Asset Liability Management. With ADL, Asset-Driven Liabilities, assets are given and liabilities are structured to manage interest rate risk. With LDI, liabilities are given and assets are managed. For example, insurance company buys a liability portfolio. With ADL, the asset side of the balance sheet results from a company's underlying business and the debt manager seeks a liability structure to reduce interest rate risk. For example, a leasing company with short-term contracts that chooses to finance itself with short-term debt to match the maturities of the assets and liabilities. Types of liabilities. LDI strategy starts with analyzing the size and timing of the entity's liabilities. There are four types of liabilities. Liability one, amount is known, timing is known. For example, traditional fixed rate fixed income bond with no embedded options. The best method to measure interest rate sensitivity is to use Macaulay duration, modified duration, money duration, PVBP. Liability type two is known amount, but uncertain timing. For example, callable and potable bonds, term life insurance, demand for demand and time deposits, use effective duration. Liability type three, amount is uncertain, Timing is known. Examples, floating rate note, inflation protected securities, use effective duration. Liability type four, uncertain amount, uncertain timing. For example, property and casualty insurance, residential mortgage loans, contingent convertible bonds, use effective duration. Interest rate immunization for a single liability. Immunization is the process of structuring and managing a fixed income bond portfolio to minimize the variance of returns arising from the volatility of future interest rates. Goal of immunization is to hedge interest rate risk, match Macaulay duration and convexity of the liability to the asset in order to hedge. Any change in yield, i.e. interest rate, will then have an equal opposite effect so there will be no impact to the bond portfolio's price. Most obvious way to immunize interest rate risk of a single liability is to buy a zero coupon bond that matures on the liability's obligation date and the bond's face value to match the liability amount. There would be no cash flow reinvestment risk because no coupon payments for the zero coupon bond are made. And there would be no price risk because zero coupon bond would be held to maturity. And the only problem is that in many financial markets, zero coupon bonds are not available. For a zero coupon bond, because there is no reinvestment risk, the bond's Macaulay duration is equal to the maturity 
So immunizing would be to find a zero coupon bond with the same Macaulay duration as the liability. Again, just remember that when you're immunizing a single liability, use McDur or Macaulay duration to match to the investment horizon of the single liability. When interest rate risk is immunized, it's called zero replication. Portfolio dispersion measures the extent to which the payments are spread out around the duration. Make sure to annualize this statistic. For example, if the period is semi-annual, then divide by period squared, i.e. 2 squared equals 4, divided by 4. Portfolio convexity is calculated as the sum of the times to the receipt of cash flow, multiplied by those times plus 1, multiplied by the shares of market value for each date or weight and all divided by 1 plus the cash flow yield squared. Can be used to improve the estimate for the change in portfolio market value following a change in interest rates than using only duration. Shows the slope of the curve. Immunized portfolio convexity is calculated with the formula McDur squared plus McDur plus dispersion all divided by 1 plus cash flow yield squared. Immunization and rebalancing. Immunizing with a zero coupon bond would solve the problem of matching the liability, but because zero coupons are hypothetical, immunizing with coupon bearing bonds entails continuously matching the portfolio, McDur, with the McDur of the hypothetical zero coupon bond. But at the end of the day, immunization will be achieved if Ensuing changes in the cash flow yield on the bond is equal to the change in the yield to maturity on the zero coupon bond. Interest rate hedging is summarized by taking the asset BPV times change in the asset yield plus hedge BPV times change in the hedge of the yield equals liability BPV times change in liability yield. If the yield curve shifts, Immunization may still work. If the yield curve twists or has a non-parallel shift, this may jeopardize the immunization. And by the way, when the yield curve twists or has a non-parallel shift, it's called structural risk. To minimize structural risk, minimize the dispersion of the bond positions or the cash flows, i.e. go from a barbell to a bullet portfolio because you can then easily match the bond's duration when it's a bullet to the investment horizon. Next is interest rate immunization for multiple liabilities. There are several approaches of which we'll look into in detail. One is cash flow matching, two is laddered portfolio, three is duration matching, four is derivatives overlay, and five is contingent immunization. First, cash flow matching. Build a dedicated portfolio of zero coupon or fixed income bonds to ensure that there are sufficient cash inflows to pay the scheduled cash outflows. You might be wondering, if there's enough cash to build a dedicated portfolio of bonds, why not just buy back all the liabilities? This might be challenging if the bonds are held by buy and hold investors, and because most corporate bonds are illiquid, Buying them back is likely to drive up the price. Accounting defeasance. Accounting defeasance is a way of extinguishing a debt obligation by setting aside high quality securities, such as US Treasury notes, to repay the liabilities. For example, when you have a bunch of debt liabilities with different cash flows in different period, match the cash flows by starting with the last liability in terms of the most furthest out in payment that you have to make and then work backwards to t equals zero to build the dedicated assets the second interest rate immunization approach for multiple liabilities is ladder to portfolio basically spread the bonds maturities and par values more evenly along the yield curve it provides protection from non-parallel shifts and twists in the yield curve Cash flows that you receive are essentially diversified across the time spectrum. Therefore, laddered portfolio has high 
relatively high convexity because the cash flows are spread out or there's high dispersion. There's less reinvestment risk than barbell, and there's always a bond that is close to redemption, so it's good for liquidity to pay back the liabilities. Unlike a laddered portfolio, when you have a bullet or a barbell portfolio, that doesn't protect you against non-parallel shifts and twists. Bullet has the lowest convexity because there's the least amount of dispersion of cash flows, and barbell has the highest convexity because the dispersion is the most extreme between the two payment dates. Laddered portfolios can be built using fixed maturity corporate bond ETFs. Dis advantages are that there are limited corporate bonds from which to build laddered portfolios, and actual bonds have higher costs compared to, say, mutual funds or ETFs. The third approach to immunizing multiple liabilities is duration matching. A portfolio of fixed income bonds is structured and managed so that its duration matches the liabilities, or the hypothetical zero coupon bond that would immunize the liabilities. For a single liability, you just match the MICDUR to the investment horizon. But for multiple liabilities, there's multiple investment horizons for each cash flow, so use money duration or dollar duration to match. Money duration is simply when you take the portfolio's MICDUR divided by 1 plus annualized cash flow yield divided by 2 if it's semi-coupon, and that basically is modified duration times the present value of the debt liabilities. Again, money duration is modified duration times the present value of the debt liabilities. And in order to make the numbers more manageable, you can express that in terms of BPV by multiplying the money duration by 0 0.0001, or aka 1 BIP. In addition to matching the money duration for multiple liabilities, convexity and dispersion of assets need to be greater than the liabilities. By the way, the difference between YTM and cash flow yield is YTM is the yield of total return from all cash flows from the bond's purchase date to expiration, versus the cash flow yield is the annual coupon divided by the current price of the bond. Fourth method to immunize multiple liabilities is derivatives overlay. Derivatives overlay is to use futures contracts on government bonds in the immunization, i.e. interest rate futures contracts. To calculate the number of futures contracts you need, this is the same formula as the interest rate futures back in derivatives. The number of futures contracts you want to buy or sell is BPV target minus BPV of the portfolio divided by BPV of cheapest to deliver and multiplied by the conversion factor for cheapest to deliver. In this case, the target BPV is going to be the liability portfolio BPV. And the liability portfolio BPV can be calculated using the money duration expressed in BPV. And fifth and last approach to immunizing multiple liabilities is contingent immunization. Only use contingent immunization if assets are greater than the liabilities. If market value of assets are much higher than the market value of the liabilities, this hybrid approach of passive-active strategy may be followed where above a threshold, the surplus is actively managed or invested. The following strategies can be used to address the duration gap. 1. Use futures, as we saw already. 2. Use interest rate swaps. And for interest rate swap, asset BPV plus the swap BPV divided by 100 times the notional price is equal to liability BPV. Or thirdly, you can use options to enter into a swap like a swaption, which is an option to enter into a swap at a later time. Or you can use a swaption caller, which is to buy a receiver swaption and write a payer swaption. 
receiver and payer is based on fixed rate. Selecting which hedging strategy to use will depend on a number of factors, including accounting and tax treatment for the derivatives and the stakeholder's sensitivity to losses on the derivatives. Risks with liability-driven investing include model risk, which is making wrong assumption inputs, measurement error for asset PPV, instead of taking weighted average, the better approach is to use cash flow yield to discount the future coupon and principal payments. Or spread risk, which is movements in the corporate and treasury yield spread can pose risks, since treasuries are used to hedge corporate bond liabilities. Or spread risk can also exist with interest rate swap overlays, where interest rate swaps reference the three-month MRR, and there can be a spread between high-quality corporate bond yields and swap rates. Counterparty risk is a concern if the interest rate swap overlays are uncollateralized. And another risk with liability-driven investing is asset liquidity risk. This becomes a problem in contingent immunization because active investing takes on more risk and this could result in losses or distressed securities with illiquidity. Next, index-based investing. Bond market index offers ability to gain broad exposure to the fixed income universe. Deviations of returns on the portfolio from the bond market index are measured in tracking error and this poses tracking risk. The degree to investing via index investing goes from pure indexing to enhanced indexing strategy to active management, where the tracking risk increases from pure indexing to active management. Pure indexing purchases all of the constituent securities in the index to minimize tracking risk, aka this is called full replication approach. It reflects the belief that active management cannot consistently outperform the index on a risk-adjusted basis. Enhanced indexing strategy purchases fewer securities than the full set of index constituents in pure indexing, but just matches the primary risk factors. The goal is to mirror the most important index characteristics, i.e. the primary risk factors, and still closely track the index performance while purchasing fewer securities. This is also called stratified sampling or the cell approach. First, each cell or significant index portfolio characteristic or primary risk factor is identified and mapped to the current index. Second, the fixed income manager identifies a subset of bonds or bond-linked exposures like derivatives with characteristics in each cell. Positions in each cell or stratified sample are adjusted over time given changes to the underlying index. Other in enhanced indexing strategies include lower cost enhancements, which closely track the index while trying to minima minimize cost, issue selection enhancements, which identifies specific bond issues that are undervalued, yield curve enhancement, which overweights bonds with maturities on the yield curve that are undervalued, i.e. short-term, medium-term, long-term, sector quality enhancements, which overweights specific bond and credit sectors across the business cycle to enhance returns, call exposure enhancements, if there is anticipation that large yield changes are coming, then increase exposure to callable fixed income securities. And finally, there is active management, which takes position in primary risk factors that deviate from those of the index in order to generate excess returns. Primary risk factors matched in enhanced indexing strategies, i.e. the cell approach, include portfolio modified adjusted duration, i.e. effective duration. Should also incorporate the second order convexity adjustment to increase accuracy. Key rate duration rate changes in a specific maturity along the yield curve. This measures the index's sensitivity to non-parallel yield curve shifts. Same percentage weights in sector or bond quality can be other primary risk factors. 
matching the duration associated with certain issuer sector and quality, or spread duration, i.e. change in the non-treasury's bought price given a widening or narrowing of the spread compared to the benchmark, or match the duration of concentration of issuer holdings. Goal is to match these primary risk factors to minimize tracking error, i.e. the standard deviation of a portfolio's active return, which is portfolio's return minus the benchmark index return. Alternatives to investing directly in the fixed income securities include total return swap. Benchmark selection to track index investing must factor in broad range of issuers and characteristics available in fixed income markets. Even if the benchmark is stable, fixed income market dynamics can drive deviations from benchmark because duration will drift downward over time. Composition of bonds change in the index over time. Investors may wish to combine several well-defined sub-benchmark categories into an overall benchmark. For example, treasuries, corporate bonds, high-yield bonds, bank loans, developed market, global debt, etc. For fixed income investors seeking to reduce the cost of active management, an alternative investing is smart beta, where simple, transparent, rules-based strategies are used as basis for investment decisions. Challenges in replicating a bond market index include fixed income markets are much larger and broader than equity markets, so it is not feasible or cost-effective to pursue a full replication. There's a wide array of characteristics of bonds, different maturities, ratings, call put features, varying levels of security and subordination in public and private bonds, and unique issuance, i.e. OTC that rely on broker-dealers, and mostly e-liquid, so poses pricing valuation challenges, and often matrix pricing or evaluated pricing is used. Or index compositions change frequently due to new debt issuance and maturity. These are all challenges in replicating a bond market index, which may drive an investor or manager to follow an enhanced index strategy as opposed to full replication or pure indexing. Reading 13, yield curve strategies, still fixed income. Yield curve dynamics. Off the run bonds are typically less liquid than on the run bonds, hence they have lower price, higher YTM. Inclusion of off the run bonds will pull the yield curve higher. Yield curves often do not consist of traded securities and must be derived from available bond YTM using some type of model. A trade-off exists between YTM and liquidity, i.e. while off-the-run bonds may earn a higher return if held to maturity, buying and selling them will likely involve increased trading costs, especially during market crisis. Primary yield curve risk factors are categorized as a parallel shift, which is also called a level in the yield curve, and in this case, use duration. Secondly, slope which could be flattening, steepening, or a twist of the yield curve. Slope is the difference in BIPs between yield to maturity on long versus short term. As the spread goes up, yield curve is said to steepen. Or thirdly, it can change the shape or the curvature, for example, like a butterfly. Curvature is relationship between the YTMs and short end of the curve midpoint, and long end. Common measure of a butterfly spread curvature is equal to minus short-term yield plus two times medium-term yield minus long-term yield. Butterfly spread has larger positive values when yield curve has more curvature. For example, use U.S. Treasury constant maturity using two 10 and 30 years for the short-term, mid-term, and long-term yields. Positive butterfly indicates humped or concave shape, while negative is a saucer or a convex shape. Duration and convexity. Active managers focus on the incremental effect on the summary statistics of duration and convexity for a portfolio or by buying or selling 
fixed income derivatives. All else equal, positive convexity is a valuable feature in bonds. Convexity means that bond price increases by more if interest rate goes down, or price decreases by less if interest rates go up. Therefore, a bond with higher convexity might be expected to have a lower yield to maturity than a similar duration bond with less convexity because it will have higher price since it's more valuable than a bond with the same duration and lower convexity. All else equal, a bond with longer durations do have higher convexity. Convexity is affected by the dispersion of cash flows, i.e. high dispersion leads to high convexity. For example, barbell portfolio will have higher convexity than a bullet portfolio, and barbell's higher convexity results in a larger gain as yields increase and a smaller loss as yields decrease. Convexity is therefore valuable when interest rate volatility is expected to increase. The effect of this is that during high yield volatility times, investors bid up prices on more convex, longer maturity bonds because they're more valuable at this time, and this drives the yield curve to change so that the long end of the yield curve goes down, or even inverts, and increases the curvature. On a graph with yield on the y-axis and price of the bond on the x-axis, convexity is convex, meaning it shapes like a U and out. So if you follow the line and you go up the yield curve, then the convexity line goes up much faster and higher, versus if you go down, then the convexity on the right-hand side goes down at a slower pace. Remember the decomposed fixed income return? The third component, which is the expected change in the bond price due to an investor's view on benchmark yields, is calculated using both duration and convexity. When the yield curve changes, whether it becomes flatter, steeper, or the curvature changes, the investor uses their view on how the yield curve will change using mod dir, the modified duration, since this is how much the bond price changes for a change in the yield, and also convexity, since this measures the sensitivity of how much the bond price changes as the curve of the yield curve changes. So the formula is percent of change in the price of the bond, or expected price due to investors' view on benchmark yields, is equal to minus mod dir times change in yield, plus half times convexity times change in yield squared. When you're dealing with a portfolio of bonds as opposed to one single bond, make sure to use average mod dir and average convexity, which are calculated using each of the bonds mod dir and convexity times the market value of that asset over the market value of the portfolio weighting. Yield curve strategies. Yield curves are usually upward sloping with flatter, longer maturities. There are two types of yield curve strategies. One is a static yield curve strategy, and second is a set of dynamic yield curve strategies. Static yield curve means the manager believes the yield curve is fairly priced and the existing yield curve will remain unchanged over the investment horizon. Dynamic yield curve means the manager believes their forecast of yield curve differs from today's yield curve, so they implement investing strategies to take advantage of how the yield curve will change to what they forecast. And in this case, the yield curve can have a parallel shift, it can have different curvature changes, it can become flatter or steeper, etc. First, let's look at static yield curve strategies. Buy and hold. Buy bonds with duration above the benchmark, and since the yield curve is upward sloping and expected to remain that way under a static yield curve, long-term yield will increase and will earn higher income just by holding it. The main income or return is from coupon, and the objective is to add duration beyond the target. Second, static yield curve strategy is rolling down the yield curve. You don't just buy and hold onto it, but you sell it later when the bond price has gone up since the yield curve is upward sloping. So the shorter term bond you have has a lower YTM at a later time compared to the longer term. Therefore, price is higher. Main income source from that is coupon and the roll down return. So this is rolling yield. 
and objective that's achieved is adding duration and return if the future shorter-term yields are below current yields. Third static yield curve strategy is repo carry trade. This is when you borrow money in repo agreement to buy the bond. The return from the bond's coupon plus roll-down return is used to pay back the financing cost. The income from this is coupon plus or minus the roll-down return minus financing cost. The objective of a repo carry trade is to generate repo carry return if the income from the bond is higher than the cost to finance it. Derivatives-based static yield curve strategies include long futures, where you purchase a futures contract of a future bond delivery, similar to rolling down the yield curve but relies solely on the appreciation, no coupon. Again, the income for this is just the price appreciation, which is basically the change in price divided by the change in the bond yield, minus the margin cost. The objective is to synthetically increase duration. Fifth static yield curve strategy is to receive fixed swap. When you receive fixed swap on an interest rate swap and pay floating MRR or market reference rate, this is swap carry. The income from this is swap rate minus MRR plus the change in the swap mark to market over change in the swap yield. The objective is to synthetically increase portfolio duration. Dynamic yield curve strategies. The fund manager implements strategies based on their forecast that the yield curve will change in the following ways. A parallel shift, either up or down. A slope change, which is when it steepens or flattens. A slope curvature change, like a positive or negative butterfly. Or any volatility changes, i.e. the yield becomes more volatile. Let's look at dynamic yield curve strategies when there is a parallel yield curve shift downward anticipated. The objective of these strategies would be to increase portfolio duration, i.e. have more bond exposure where you're receiving the coupon income or the YTM, because when there is a parallel shift downward, that means YTM is going to go down and the price is going to go up, so you want to hold more bonds. Strategies include just buying a bond, that's a bullet payment. And how you would gain return from this would be to, when you extend duration with longer dated bonds, there would be return from the price appreciation because the yield has gone down or shifted downward. Another strategy when you anticipate that there's going to be a parallel shift of the yield curve downward is a receive fixed swap. This is because when there's a parallel shift downward, then that means the yield to maturity is all going to go down. And so you want to receive a fixed rate that doesn't go down. So the return from the swaps mark to market is going to be higher since the yield is going to go down and there's going to be a price appreciation. Plus there's going to be a carry from fixed minus floating MRR. Another strategy when there's an, a parallel shift downward anticipated is long futures. Because again, this is just having bond exposure. You would have to put down a margin cost for futures, but what you would get is a return from mark to market gain because there's going to be a valuation of the bond that says that the bond price goes up. So the futures that has exposure to the bond will also be mark to market and the price will be higher. If there's a parallel shift upward anticipated, do the opposite of each of the strategies aforementioned in order to reduce the portfolio duration, because if there's a parallel shift of the yield curve upward anticipated, then that means the bond price is expected to go down. So for example, you would want to sell the bond or pay fixed swap or short futures. When there's a yield curve slope change, i.e. the curve becomes flatter or steeper, usually it occurs because of economic stimulation, like cutting benchmark rates or tightening the economy to curb inflation. 
Basically, it combines short and long positions in bonds of short-term and long-term maturities. The following strategies are a type of barbell strategy. Yield curve steepening means a steeper slope, where long maturity bonds have higher yield to maturity and short maturity bonds have lower yields is anticipated. Gain is achieved from combining a long short-term bond with a short long-term bond, because if the long-term bond yield is going to go up, that means price is going to go down, so you want to short it. There are four types of steepener or flattener yield curve changes. If it steepens or flattens is one dimension, and if it's a bear or a bull is another dimension. If it steepens, that means that from today's yield curve, the curve becomes steeper. That can occur in two ways. If the longer term maturity goes up higher than the shorter term maturity goes up, then it's a bear steepener because if the yield goes up, that means the price is going to go down. If the short term maturity goes down more than the longer term maturity goes down, that's a bull steepener. It's a bull because the price goes up when the yield goes down. Or when you have today's yield curve and it becomes flatter, it can happen in two ways. If it goes up, but the short term maturity goes up higher than the longer term maturities, then the slope becomes flatter and it's a bear because it's gone up, which means price is going to go down. And conversely, if it becomes flatter because the yield has gone down, that means price has gone up, so it's a bull. And it's flatter because the longer term maturity has gone down by more than the shorter term maturity. Bear steepener and bear flattener both are net negative, i.e. their net short position in duration of portfolio. And bull steepener and bull flatteners are both net positive, which means you get a net long position in the duration of the portfolio. And duration neutral strategy is when the portfolio weighted duration is zero from long and short positions of a short term and long term bonds respectively for a steepening or shorting a short term and longing a long term bond for flatteners. When there is a slope curvature change expected, factors that drive curvature changes could be because different market participants face either regulatory or economic asset liability management constraints that drive the supply and demand for bonds with different maturities. For example, the central bank can buy specific maturities of treasuries under its quantitative easing. So let's say from today's yield curve, you expect a negative butterfly. That means you expect the medium term to go up in yield and the short term and the long term yields to go down so that there is a bump in the middle. This is a negative butterfly because if you can recall the formula for butterfly spread, it's minus short term plus two times medium term minus long term. So when you have a minus or a negative in the short and the long term, then you get a negative butterfly. If you expect a negative butterfly in the future, then the strategy now is to long a barbell position i.e. long position in the short term and long term bonds and short a bullet for medium term. And this is because you want to have long positions where the bond price is expected to go up, which is where the yield is expected to go down. Opposite of that is positive butterfly, which is going to have a U shaped. The short term and the long term yield is expected to go up but in the medium term, the yield is expected to go down. In this case, the strategy to do now to take opportunity of that is to buy a long bullet in the medium term and short a barbell on either side, short term and long term. When you expect that the yield curve volatility is going to change and i.e. the option value is expected to change, if volatility is higher, that means there is a greater chance of the yield curve changing. So when an investor has a view on whether future realized volatility will be greater or less than the implied volatility, which affects the price of the options, the investor will either be long volatility or short volatility, respectively, 
by buying bonds with options. One strategy is a long bond call option, i.e. the call option to be able to buy a long bond position. The volatility view of that is that you expect there to be higher volatility, i.e. a long volatility position. You have to buy the right to buy the bond. Because you're a long position in a bond, you would increase the portfolio duration and convexity. You can be long bond put option where you're short volatility because you're purchasing the right to sell the bond in the future. This would decrease portfolio duration and convexity because you're effectively shorting the bond position or exposure. Or you can be long payer swaption, which is owning the right to pay fixed at strike rate on an interest rate swap. You would be short volatility and you would be decreasing portfolio duration and convexity. Oppositely, you can be a long receiver swaption, which is to purchase the right to receive fixed at strike rate on an interest rate swap. Because you have the right to receive a fixed at strike rate, you are long volatility. Or you can have a long call option on a bond future, which is owning the right to buy a long fu a bond future at a strike price, which is long volatility. Or you can be a long put option on bond future, which is owning the right to sell a bond future at the strike price in the future. Key rate duration measures the portfolio sensitivity over a set of maturities along the yield curve. Key rate duration formula is change in the bond price for change in the rate at a certain maturity divided by the present value of the bond times negative sign. Key rate durations help identify shaping risk for a bond, i.e. the bond's sensitivity to changes in the shape of the benchmark yield curve. By breaking down a portfolio into its individual duration components by maturity, Active Manager can pinpoint and quantify key exposures along the curve. For example, let's say a manager has the following portfolio and presents the key rate durations compared to its benchmark. Let's say at the tenor of 5, 10, and 30 years, the difference between active and index key rate durations are minus 2.8, minus 0 0.2, and positive 2.9. Based on the table, what is a likely portfolio that the manager holds in synthetic positions? Wherever there is a minus difference between active and index of key rate durations, the manager is short the bond exposure. So he could be a pay fixed swap or he could be short a future. And if he is positive in active key rate duration compared to the index, then he is in a long exposure of the bond, such as receiving a fixed swap. You can also have yield curve strategies across currencies. Covered interest rate parity says that there is no arbitrage opportunity between spot and forward rates, because a forward rate is effectively the spot rate times the interest rate differential of the different currencies. This implies that a higher yielding currency will trade at a forward discount, while a lower yielding currency will trade at a forward premium. Uncovered interest rate parity says that in returns on an unhedged foreign currency exposure will be the same as on a domestic currency investment. Both of the above parities diverge in reality, so investors seek to exploit the persistent divergence by investing in higher yielding currencies and borrowing in the lower yielding currencies, which is a carry trade. And an investor who has exposure to currency risk from receiving a cash flow in a currency that must be converted to their domestic currency can invest in cross-currency strategies. And the following are those cross-currency strategies. They include receive fixed, pay fixed, where you purchase a high yield bond fixed rate in currency A and you sell or borrow a lower yield bond fixed rate in currency B. Or you could be receive fixed pay floating in different currencies or receive floating pay fixed or receive floating and pay floating 
in all of these cases, you're buying or investing at the high yield currency and you're selling, shorting, or borrowing at the lower yield currency. Recall the decomposition of the fixed income return. The yield curve strategies across currencies is basically when you combine the third and the fifth term of the decomposed returns. Basically, the expected change in the price due to an investor's view of the benchmark yield and the expected change in price due to an investor's view of currency value changes. If an investor has borrowed money at the spot rate to purchase bond in a different currency, then the investor will benefit if the bond price they purchased appreciates, and investor will also benefit if the currency of the bond purchased appreciates as well. Reading 14, Fixed Income Active Management Credit Strategies Credit and Spread Concepts Most fixed income instruments trade at a nominal YTM that lies above that of an equivalent government or benchmark bond of similar maturity. This yield spread, reflected as bid-offer cost, is due to compensating for the risk of not receiving interest and principal cash flows as expected, deterioration of the underlying issuer's credit quality, and liquidity risk. Active managers of spread-based fixed income portfolios take positions in credit and other risk factors that generate excess returns versus the passive index replication, which rises from the risk premiums, i.e. they buy securities with higher yield to maturity, i.e. which is lower bond price, than the comparable default risk-free government bond to earn the credit spread. Now we're measuring the fourth decomposed component of the fixed income return, which is the expected change in bond price due to an investor's view of yield spreads. Here are some credit risk considerations. Credit risk for a specific borrower depends on both the likelihood of default and the loss severity in a default scenario. Credit risk for a specific bond issuance depends on the period over which payments are promised, relative seniority of the debt claim, and sources of repayment, such as the value of the underlying collateral, etc. The two key components of credit risk are 1. Default risk, aka probability of default, or POD. 2. Loss severity, aka if there is a default, what would be that loss? Loss given default, aka LGD. For a one-period credit spread estimate, ignoring the time value of money, the spread is equal to the probability of default times the loss given default. And for distressed bonds, the prices reach the recovery rate, which is 1 minus the loss given default, as default becomes likely. Credit loss rate is the realized percentage of par value lost to default, also is equal to the bond's default rate times loss severity. Actual defaults are relatively rare among higher rated bond issuers. Instead, changes in assessment of creditworthiness of higher rated bond issuers occurs more frequently. Credit migration, i.e. the likelihood of a change in a bond's public credit ratings, usually has a negative effect on bond prices. Side note, higher rated bonds, i.e. investment grade, is when it's triple B rating and above. That could be BAA by Moody's or BBB by S&P and Fitch. Credit spread curves concepts. Active managers position spread-based portfolios to capitalize on expected credit spread curve changes, similar to taking positions with a view on yield curve changes. Credit spread curves are usually categorized by the credit rating, issuer type, and or the corporate sector. These curves are derived from the difference between YTM of the bond within each respective category and the government benchmark bond, or swap yield curve with adjustments for specific credit spread measures. Primary credit risk factors for a specific issuer include the level and slope of the issuer's credit spread curve. For example, an upward sloping credit spread curve suggests a relatively low 
near-term default probability, which rises over time as the likelihood of downgrade and or the default increases. Credit spread curve changes are broadly driven by the credit cycle, which is up or down of the credit spread over the business cycle. General credit cycle characteristics during the business cycle are in an early expansion or initial recovery, economic activity is stable and corporate profitability starts to go up and corporate leverage starts to go down because they use less debt. But corporate defaults peak because of the effect from contraction and recession. Credit spread levels become stable and credit spread slope is stable for high grade and inverted for low grade. In the late expansion stage, economic activity is accelerating, corporate profitability is highest as ever, it peaks, corporate leverage is stable at this point, corporate defaults lag, so it has started to go down because of after initial recovery, credit spread levels go down, and credit spread slope is steeper for both higher and lower grade. At peak of the business cycle, economic activity starts to decelerate, corporate profitability is stable, corporate leverage starts to go up, corporate defaults are stable, corporate spread levels go up, and corporate spread slope is steeper for both the higher and lower grade. And then in a contraction or recession, economic activity is obviously declining, corporate profitability is declining, corporate leverage is at an all-time peak, corporate defaults are increasing in high, corporate spread levels are at a peak, and corporate spread slope is flatter for high grade and inverted for low grade because long-term outlook is grim. Lower grade issuers tend to experience greater slope and level changes over the credit cycle given their larger credit losses during economic downturns. A lot of them become inverted curves. Higher grade issuers face smaller credit spread changes and usually have upward sloping credit spread curve. Don't confuse lower grade and lower yield. In fact, they're the opposite because higher yield is lower grade bonds and lower yield means the higher grade bonds. Credit spread measures also refer to the formulas for fixed rate bonds. Yield spread, aka benchmark spread, is the bond's YTM minus the government benchmark, often on the run. G spread, aka government spread, is the bond's YTM minus interpolated government bond yield, i.e. if a bond's tenor is 8 years and the government bond only has 7 or 10 years, you interpolate the yield for 8 year by using linear weighting and use that to calculate the spread. Advantage of using a G spread it's, is that it's transparent, it's maturity matching, and it uses default risk-free bond as benchmark. Disadvantage is that there are not many availability of tenors of bonds, so it depends on demand and interpolation. I spread or interpolated spread is bonds YTM minus interest rate swap rate as the benchmark. Swap rates are derived using short-term lending or market reference rate, rather than the default risk-free rate or government bonds. The market reference rate, MRR, used to be survey-based LIBOR rates, but now is typically overnight funding rates. Advantages of I-spread, which uses the interest rate swap as the benchmark, is that swap rates are quoted across all maturities, so maturity matching is available between the bonds YTM and the MRR. And the carry trade is basically the YTM minus MRR. Disadvantage is that swap rate is a point estimate on the curve rather than a term structure of interest rate, so the use is limited to option-free bonds. Asset swap spread is asset swaps convert a bond's periodic fixed coupon to MRR. When an asset manager has a fixed rate bond that they are getting fixed coupon from, but want to switch it into a floating rate, then they enter into an asset swap with a counterparty 
by paying a fixed swap rate, which is basically higher than a coupon rate, which includes the asset swap fee spread on there, and then gets the MRR in return. So the asset swap spread is calculated as the bond's fixed coupon rate that the manager earns minus the swap's fixed swap rate. The spread is the actual traded spread that converts fixed coupon to MRR, but it is a tradable spread rather than spread measure that corresponds to cash flows. So it is limited to option-free bonds. Z-spread or zero volatility spread is the yield spread over the entire term structure spot curve of a bond. So if a bond's price is calculated as coupon in period one divided by one plus the discount rate plus coupon in period two over one plus the discount rate to the power of period two, etc., you add the Z spread on top of the discount rate for each of those terms that you discount back. The advantage is that it accurately captures the term structure of a government rate or swap rates, but disadvantage is that it's complex in calculation and it's limited to option-free bonds. CDS basis, or credit default swap basis, is the bond's Z spread minus the CDS spread of the same tenor from the same issuer. Recall that a CDS, or credit default swap, is a derivative contract in which the protection buyer pays a series of premium, which is the CDS spread, to the CDS seller to protect from credit loss of a bond. The advantage is that it's interpolated from actual traded rather than a calculation estimate. Disadvantage is that it's a traded spread rather than a measure corresponding to cash flows, and it's limit limited to option-free bonds. And the CDS basis is calculated as the bond's Z spread minus the CDS spread. Option-adjusted spread, OAS, is the bond's Z spread that incorporates the bond option pr pricing based on interest rate volatility. So when you have a yield to term graph, and you have a yield curve, OAS spread is adjusted to that yield curve at every maturity. The advantage is that it's the most widely used to measure credit spread and it allows the use of bonds with options. Disadvantage is that it's complex in calculation based on volatility and prepayment assumptions. Credit spread measures for floating rate bonds. In contrast to fixed rate bonds, floating rate notes or FRNs, periodic interest coupon payments vary based on the market reference rate at the time and a constant spread. There are two credit spreads happening in a floating rate bond calculation. The price of a bond is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the discount rate for every period or every payment. In the numerator, where the coupon payment is, it would usually be the face value times the coupon rate, but with a floating rate bond, it's face value times the market reference rate for that period, so divided by whatever to get just the payment for that period, plus the MRR is added to a quoted margin. Divided by in the discount rate denominator, you would usually go one plus R or whatever the discount rate is, but in this case, you go one plus market reference rate plus the discount margin, which is used as a margin to add to the discount rate divided by whatever that period is. And that happens for every periodic cash flow payment. Because quoted margin is in the numerator and the discount margin is in the denominator, if the quoted margin is higher than the discount margin, then you know that the price or the present value of the bond is going to be higher because the numerator is higher than the denominator. So the FRN is priced at a premium. On the other hand, if the discount margin is higher, then you know that the discount rate or the denominator is higher. So the bond's price or the present value is going to be lower than the face value 
and therefore if the discount margin is higher than the quoted margin, then it's trading at a discount. The floating rate note is trading at a discount. Basically, the quoted margin is the spread over the MRR established upon issuance of the bond to compensate investors for assuming credit risk of the issuer. And discount margin is the yield spread that determines whether the bond is trading at par or is priced at a premium or discount at each reset date, i.e. beginning of every payment period. Now let's add one more variable to the formula. This is similar to a Z spread for a fixed rate bond. <coughs> Zero discount margin, ZDM, incorporates forward MRR, i.e. the respective benchmark spot rate, Z, derived from the swap or government yield curve, i.e. the MRR forward curve. So basically for a floating rate note present value of the bond price, as stated above, you would multiply the face value by the MRR plus quoted margin for that period, divided by 1 plus MRR. In this case, you add the ZDM, the zero discount margin, for that period. Advantages of using a quoted margin is that it uses periodic spread related to floating rate note cash flow, but disadvantage is that it does not capture credit risk over time. Advantage of using the discount margin is that it shows the spread difference between quoted margin and the constant MRR, but the disadvantage is that it assumes a flat MRR zero curve. And the advantage of ZDM is that it uses forward MRR rates, but disadvantage is that a zero discount margin is more complex and the yield spread does not match the floating rate node cash flows. Yield spread impact on returns. The fourth term of the portfolio return decomposition, i.e. the expected change in price due to investors' view of yield spreads, is calculated as, as we know from before, minus mod der times change in the spread plus half times convexity times change in spread squared. In this case, we replace mod der with effective spread duration. So the formula becomes minus effective spread duration times change in spread plus half times effective spread convexity times change in spread squared. And change in spread is usually using change in the ad option adjusted spread, OAS, the effective spread duration is calculated as PV minus minus PV plus divided by two times PV zero times change in spread. And the effective spread convexity is calculated as PV minus plus PV plus minus two times PV zero, all divided by PV zero times change in spread squared. For lower rated bonds, use duration times spread for this term, for the effective spread duration term. And duration times spread is basically effective spread duration times the spread. And the spread changes of a portfolio is calculated as change in spread over the spread. An active manager who invests based on credit spreads consider the incremental excess returns a bond will earn and contribute to the portfolio based on credit spread movements. So the excess spread or the excess return that the asset manager will earn is the initial yield spread minus the effective spread dir minus change in spread. And don't forget to annualize that. If an event of default of bond is likely, then alter that formula to incorporate both the default probability and the loss severity. So excess spread on the bond is equal to the initial yield spread, spread zero, minus effective spread duration times change in spread, minus the POD times LGD. For floating rate notes, the periodic reset of market reference rates in both the numerator and the denominator leads to a rate duration of near zero for floaters trading at par on a reset date. Changes in spread, DM or ZDM, are the key driver 
of price changes. Effective rate duration is basically the same as the effective spread duration, except in ch instead of change in spread, you use change in MRR. So effective rate duration is equal to PV minus minus PV plus divided by two times PV zero times change in MRR. And effective spread duration of a floating rate note is equal to PV minus minus PV plus divided by two times PV zero times change in the discount margin. Credit investing strategies. First credit investing strategies is a bottom up credit strategies. An active fixed income manager who invests in credit spread based bonds considers the following selection process. Step one, define the credit universe of eligible bonds with a mandate. Group the universe into categories that can be compared. Step two, evaluate each issuer's implied credit risk, comparing company-specific financial information to spread-related compensation for assuming default, credit migration, liquidity risks. Also evaluate the issuer's competitive position within the industry, operating history, financial ratios, basically fundamental analysis. Key financial ratios for bottom-up credits analysis includes looking at profitability, for example, EBITDA over total assets. Cat this looks at cash flow as a percentage of assets. It combines operating income with non-cash expense. Disadvantage of using this ratio is that it ignores capex and working capital changes. Another KPI to look at is leverage, like debt to capital. It's a fraction of a company's capital financed with debt. It's a direct measure of relative reliance on debt financing, but it's more relevant for investment grade than high yield issuers. Another KPI to look at in bottom up credit analysis is coverage, debt coverage. The ratio is EBITDA over interest expense. It looks at cash flow available to service debt. It measures the issuer's ability to meet payments. But disadvantage is that it's a volatile measure for firms with high cash flow variability. Two forms of statistical credit analysis models to measure issuer's creditworthiness include reduced form credit model, which solves for default intensity or POD using company specific variables and macroeconomic variables, or a Z-score which is an example that uses factors for each criteria, like liquidity, profitability, asset efficiency, asset turnover, market value of equity over total liabilities. Z-score over three is considered financially sound. Or to do statistical credit analysis, they can use structural credit model, which uses market-based variables to estimate the market value of the issuer's assets and the volatility of the asset value. Likelihood of default is defined as the probability of asset value falling below that of liabilities. Step three in the bottom-up credit strategies is once narrowed down to two issuers within similar credit risk, choose the bond with the higher yield spread, which will provide the greater excess returns. Use the formula excess spread is equal to initial spread minus effective spread duration times spread minus POD times LGD. Make sure to take into account the bond's features like embedded options, liquidity, etc. For issuers with several bond issues outstanding, you can use a spread curve, a credit spread curve to gauge the relative value. So if you have a graph that plots spread on the y-axis and the tenor of the different outstanding bond issues of each issuer on the x-axis, you can see which one has a higher spread. And so the slightly higher spread one, maybe credit risk is higher, in which case go with the other issuer which has less credit risk. Or if they both have similar credit risk, then choose the one with the higher credit spread curve, which will earn the excess spread. Now, once chosen, overweight in the better issuer. 
Another credit strategy is top-down credit strategy. Focuses on a broader set of factors such as macro factors, economic growth, real rates, and inflation, changes in expected market volatility and risk appetite, recent credit spread changes, industry trends, geopolitical risk, and currency movements. Public ratings like S&Ps and Moody's can be used to categorize and rank bonds based on credit quality. Macro variables are assessed to determine which sectors to overweight or underweight in. Sector allocations can also be determined using regression analysis of average spread of bonds within an industry. Another credit strategy is factor-based credit strategy. Key factors affecting the fixed income credit spreads are carry, or if it's defensive, momentum, or value. For example, if you use carry factor, the rationale is that expected return measure if probability of default or aggregate risk premium is unchanged. The measure to use that is option adjusted spread. Or a defensive factor, empirical research suggests safer, low risk assets that are defensive deliver higher risk adjusted returns. Measures to use are market-based leverage, gross profitability, and low duration. Or momentum factor, bonds with higher recent returns outperform those with lower recent returns. Measures used are trailing six-month excess bond and equity returns. And value factor, low market value versus fundamental value indicates greater than expected returns. Measures used are bond spread less default probability measure, which includes rating, duration, and excess return volatility. ESG factors are also incorporated into the portfolio strategies by screening to exclude less favorable ESG measures or ESG companies, use of ESG ratings to target issuers within a sector, targeting fixed income investments that directly fund ESG specific initiatives. Liquidity risk. Illiquidity affects trading cost of bonds. As we saw earlier, one of the measures of trading cost includes the bid-ask spread. For a buy order, the trading cost is trading price that you bought it for minus the bid-ask spread, bid plus ask divided by two, times the trade size. For a sell order, it's the reverse, bid plus ask divided by two, minus the trade price times trade size. Managers manage liquidity risk of bond portfolios by favoring on-the-run government bonds or more recently issued corporate or other bonds for short-term tactical allocations. Or they use liquid alternatives to bonds to close portfolio gaps, for example, credit default swaps and bond ETFs instead of actual bonds. Or they use hedging strategies for longer periods, like asset swaps. Tail risk. Tail risk is the act of stress testing to assess extreme adverse outcomes. Tail risk measures include 1. Value at risk, or VAR, which is the minimum portfolio loss expected to occur over a given time period at a specific confidence level. For example, 5% daily VAR of $8.7 million means the manager sh should expect a daily portfolio loss of at least $8.7 million on 5% of all trading days. This is an example of a parametric method using parameters. Disadvantages of VAR includes that it tends to underestimate the frequency and severity of extreme adverse events and it fails to capture the downside correlation and liquidity risks associated with market stress scenarios. 2. Conditional VAR Conditional VAR, or CVAR, measures the expected average loss over a specific time period, conditional on that loss exceeding the VAR threshold. It's computed using historical simulation or Monte Carlo. 3. Incremental value at risk, or partial VAR. This measures the impact of adding or removing a position in the portfolio. And four, 
relative VAR, which measures the expected tracking error versus a benchmark portfolio by calculating VAR or CVAR for a portfolio's active position minus benchmark holdings under a market stress scenario. Methods to assess portfolio tail risk includes parametric method, historical simulation, and Monte Carlo. These are all hypothetical scenario analyses that use all three of these methods. Fixed income managers can reduce tail risk by establishing position limits, using techniques to reduce portfolio concentration or risk exposure, or using derivatives like credit default swaps. Now let's look at credit default swaps, or CDS. CDS is a way to manage credit risk separately from interest rate risk. At contract initiation, the protection buyer would pay an upfront fee to the protection seller, or the protection seller might pay an upfront fee to the protection buyer based on how the spread is trading compared to fixed coupon. For example, if the CDS spread is equal to the fixed coupon, and that is 1% for investment grade or 5% for high yield, then there's no upfront payment. But if the CDS spread is less than fixed coupon or less than 1% for investment grade and less than 5% for high yield, then the buyer receives the premium. Or if the CDS spread is higher, then the buyer pays the premium because CDS spread is basically the price to get the CDS. So if it's higher than the fixed coupon, then the buyer pays the premium. CDS price change for a given CDS spread change can be calculated as minus change in CDS spread times the effective spread duration and the upfront fee, aka the premium, aka the CDS price is calculated as bracket fixed coupon minus CDS spread close bracket times effective spread duration times the CDS notional amount. And that was just at contract initiation. On an ongoing basis after the CDS is initiated, the buyer pays the seller the fixed coupon of the bond, and the seller has a contingent payment to the buyer, which is if the issuer referred in the CDS contract defaults, then the seller pays buyer the settlement amount which is the notional amount times the loss given default, which is one minus the recovery rate. Types of CDS derivatives alternatives to corporate bonds include a single name CDS, index-based CDS, payer option on CDS index, which is an option buyer paying premium for the right to buy protection on the CDS index, or receiver option on CDS index, which is the option the buyer pays premium for the right to sell protection on CDS. Credit spread curve strategies. Long short strategy can be applied if the manager has a view on expected change to the credit spread curve in order to generate excess returns. For example, active manager expects a weaker economy and therefore a widening of high yield versus investment grade credit spread levels. In these circumstances, the manager can buy a five-year protection on a high yield CDS index and sell protection on an investment grade CDS index for the same tenor, because the manager knows that the investment grade bond is not going to have much effect in market stress events, whereas a high yield bond is going to have a big negative impact in market stress events. During initial recovery and early expansion, the investment grade is upward sloping and the high yield curve is inverted. And of course, high yield is always going to be at a higher spread than investment grade. So it's going to be plotted on the upper side of investment grade spread versus tenor curve. In late expansion, the investment grade is still upward sloping 
and the high yield is now upward sloping. At peak economic cycle, the investment grade has two legs. The first leg is it's upward sloping but quite flat for investment grade, but then it slopes much higher from mid to long term. And high yield looks the same, but at a higher spread. And during contract or recession, it kind of looks like initial recovery, where the investment grade is upward sloping, but a little flatter in the longer term maturity, and high yield is inverted. Static credit spread curve strategies are strategies that managers employ in environments where they believe that the credit curve is credit spread curve is not going to change, it's going to stay static. In this case, the static credit spread curve strategy to employ is buy and hold. Buy and hold risky bonds with durations above the benchmark and earn from rolling down the credit curve, which generates incremental coupon due to wider spreads, but also adds return from the investor's ability to sell the shorter term maturity position in the future at a lower credit spread at the end of the investment horizon, since it will have higher price due to a lower spread. Dynamic credit curve strategy, where they believe that the active manager has anticipated views on credit spread curve changes in the future, they can use a combination of long and short bonds of different grade or yields at different tenors as well as synthetic credit strategies like CDS. Global credit strategies. Emerging or frontier fixed income markets are often dominated by sovereign issuers, state-owned or controlled enterprises. They face concentrated risk to a particular industry or commodity. Many emerging market debt offers little to no diversification. Due to more volatile economic growth than developed markets, Sovereign credit risk is a starting point in considering fixed income investments in emerging markets. Further, institutional considerations include political stability, institutional transparency, adherence to property rights and contract law, geopolitical risk such as trade relations, credit quality, risk of government taking away the issuer's control or ownership, liquidity conditions, and currency volatility for international credit investors. The Bloomberg Sovereign Risk Model combines quantitative and qualitative factors such as external debt to GDP, currency reserves, GDP growth, political risk, etc. to estimate a sovereign issuer's one-year probability of default. In the case of developed markets, sector composition differences exist among countries, For example, U.S. fixed income market has a much higher percentage of mortgage-backed and other asset-backed instruments, whereas developed European and Asian markets seeking real estate exposure tend to consider covered bonds or indirect exposure via bank loans. International accounting standards difference, U.S. GAAP versus IFRS, require adjustment for financial ratio comparisons. Interest rate differentials, exchange rates, and credit spreads reflect differences in the timing and magnitude of market changes and credit cycles in the respective country. Structured credit. Active credit managers can invest in alternative structured financial instruments instead of bonds. For example, collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs, collateralized loan obligations, CLOs, mortgage-backed securities, MBS, asset-backed securities, ABS, and covered bonds. Let's look at each. Collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs, are fixed income securities backed by a diversified pool of debt obligations. It gives the investor exposure to redistribute the portfolio debt cash flows across the ratings spectrum. To apply it into the portfolio, create tailored portfolio-based debt exposure categories not available in the cash bond market. CLOs, or collateralized loan obligations, are fixed income securities backed by diversified pool of floating rate leveraged loans. The exposure that you get is same as CDOs, which is redistributing portfolio loan cash flows across rating spectrum. To apply it into the portfolio, 
get tailored loans and interest rate exposure unavailable in the cash bond market. Mortgage-backed securities are fixed income securities backed by a pool of commercial or residential mortgage loans. They provide portfolio-based exposure to real estate cash flows and exposure to real estate and the volatility such as prepayment and extension risk. Asset-backed securities or ABS are fixed income securities backed by a pool of credit card, auto, and other loans. It gives you exposure to consumer loan cash flows and the volatility of consumer loans. Covered bonds are senior debt obligations backed by a pool of commercial and residential loan mortgages or public sector assets. It gives you exposure to real estate cash flows with recourse to the issuer. Structured financial instruments can offer active credit managers the ability to access and get exposure to different types of cash flow and add debt exposure created by the redistribution of default risk into different tranches across the credit spectrum. For example, asset-backed securities can be turned into structured credit via an SPV or special purpose vehicle and then divided into different tranches like AAA, AA, A, etc. and investors can buy the different tranches of the structured credit. Fixed income analytics. This is a quantitative model that inputs position data, market data, credit ratings, ESG data, fixed income indexes, etc. and parameters such as term structure model, time horizon, VAR methods, historical scenarios, user-defined sensitivities, portfolio constraints, and gives you the outputs of portfolio summary, portfolio construction, scenario analysis, trading, cash position management, etc. Reading 15, Overview of Equity Portfolio Management. Roles of equities in a portfolio. One, capital appreciation. Two, dividend income. Three, diversification with other asset classes, with those whose returns are not correlated, as it reduces the standard deviation of the portfolio. But during periods of market crisis, Correlations across asset classes and among equities often increase and reduce diversification benefits. 4. Hedge against inflation. Some companies can pass through cost of inflation by charging more for their product, so if they are publicly traded equities, inflation is indirectly hedged. 5. Because the client wants it to meet goals or needs. Consider the following first. The client's risk objectives, return objectives, liquidity requirements, time horizon, tax concerns, legal and regulatory constraints, unique considerations, and ESG considerations to advise the client if the equity works for them. Equity investment universe. Since there is an extensive number of companies, equity portfolio managers will have to segment the companies by target characteristics. The companies in the universe can be segmented by 1 size and style. For example, think of a 3x3 three three matrix that has size, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and investment style like value, core, and growth. And any combination of those can be a size and style distinction for equity investment managers. Several advantages of segmentation by size and style include you can construct a portfolio with risk, return, income characteristics desired. It's simple and straightforward. Results in diversification given broad range of companies within each segment. Can construct benchmarks that match the size and style. Allows portfolio to reflect a company's maturity and potentially change growth value orientation. Disadvantage are that categories may change over time and the size and style of the companies can be characterized differently by investors. Or you can segment the public equities by geography. Categories include developed emerging frontier markets. It's useful to equity investors who have considerable exposure to their domestic market and want to diversify. Disadvantage include the fact that segmenting by geography may have lower than expected exposure to that market because many large companies domiciled in the US have global exposure already, 
so their returns are correlated to other geographical markets already. Also, there may be potential currency risk. Third, segmentation of equities can be economic activity. Common categories include whether a company is production-oriented, for example, producing or manufacturing similar products, or market-oriented, based on markets they serve, for example, travel and leisure or retail. Four main global classification systems include global industry classification standards, industrial classification benchmark, Thomson Reuters business classification, Russell global sectors classification. And fourth segmentation method of equities is equity indexes and benchmarks. Indexes use the above approaches to segment. Income from equity portfolio. One, dividend income. Beyond regular dividends, there may also be special dividends. For example, when companies distribute excess cash but is not sustainable or maintained. Or there can be optional stock dividends where shareholders can elect to receive either cash or new shares. Two, securities lending income. Certain equities are lent to borrowers who may want to short the stock they don't own. In developed markets, you can receive a fee from stock borrowers of typically 0.2 to 0.5% on an annualized basis. In emerging markets, these fees typically tend to be 1% to 2% for large cap, and special stocks that are in high demand and can command 5 to 15% annualized fees or in extreme demand can command 25 to 100% annually. In addition to fees, lenders can reinvest the cash collateral, but there are administrative costs to factor in. 3. Ancillary investment strategies. For example, dividend capture, where you purchase stocks just before X dividend dates hold stocks to earn the right to receive dividends and then subsequently sell the stock. Or selling and writing options, for example, covered call or cash covered put. Costs of owning an equity portfolio. 1. Management fees, which are also known as ad valorem fees. This is the percent of funds under management at regular intervals. Includes direct costs of research for analysts, portfolio managers and tools lower for passively managed funds, two, performance fees, which are also incentive fees, generally associated with hedge funds and long short equity portfolios. For example, 10 to 20% of any capital appreciation that exceeds a threshold of 8%. High watermark is the highest value net of fees that the fund has reached. It protects clients from paying twice for the same performance if they go down and go back up but don't reach the high watermark yet. 3. Administration fees. For example, processing of corporate actions such as rights issues, measurement of portfolio risk, voting at company meetings. Some administrative functions are outsourced such as custody fees, which are fees for safekeeping of assets, often a subsidiary of a large bank. Depository fees which are compliance of investment limits, leverage requirements, limits on cash holdings, and registration fees, which are registration of ownership of units in a mutual fund. Four, marketing and distribution costs, which include staff, advertising, sponsorship costs like conferences, communications platforms fees when an intermediary offers a fund service on their platform, sales commissions such as financial planners. Five, trading costs, Explicit trading costs are brokerage commission costs, taxes, stamp duties, stock exchange fees, regulatory fees. Implicit trading costs are bid offer spread, market impact, aka price impact, which is the effect of price increase due to purchasing a large quantity, or delay costs, aka slippage, which is the inability to complete desired trades immediately because of order size or lack of market liquidity. Passive funds have lower costs than actively managed funds, but index funds do have a hidden cost from predatory trading. For example, predatory traders may purchase or sell short shares prior to their effective inclusion or deletion from an index, resulting in price movement and potential profit. 
Shareholder engagement. Investors actively interact with companies, for example, through voting at general meetings, earnings calls, etc. Some topics discussed are companies' strategic goals and development, allocation of capital, for example, policies on dividends, financial leverage, equity raising, capex, corporate governance and regulatory and political risk, such as internal controls, committees on the board, remuneration for senior management and directors, composition of board of directors, etc. Benefits of shareholder engagement include investors can get more information, companies can develop a more effective corporate governance culture, and disadvantage include time-consuming pressure on company management, it can result in selective disclosure of important information to only some shareholders, and conflicts of interest. For example, if portfolio manager is also a shareholder and is biased. The role of an equity manager in shareholder engagement include regular meetings with company management or investor relations team, or activist investing, where they specialize in owning shares of a company and then creating change to generate a gain on the investment, through meetings with management and shareholders, letters to management, presentations to other investors and media campaigns, or through voting, like proxy voting on behalf of shareholders at general meetings. Investing across the passive active spectrum. The decision to invest passively or actively for the portfolio manager is not either or, but falls on a spectrum. The following are considerations and rationale for where to invest on the spectrum. One, active manager must have confidence to outperform the benchmark. Two, client preference and if the active manager can attract sufficient funds from clients. Three, choice of benchmark that the active manager believes they can outperform. Four, client specific investment mandates, including ESG considerations. Five, costs, since active management costs more than to implement than passive, and risks like reputation risk and key person risk. Six, taxes. Passive strategies have less turnover and therefore less taxes on gains. Reading 16, passive equity investing. Choosing a benchmark. Indexing is an investing strategy to replicate the performance of a benchmark index like the S&P 500. Indexing is the purest form of passive investing. It's a rules-based, transparent, investable strategy that does not seek alpha, but seeks market return, i.e. beta exposure. For an index to be a passive investment strategy, it must have three things. It must be rules-based, i.e. rules include criteria for including a constituent stock and the frequency with which weights are rebalanced, it must be transparent. Benchmark providers disclose the rules used and the constituents in their indexes. And it must be investable, which means that the index's performance can be replicated. So rules-based, transparent, and investable. Investability could be affected if there is stock migration problems, i.e. a stock doesn't fit a criteria anymore. For example, if a stock's market cap increases over time, it might move from small cap to mid cap to large cap. Some index providers have policies intended to limit stock migration problems. One way is by buffering. They are ranges that define whether a stock belongs in one index or another. While a stock is in the buffer zone, it remains in the current index. Or packeting. If a stock breaches its breaking point between its current index and another where it fits better in, then a portion of the holdings will be transferred to the other index. For example, a stock's position is split into multiple parts, some in the current and some in the new one. Considerations when choosing a benchmark index to replicate. One, what is the desired market exposure? Market segment, broad versus sectors, domestic versus international, equity capitalization size, small, mid, large cap, style, value, growth, or blend, or other risk factor exposures like momentum, quality, volatility, etc. Two, do you want to replicate an index that includes every stock in the defined universe or only selective stocks? 
i.e. indexes have different stock inclusion methodologies. For example, it could be exhaustive, including every constituent of a universe, or it could be selective, only target stocks with certain characteristics, which we learned earlier is called stratified sampling or cell approach. Or three, what kind of weighting scheme do you want the index you replicate to follow? One index weighting scheme is the market cap weighted. This market cap weighting is considered mean variance efficient. It's the most commonly used using free float weighting and can be thought of as liquidity weighted because large cap stocks tend to have the highest liquidity. Price weighted is another index weighting scheme where you take the price of each stock and divide it by the sum of all of the stock's prices in the index to determine the weighting. It is not commonly used, and a stock split complicates the calculation. Another is equally weighted. This produces the least concentrated portfolios. Each constitu constituent weight is 1 over n. It has a small cap bias, so it exhibits higher volatility, and also small cap stocks are more illiquid, so it's hard to replicate this kind of index, and it requires regular rebalancing. Another question of which index benchmark to use is, how concentrated of an index do you want? An index with high degree of stock concentration, i.e. low effective number of stocks, may be relatively undiversified. Herfindahl Hirschman Index, HHI, can be used to measure whether an index is highly concentrated or not. HHI is equal to the sum of each stock's weighting squared. If HHI is closer to 1 over n, then there is no concentration. If HHI is closer to 1, then there is concentration. You can also flip the HHI to 1 over HHI to find the effective number of stocks. For example, let's say HHI of NASDAQ 100 is 0 0.0404. So the effective number of stocks is the inverse of that, which is about 25. So the index has a concentration in about 25 stocks out of 100. Another question of which index benchmark to use is, how often is the index rebalanced and reconstituted? Rebalancing can be periodically scheduled to make sure the weighting of the constituents follows the weighting scheme. Reconstitution is the addition del deletion of stocks in the index. When reconstitution happens, Index tracking portfolios, for example, mutual funds, ETFs, also follow suit, which can drive the stock price to increase or decrease due to demand or sale. The most common indexes follow market cap weighted. Factor-based index has constituents based on overweighting or underweighting of stocks that have certain desired risk factors, such as growth, value, size, yield, i.e. dividend yield, momentum, quality, and volatility. Portfolio manager pursuing factor-based strategies often use multiple benchmark indexes, including a factor-based index and broad market cap weighted index. Factor-based strategies include risk-oriented, volatility weighting, risk weighting, diversification-oriented strategies. Factor-based strategies can have higher management fees and commission than broad market index. Ing. Approaches to passive equity investing. 1. Pooled investments. Traditional mutual fund shares can be purchased directly through advisors who manage the fund, through a marketplace, or through a financial advisor. Advantages of investing via mutual funds passively is low costs and the convenience of the mutual fund manager handling all the rebalancing, reconstitution, and other changes required. ETFs are registered funds that can be bought or sold throughout the trading day like stocks. Unlike mutual funds, ETFs can be bought using margin borrowing. Advantages of ETFs include ease of trading, low management fees, and tax efficiency. ETFs can be shorted. An authorized participant acts as the market maker of an ETF and the intermediary between investors and the ETF fund manager when shares are created or redeemed. 
To create shares of an ETF, the authorized participant delivers a basket of the underlying stocks to the fund manager and in exchange receives share of the ETF that can be sold to the public. When the shares are redeemed, authorized participants deliver shares of the ETF in exchange for a basket of the underlying stocks that can be sold in the market. Taxable investors in an ETF have a smaller taxable event than in a mutual fund. That's because when mutual fund shares are redeemed, mutual fund managers must sell their portfolio holdings, thereby creating a taxable event where gains and losses are realized. On the other hand, ETF can be redeemed for in-kind delivery of stock, and in this case, capital gains are not recorded. Disadvantages of ETFs are the need to buy and sell at offer bid prices, and there are commission costs. Risk of an illiquid market when buying or selling the ETFs. Factor-based ETFs have become a large segment of the market. They can provide exposure to single factors like size, value, momentum, quality, volatility, yield, etc. And some ETFs track multiple factors. Another approach to passive equity investing is derivatives. Advantages are that they can be low cost, easy to implement, and provide leverage. Disadvantages are, are that they introduce a new set of risks, such as counterparty default risk, if not cleared through a clearinghouse or traded on an exchange. And they can be difficult to access for individual investors. Options and futures are traded on exchanges and therefore are okay. Overlays. Derivative positions that are used in short term to adjust a portfolio to close gaps. Completion overlay is an overlay on indexed portfolio that has diverged from its proper exposure with the use of derivatives. Rebalancing overlay addresses the needs to buy or sell constituents. Currency overlay hedges currency exposure with derivatives. Equity index derivatives Advantages of equity index derivatives over cash-based adjustments are that you can increase or decrease exposure to an entire index with just a single transaction, and many derivative contracts are highly liquid. Equity index futures gives the buyer the right to buy the underlying index on an expiration date of the contract at the future price set at initiation. Disadvantage is that a basis risk can arise when futures prices don't move together with spot prices. Equity index swaps are negotiated arrangements in which two counterparties agree to exchange cash flows in the future. For example, one from index price appreciation or depreciation versus another from LIBOR floating rate. Disadvantage of swaps include counterparty risk, liquidity risk, interest rate risk, and tax policy risk, and is not a highly liquid market. Relatively frequent settlement decreases counterparty risk. Advantages are that you can gain synthetic exposure to index returns as long as there is a willing counterparty. A swap can be initiated on any index at any tender, and you don't have to pay costs to buy the index constituents. Third approach to passive investing is using a separately managed equity index based portfolios, i.e. direct investing in stocks that replicate an index. In a separately managed portfolio, it's basically building your own index based portfolios requiring several capabilities and tools, including subscribing to data on the index and its constituents, robust trading and accounting system to manage the portfolio, broker relationships to trade efficiently and cheaply, compliance systems to meet regulations. To buy all the securities in the portfolio, the manager creates a trading file and sends it to an executing broker. The broker then uses a program trading platform like Charles River, an order management system, to buy the thousands of positions simultaneously. Since index-based strategies seek to replicate an index, executions take place at the close of the business day. Dividends paid over time can accumulate 
and must be reinvested into the securities in the index. Portfolio construction approaches include full replication, holding all the securities in the index and weightings that closely match the indexes, trying to achieve the goal of matching index performance, and it's easy to comprehend, but it requires that the asset size of the mandate is sufficient and that the index constituents are available for trading, and price impact of purchasing the securities can depress performance. Another portfolio construction approach is stratified sampling. Group the index constituent securities into subgroups, and only some constituents are bought, not all, based on characteristic subgroups. Weighting of the subgroups follows the weighting of the subgroups in the index. Another approach to portfolio construction is optimization. Optimization of an indexed portfolio can be to minimize index tracking error while meeting constraints like the number of securities held or mimicking certain style or limiting to stocks whose market cap doesn't go above a specified level, etc. Can use stratified sampling to achieve optimization. Advantages are that it has lower tracking error than stratified sampling and it accounts explicitly for covariances of constituents. Keep in mind that correlations and other market data change over time, so optimization needs to be run frequently, and adjustments made to the portfolio accordingly, which can be very costly. And another portfolio construction approach is the blended approach, which blends the above approaches. For example, for the largest cap constituents, use full replication, and for small cap constituents, use stratified sampling or optimization. Managing tracking error. Tracking error is equal to the square root of the variance of the portfolio return minus benchmark return. And the goal is to minimize tracking error. Excess return is just portfolio return minus the benchmark return. Potential causes of tracking error and excess return are fees and commissions, the number of securities held in the portfolio versus the index constituents, intraday trading of the constituent stocks because index returns are reported using close of the day, close of the trading day price, or cash holding. Indexes do not have a cash allocation. So if a portfolio has cash from dividends, sale proceeds, investor contributions, and other sources, then this causes tracking error, aka cash drag. One way to equitize cash is to buy futures contracts. Controlling tracking error involves the trade-off between matching as close to an index as possible versus the costs. Portfolio managers aim to maintain a beta of 1 relative to the benchmark index. Sources of return and risk in passive equity portfolios. Sources of return can be figured out by using attribution analysis more to come in the later in a later reading. Other sources of return include securities lending and investor activism by passive managers. Reading 17 Active Equity Investing Strategies. Fundamental versus quantitative approaches. Investing style. Fundamental is subjective while quantitative is objective. Decision making process. Fundamental is discretionary versus quantitative is systematic. Primary resources. Fundamental uses human skill, experience, and judgment versus quantitative uses expertise in statistical modeling. Information used for fundamental is research of company, industry, macro variables, etc. Quantitative uses data and statistics. Focus of analysis for fundamental is conviction in a company's value, and quantitative is a selection of variables and automatically selects, i.e. the focus is at the portfolio level. Past or future fundamental looks at the forecast, so future of companies' financials and performance, versus quantitative draws conclusions from historical data. Portfolio construction for fundamentals is using judgment with parameters, and quantitative uses optimizers. 
Methodology for fundamentals include bottom-up, top-down, value versus growth, income versus deep value, intrinsic value or relative value based, whereas for quantitative, methodology is to choose a model, for example, time series macro factors or cross-sectional sector level factors, and algorithms, etc. Valuation process for fundamental approach is one, pre-screen potential investment candidates based on criteria, two, perform in-depth analysis of companies to derive intrinsic value, and three, buy or sell those trading at a discount premium to their intrinsic value. Quantitative valuation process is one, determine which factor exposures to invest in, two, forecast information coefficient and its volatility for each factor using regression analysis or fundamental research, and three, combine the factor exposures to estimate expected returns in the model. Portfolio construction and rebalancing for fundamentals. One, allocate assets by exposures desired, for example, by industry or country or region, etc. Two, determine buy or sell list. Three, set limits on exposure desired and individual stock position. And four, monitor holdings continuously. For quantitative, one, determine which factors to overweight or underweight. Two, use risk model to measure active risk. Three, run portfolio optimizers. And four, rebalance at regular intervals. Now let's look at active investing strategies. One, bottom up. After identifying individual companies, i.e. before any sector-wide or market-level assessment, evaluate the company's intrinsic value as well as the company's business model, competitive advantage, and management and governance. Value-based approaches, what to focus on when assessing the company's intrinsic value and determining which companies to invest in include looking at relative value, for example, multiples like PE, PB, and comparison to industry average or peers. Two, contrarian investing, depressed cyclical stocks with low or negative earnings or low dividend payments. Three, high quality value stocks, which have financial strength and profitability. Four, income investing, investing in relatively high dividend yields and positive dividend growth rates. 5. Deep value investing, which is extremely low valuation, for example, PB, relative to assets, and these companies are often in financial distress. 6. Restructuring and distressed investing, where distressed companies may still have valuable assets, distribution channels or patents, etc. Or special situations, where mispricings arise from corporate events like divestitures and spin-offs. Growth-based approaches focus on companies that are expected to grow faster than their industry or market. Investors look for high-quality companies with consistent growth, strong earnings momentum, good management, above-average ROE. Compared to value-focused investors, growth-focused investors have a higher tolerance for above-average valuation multiples. 2. Top-down Top-down begins at the macro level, and managers often use instruments such as futures, ETFs, swaps, and custom basket of stocks to capture macro view. Macro view at the top level includes country and geographic location, which seeks to track the overall supply and demand for equities in regions by analyzing the aggregate volumes of share buy buybacks, investment fund flows, volumes of IPOs, secondary share issuance, or sector and industry rotation, where manager has a view on expected returns of various sectors, or volatility-based strategies, where manager has a view on volatility of equities and is usually implemented using derivatives, or thematic investment strategies, which can be broad macroeconomic demo demographic or political drivers, or bottom-up ideas on industries, sectors, etc. to identify opportunities. These include, for example, 
disruptive technology, innovations, economic cycles. Another active investing strategy besides bottom-up or top-down is factor-based. A factor is a variable or a characteristic with which an asset can be correlated, and how much correlation the asset has with the factor can be used to rank the stocks to invest in. Style factors such as size, value, momentum, quality are common. These equity styles can also be rotated so that manager focuses on different factors during different periods of time. Most traditional and widely used methods for implementing factor-based portfolios is the hedged portfolio approach. After choosing the factor to focus on and then ranking the stock universe by factor, investor divides the universe into groups or quantiles. In each quantile, stocks are either equally weighted or market cap weighted. Then, the best quantile is longed and worst quantile is shorted. Drawback is that this strategy assumes that the relationship between factors and future stock returns is linear, which may not be the case, and can result in stock concentration and shorting of some stocks may be not available. For investors who desire a long-only factor approach, they can use a factor tilting approach which tracks a benchmark index closely, but also provides exposures to the chosen factor, similar to an enhanced indexed strategy. Style factors include value, price momentum, growth, or quality. Value has low PE, high earnings yield, good dividends, earnings cash flows, EBIT, EBITDA sales. Price momentum are winners over the last 12 months. Growth have historically and projected forward growth rates, and quality have earnings quality, particularly in the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings, and their profitability, balance sheet, insolvency ratios, stability, sustainability of dividends, payout, capital utilization, and management efficiency measures are all good. Unconventional factors include other characteristics analyzed through algorithms of big data, like satellite images. Another active equity investing strategy other than bottom-up, top-down, or factor-based is activist strategies. Activists try to bring change to the company so that it performs better by bringing in gains. Tactics include seeking board representation, engaging with management, proposing significant corporate changes during AGM, proposing restructuring of the balance sheet to better utilize capital and potentially initiate share buybacks or increase dividends, reducing management compensation, launching legal proceedings for breach of fiduciary duties, reaching out to other shareholders to coordinate action, launching a media campaign against existing management practices, or breaking up a large conglomerate to unlock value. Defense mechanisms used by companies' management against activist strategies include multi-class share structure so that management has multiple votes per share, poison pill, which allows the issuance of shares at a deep discount to cause significant economic and voting dilution, or staggered board election provision. Another approach to active equity investing, other than top-down, bottom-up, factor-based, or activist strategies, is statistical arbitrage and market microstructure strategies. Statistical arbitrage is also called stat arb, and it uses statistical and technical analysis to exploit mispricings. It uses data such as stock price, dividend, trading volume, and limit order book. Analytical tools used include traditional technical analysis, time series and econometric models, and machine learning. If there are any opportunities created by market microstructures, manager takes advantage of mean reversion. For example, pairs trading, two securities that are historically highly correlated with each other. If price of one of them deviates from its long-term average, then the deviation is expected to be temporary, so you overweight the underperforming of the two. 
Another active equity investing strategy, other than top-down, bottom-up, factor-based activist strategies and statistical arbitrage and market microstructure strategy, is event-driven strategies. These exploit market inefficiencies that may occur around corporate events, such as M&A, earnings or restructuring announcements, share buybacks, special dividends, or spin-offs. Revisiting fundamental versus quantitative investing approach. For fundamental investing, the process involves the following steps. Step one, define the market opportunity and investment universe. Step two, pre-screen the investment universe. Step three, perform industry analysis. Step four, forecast company performance. Step five, convert forecasts to valuations. Step six, construct a portfolio with top investments. And step seven, rebalance based on buy or sell discipline. Pitfalls of fundamental investing include behavioral biases such as confirmation bias, illusion of control, availability bias, loss aversion, overconfidence, regret aversion. Other pitfalls include value trap, which is when a stock appears attractively valued with a low PE multiple or other multiples, but it may be actually overpriced due to worsening future prospects. And usually stock prices need a catalyst for the price to move, but if a company doesn't have any catalysts, it may stay in the low price. Or a growth trap, which is when price might be high, but due to high growth, investor initially buys it. But if the company's results fall short, it could affect the stock negatively. Stock may also turn out to be overpriced already and not move higher than the starting point. Quantitative investing process includes the following steps. Step one, define the market opportunity. Step two, build a database and clean the data. Commonly, the data used includes company mapping, company fundamentals, survey data that includes estimates and forecasts, and unconventional data. Step two, backtest the strategy, which is to use the last 10 years of historical data to simulate real life investing. Step three, from backtests, determine correlation between factor exposures and returns to get information coefficients. Step four, create a multi-factor model. Weight each factor using a qualitative versus systematic process. And step five, construct the portfolio. Pitfalls of quantitative investing includes survivorship bias, look-ahead bias, which is when using data that was unknown at the time of the investment, but using it now during backtesting, data mining, or overfitting, or turnover, transaction costs, and short positions are not taken into account in backtesting. Classifying equities by style. Approaches used for style classification to determine the investment manager's investment style includes holding-based approach or returns-based style analysis. Holdings-based approach uses a bottom-up analysis of analyzing each company in the manager's portfolio and put it into a style box. Let's say the style box is a three by three that has large cap, mid cap, small cap, and value blend growth. Holdings-based is more accurate. This has come up before. Holdings-based is more accurate than the returns-based style analysis. Returns-based style analysis runs a constrained multivariate regression analysis of portfolio's historical returns to determine the highest factor for a style. Reading 18, Active Equity Investing, Portfolio Construction. Portfolio Construction Building Blocks. Manager has to choose which stocks to put in the portfolio with the objective of maximizing return while minimizing risk and or getting optimal exposure to certain factors per the fund mandate. There are four building blocks that affect the process of portfolio construction and therefore returns. One, factor weighting. Two, alpha skill. Three, position sizing. And fourth, which is kind of a bonus, is breadth of exercise or breadth of expertise. Breadth of expertise is critical in the success of the portfolio. How well the portfolio will do based on a manager's breadth of expertise can be determined using the formula 
active return is equal to IC, which is information coefficient, times square root of breadth times active risk, which is just standard deviation, not the variance, times transfer coefficient. Information coefficient is how much a manager's forecasted active returns correspond to realized active returns. Breadth is the number of truly independent decisions made each year. Transfer coefficient is the ability to translate insight into decisions without constraints. Portfolio construction approaches take on two dimensions. It can be top down or bottom up, and it can be systematic or discretionary. Top down systematic is when you emphasize macro factors, factor timing, and it's diversified. Top down discretionary is when you emphasize macro factors again and factor timing, and it can be diversified or concentrated depending on the strategy and style at the discretion of the active manager. Bottom-up systematic emphasizes security-specific factors. There is no factor timing, and it's diversified. Bottom-up discretionary is it emphasizes company-specific factors, potential factor timing, and it can be diversified or concentrated depending on the strategy and style at the discretion of the active manager. Measure of how well the manager's fund is doing. A manager must have active weights different from zero compared to the benchmark in order to perform better than benchmark. How do we measure these weights? There are two measures to evaluate a manager's active management success. One is active share. Active share is zero for a portfolio that fully matches the benchmark and 100% for a portfolio that has no overlap with the benchmark. Alpha of bottom-up managers, mostly from security selection, whereas alpha of top-down managers, it comes mostly from factor timing. And the formula for active share is equal to, first you take the weight of the asset in the portfolio minus but the weight of the asset in the benchmark, absolute value that, then you sum all of those up and then multiply it by half. Active risk is the square root of the variance times the sum of beta for the portfolio minus beta of the benchmark for each asset times its factor plus the variance of the error. This tells you the variance from factor exposure and variance due to the security's idiosyncratic risk. Active risk increases when an asset has higher idiosyncratic risk. Active risk also increases when a portfolio becomes more uncorrelated with its benchmark. And active risk also increases when factor weighting diverges more and more from the benchmark weighting. Using active share on the y-axis and active risk on the x-axis from left bottom of the plot to the top right, investment managers, active investing approach, you have pure indexing at the very bottom left, then closet indexer, then a factor neutral and diversified stock picker that follows multi-factor, diversified stock picker, concentrated factor bets, and concentrated stock picker. Closet indexer is defined as a fund that advertises itself as being actively managed, but is substantially similar to an index fund in its exposures. Objectives of actively managed portfolio construction are 1. Maximize risk-adjusted return, for example, maximize information ratio, which is active return per unit of active risk, or the sharp ratio, which is an absolute measure. Information ratio is a relative measure, and sharp ratio is an absolute measure, which is the return excess of the risk-free rate per unit of portfolio volatility, or other mandates include risk metric objectives, for example, portfolio volatility, downside risk, maximum diversification, and drawdowns, or it can have non-risk or return objectives, for example, maximize exposure to rewarded factors. Typical constraints in meeting these objectives include 
limits on geographic, sector, industry, and single security exposures, transaction costs, or limits on exposures allowed to have specific factors. Risk appetite in portfolio construction. An effective risk management process involves determining which type of risk measure is appropriate for strategy, for example, absolute versus relative risk measures. Understanding how each aspect of the strategy contributes to overall risk. Determining the level of risk budget, or allocating risk among individual positions and factors. Absolute risk versus relative risk. Relative risk is also active risk. Absolute risk is whatever the risk threshold, the portfolio risk must remain at or below that level. And as long as that is met, the manager is free to construct the portfolio without regard to the characteristics of the benchmark. Note that twice the absolute risk will not lead to twice the return. Source of absolute risk is from adding a new asset or replacing an existing asset with another that has a higher covariance with the portfolio. Refer to the formulas to figure out how much contribution of each asset has to a portfolio variance. Another source of absolute risk is from factor exposures and unexplained variance. Examples of absolute risk targets include market neutral hedge fund targeting absolute risk of 10%, benchmark agnostic equity manager targeting an absolute risk equal to 85% of index risk. Relative risk or aka active risk is risk and reward will be measured relative to a benchmark. Significant degrees of freedom to diversify from characteristics of the benchmark as long as risk is within a wide band within a central target. Source of relative risk is from diverging weightings of assets compared to the benchmark, which increases or decreases the total mix of covariance of assets to the portfolio. Examples of active risk or relative risk targeting targets are long-only equity manager targeting an active risk of less than 2% or long-only manager targeting an active risk of 6 to 10%. Leverage leads to a reduction of expected compounded return in a multi-period setting. Compounded geometric return is equal to arithmetic return minus the volatility squared divided by 2. Risk budgeting is allocating the sources of risk. Position sizing and the covariances of assets and factors, manager can determine the contribution of each position. Additional risk measures and constraints. Examples of heuristic constraints. Any single position is lesser of five times weight of security in the benchmark or 2%. Or portfolio must have a weighted average capitalization no less than 75% of index. Used to limit risks such as exposure concentrations of security, sector, industry, geography, exposure to risk factors, degree of leverage, degree of liquidity, trading related costs or turnover, net exposures to currencies, or exposures to environmental res risks. Formal constraints examples or risk measures include volatility which is the standard deviation of portfolio returns, active risk, which is the standard deviation of the difference between portfolio and benchmark returns, skewness, drawdowns, value at risk, conditional VAR, incremental VAR, which is just the change in portfolio VAR when a new position is added, or marginal VAR, which is contribution of each asset to the overall VAR. Portfolios with very limited number of securities may be more difficult to manage using formal risk measures because estimation errors are higher. Implicit costs in portfolio construction. Price movement, or market impact or price impact, resulting from manager's purchase or sale of a security may eat into the manager's alpha. Market impact may occur due to AA AUM being too large and therefore purchasing or selling a size of a security that's too huge, liquidity of the underlying asset being low, or immediacy or urgency in execution. Another implicit cost is cost of slippage 
difference between the midpoint of the bid-ask quote at the time the trade order was entered and the actual execution price. And this occurs because of market impact or volatility or trend of the underlying price. To avoid market impact, institutional investors today often try to hide their trades or sizes by breaking a trade into smaller trades and buying in unlit venues like dark pools and crossing networks to trade anonymously. Well-constructed portfolios and portfolio construction of some strategies. Well-constructed portfolios have clear investment philosophy and a consistent investment process, risk and structural characteristics as promised to investors, they're risk efficient, and reasonably low operating costs given the strategy. Long-only investing is when an investor has belief that you can earn long-term risk premiums. Aside from capacity constraints with smaller e-liquid assets, generally long-only investing offers greater investment capacity. And long-only investing has a downside limit as opposed to short sales potential losses. Transactions are simple and less expensive management fees and operational costs. Long-short investing is good if the manager has strong conviction of negative views. It helps to reduce exposure to sectors, market movements, etc. Absolute value of the longs minus the absolute value of the shorts is the portfolio's net exposure. Some of the absolute value of longs and shorts is gross exposure, which can be actually greater than one in terms of weights. But drawbacks are that sometimes long short requires significant leverage and collateral requirements increase if the short position moves against the manager's view. Short squeeze is when the price of the shorted stock goes up too much that the manager can't keep up with putting up more collateral while shorting the stock, so they liquidate the stock. Long extension is a hybrid of long only and long short. For example, 130-30 strategy is a portfolio of long positions worth 130% the amount of invested capital and 30% in short positions. Market neutral is a specialized form of long short. Dollars invested in long are identical to the long dollars in short. True market neutral strategies hedge out most market risk by matching offsetting the systematic risks. So market beta is zero. Since market neutral strategies seek to remove major sources of systematic risk, these strategies are less volatile than long only. Example of market neutral is pairs trading. Reading 19 hedge fund strategies. We're almost there. Classification of hedge funds and strategies. Funds are classified as a hedge fund if they have the following characteristics. One, legal or regulatory oversight. Investors eligibility against fraud. Generally, regulatory constraints for hedge funds are far less than those for regulated investment vehicles. Two, flexible mandates and very few investment constraints. Three, large investment universe outside of traditional investments. For example, private securities, non-investment, great debt, derivatives, etc. Four, aggressive investment style, for example, shorting, concentrated stocks positions. Five, high use of leverage. Six, hedge fund specific liquidity constraints, for example, initial lockup periods, liquidity gates, exit windows. Seven, relatively high fee structure, for example, 1% or more of AUM for management fees, plus 10 to 20% of annual returns for incentive fees. Classifications of hedge funds can be by single manager fund, multi-manager fund, multi-strategy fund, which is a team of managers with different strategies in the same fund, or fund of funds. Hedge fund strategies can be classified by some combination of assets the managers invest in, for example, whether it's equities, commodities, convertible bonds, etc., or the trading philosophy of the manager, for example, whether it's systematic or discretionary, or types of risks taken, 
for example, directional, event-driven, relative value. Now we're going to look at 13 different hedge fund strategies by category under six different categories. The six categories are equity, event-driven, relative value, opportunistic, specialist, or multi-manager. Under each category, category equity, there's long short equity, dedicated short bias, or equity market neutral. Under event driven, there's merger arbitrage or distressed securities. Under relative value, there's fixed income arbitrage or convertible bond arbitrage. Under opportunistic, there's global macro or managed futures. Under specialist, there's volatility strategies or reinsurance strategies. And under multi-manager, there's multi-strategy or fund of funds. First, long short equity. Let's talk about the three equity strategies. The first one is long short equity. Long short equity is a long position in the undervalued companies and short position in overvalued companies. It's flexible in investment time horizon and use of leverage. And the goal is to find alpha via stock picking and market timing. Typically, 40 to 60% is net long. There are various styles and risk exposures. Sector specific specialists will use both top down and bottom up in the sector they know very well, or generalist long short manager will search across sectors and invest across multiple industries. Second set of equity strategies is dedicated short selling and dedicated short biased. As the name implies, dedicated short selling is when it's all short only positions in equities that are viewed as overpriced and tend to be about 60 to 120% short versus dedicated short biased is a less extreme version of dedicated short selling where, where typically 30 to 60% is net short. For both dedicated short selling and dedicated short biased, the manager must post collateral when they borrow the stock to sell and pay interest on the securities loan. Uptick rule is when a stock decreases by 10% or more from its prior closing price, a short sale order can only be executed at a price higher than the current best. These strategies are more volatile than a typical long short equity because there's more short and short has more volatility. Aside from the actual borrowing of the securities, there's actually pretty low leverage. In dedicated short selling or dedicated short biased, you're trying to uncover overpriced securities. So typically use a bottom up approach to scan target companies that are likely to decline. You can monitor single named CDS, corporate bonds, yield spreads, implied volatility of exchange traded put options in order to identify these overpriced stocks. You can also monitor Altman Z score for bankrupt potential companies and M score for identifying potentially fraudulent financial statements. The third equity strategy is equity market neutral. As the name implies, in market neutral, you want to maintain a near net zero portfolio exposure to the market by taking opposite long short positions in similar equities with divergent valuations, i.e. you want the beta to be zero. Factors such as market sector, market size, PE ratios are all set to almost zero. An example is pairs trading, which is also done using statistical arbitrage. And one thing to note is that if you have a pair of companies that are very similar and have high correlation, and one of them fundamentally actually increases in price because their business increases, you wouldn't see that company going back down or mean reverting. So in that case, you wouldn't execute a pairs trading. Only when there is a structural mispricing and that one of the companies is overpriced, but it will mean revert. That's when you execute the equity market neutral pairs trading or statistical arbitrage pairs trading. Stop trading is when you buy and sell a stock of a parent company and its subsidiaries. Multi-class trading is when you buy and sell different classes of shares of the same company, such as one with voting and one with non-voting shares. With equity market neutral, there's high levels of diversification and liquidity, and there's lower standard deviation of returns because you're trying to have market neutral or beta of zero that cancel each other out. And just like statistical arbitrage, you're typically orienting these pairs trading toward mean reversion. There's also high use of leverage. 
The second group of hedge fund strategies is event-driven. The first event-driven strategy is merger arbitrage. If an acquisition is cash for stock, manager buys just the target, expecting it to increase in value when the acquisition is complete. In stock for stock, manager buys target and sells acquirer in the same ratio, hoping to earn a spread after completion. Note that if the merger deal fails, then the stock price goes in reverse of the manager's expectation and they can have substantial losses. Merger arbitrage has a lot of market sensitivity and left tail risk, moderate to high use of leverage, and is typically done through equities but can be done with preferred stock, senior, junior debt, convertible securities, options, derivatives, etc. And if the acquirer's credit is superior to the targets, a CDS may be used so that you can buy protection through CDS to hedge against the merger deal failing. Second event-driven strategy is distressed securities. The manager may seek to own the majority of the target company or a certain class of securities. It may take several years to resolve, so you need a lockup period. One of two outcomes can happen. Liquidation post-bankruptcy or reorganization where existing shares are canceled and new are issued, which is a capital structure arbitrage. There is high levels of illiquidity, moderate to low leverage. One way to do it also is to buy undervalued debt securities at 50% of par, for example, in hopes that it recovers to something like 75% or higher. Or in the case of liquidation, the asset salvage value might be higher and you might get a profit from that. The next set of hedge fund strategies is relative value strategies. The first relative value strategy is fixed income arbitrage. Exploit mispricings by taking long and short positions across a range of debt securities. Mispricings arise because of variations in duration, credit quality, liquidity, and optionality. You're basically buying undervalued fixed income and selling overvalued fixed income. Yield curve and carry trades of US government debt tend to be very liquid but typically they have the fewest mispricing opportunities. Liquidity, however, decreases in other sovereign bonds and corporate bonds. Leverage is high. Use collateralized repo agreements. Most common fixed income arbitrage is through yield curve trades and carry trades. For example, calendar spread strategy, or in the case of carry strategy or carry trade, go long a higher yielding security and short a lower yielding security with the expectation of receiving positive carry and profiting from long and short sides. Fixed income arbitrage can be securities of the same issuer. Second relative value strategy is convertible bond arbitrage, where you buy the cheap out of the money convertible debt in hopes the value goes up. Convertible arbitrage is a hybrid of security and debt with the option to exercise at strike price to turn the debt into equity. The strike price times the conversion ratio is the number of shares the bond converts to. The bond's current conversion value is equal to the conversion ratio times the current stock price. If this is less than the convertible bond price, then the strike price is higher, so it's out of the money. Convertible bonds are issued sporadically by the issuer, so it's thinly traded, and also hedges and bets on implied volatility to extract value. So convertible bond arbitrage is less liquid and there's high use of leverage. Again, basically it's buying the undervalued convertible bond and taking a short position in overvalued underlying stock. And that way you can achieve a delta neutral position by selling short the number of shares of the underlying that is determined by the delta of the convertible bond. And if the realized volatility exceeds the implied volatility of the convertible bond's embedded option, then an overall gain can be achieved. The next set of hedge fund strategies is opportunistic. The first opportunistic strategy is global macro strategies. It includes wide range and variety of techniques used, but focuses on certain themes. For example, trading undervalued emerging market currencies versus overvalued US dollars using OTC currency swaps. As the name implies, the manager holds views on the relative economic health and central bank policies of different countries globally, the global yield curve relationships, 
trends to inflation, relative purchasing power parity, capital trade flows between countries. There is high use of leverage, about six to seven times the equity. As you can imagine, it's typically a top-down approach and uses a range of macroeconomic and fundamental value models. The second opportunistic strategy is managed futures. Futures and sometimes forwards and swaps and options on futures and commodities and currencies are used, tend to be uncorrelated to stocks and bonds, so they make a nice addition to the portfolio. Managed futures tend to be very cyclical. They're highly liquid and active. They require little collateral, and therefore there is a high use of leverage, just like global macro strategies, and they typically exhibit positive right tail skewness during market stress. Quantitative methods like using triggers such as momentum and trend or volatility signal is used to buy and sell futures at the right time. The next two strategies are specialist strategies, the first of which is volatility trading. Source and buy cheap volatility and sell more expensive volatility while netting out the time decay aspects of options. The manager can also attempt to extract value from active gamma. Remember that gamma is the second order of delta, i.e. the amount of option price that changes as a sensitivity to a change in the underlying price. Equity volatility is about 80% negatively correlated with equity market returns, so it's a good diversifier for equity investments. This creeps up a lot, so remember that equity volatility is negatively correlated with equity market returns, so it's a good diversifier. Volatility trading is subject to counterparty credit risk and illiquidity risk. Liquidity varies, and long volatility positions exhibit positive convexity. There is very little upfront risk because notional values are very minimally levered. The trader monitors term structure of volatility, volatility smile across different strike prices, and volatility skew and then capture relative timing and strike price opportunities using various option spreads. The second specialist strategy is reinsurance or life settlements. Individuals who purchased whole or universal life policies who decide that they no longer want or need the insurance can surrender the policies to the original issuer, but they won't get as much money as if they sold their policy to a hedge fund instead. The hedge fund manager pays a lump sum to the policyholder via a broker, and the manager pays ongoing premium payments on the policy to the issuer or the insurance company. The manager receives future death benefit when the original policyholder dies. This can also work on catastrophe insurance on events like floods, hurricanes, and earthquakes. The manager looks for the following when analyzing life insurance contracts to buy. The surrender value to the policyholder is low. That's the lump sum that the manager pays to the person who surrenders the insurance. Ongoing premium payments are relatively low because the manager has to continue to pay for that. And the probability is high that the policyholder will die within a certain time period. So the arbitrage here is that the manager's lump sum payments and ongoing premium payments in total is less than the death benefit that they get when the insurer dies or a catastrophe happens. The last set of hedge fund strategy is multi-manager strategies, the first of which is fund of funds. Investing in a manager who invests across different funds. There's more diversification and access to certain closed funds, but the disadvantage is that they're double layer of fees. Fund of funds only requires $100,000 investment by an individual versus most hedge funds require a minimum of $500,000 to $5 million. By pooling small investors, it may provide more liquidity, adds transparency to otherwise closed hedge funds. Less extreme risk exposures, lower realized volatility, and generally less tail risk than a hedge fund. It's steady and there's low volatility. Initial lockup and redemption periods are the same. And to create this, the fund of fund manager becomes acquainted with different hedge fund managers and analyzes them based on the strategic asset allocation for the fund of funds. Then a formal manager selection is initiated and the fund of fund manager interviews the hedge fund managers. And then the hedge fund managers 
are selected and continuously monitored by the Fund of Fund Manager. The second multi-manager strategy is multi-strategy hedge fund. This is investing in a single fund that includes multiple management teams internally running different strategies under the same roof. Because they're all under the same roof, it's more efficient and can react faster than fund of funds. The fee structure is also more investor friendly. There is high leverage. Operational risk is not diversified because it's all under the same roof. There is faster tactical allocation slash reaction. There is more leverage than fund of funds. The initial lockup and redemption periods is the same. Multi-strategy hedge funds are more well-informed about the different strategies in terms of capital allocation across the different teams. To break down and understand the risk exposures for a hedge fund, a conditional factor risk model can be used. Hedge fund return is equal to the return due to alpha from skill plus the beta times each risk factor plus beta times factor plus beta times factor. The factors can be equity risk, interest rate risk, currency risk, commodity risk, credit risk, volatility risk, etc. Stepwise regression is used to build the factor model. To evaluate hedge fund returns, two well-known hedge fund databases are Lippertas and Morningstar Hedge. Once factor model is built, also use Sharpe Ratio and Sortino Ratio to evaluate hedge fund strategies. Sortino replaces standard deviation in the Sharpe Ratio with downside deviation, so it concentrates on returns below a specified threshold. Reading 20, Asset Allocation to Alternative Investments The role of alternative investments. Private equity's role is to earn a return premium from illiquidity risk. Limited diversification because of strong link to public equity. For asset allocation, use public equity volatility as a proxy with adjustment. Hedge funds role is based on strategy, but it basically earns return from shorting, lower portfolios overall equity beta, exploiting alpha from mispricings, etc. Absolute risk hedge fund strategy is more diversifying to equity than private real estate is. Real assets, such as commodities, timber, farmland, energy, and infrastructure role is underlying asset has high correlation with inflation, so it can hedge inflation risk. Timber provides growth and inflation hedging. Commodities provides inflation hedge, good store of value if the currency is depreciating. For example, commodities include energy, agriculture, livestock, farmland, two approaches. One, you can own the farmland and pay the salary to the farmer for tending to and selling the crops, which in this case there is higher risk and higher return. And the second approach is only use own the farmland but lease it to a farmer, and in this case it's more like real estate. Or energy includes exploration, development, transportation, delivery, and most are invested through call-down private equity style funds with long-term illiquid holdings. The role is inflation hedge and high risk and return. Infrastructure is the construction and maintenance of public use projects. It's an illiquid strategy, but also provides inflation hedge. Again, real assets like commodities, timber, farmland, energy infrastructure, the main role is hedge inflation risk, and some of them is high re risk, high reward. Next, real estate's role is also inflation hedge because it's very pro-cyclical and rents and property prices increase with inflation. Next is private credit, like distressed investment and direct lending. The role is low correlation to traditional bonds, therefore interest rate risk hedge and diversification. That's interesting because private credit is like lending or like fixed income, but there is actually low correlation to a traditional bond. One thing to note is that alternative investments volatility may appear low, but this must be debunked. It's a myth because volatilities are smoothed due to appraisals being less frequent. So these data must be unsmoothed first, which may tell a different story. 
In addition, over the long time horizon, alternative investments such as hedge funds do a better job than bonds when it comes to meeting investment goals, there, i.e. there's a higher probability of achieving higher returns. Which alternative investments should the fund allocate to? There are several approaches used to determine how much to allocate to alternative investments. First is liquidity-based. Categorize alternative investments based on liquidity to choose what the portfolio needs and can benefit from. This approach is easy to communicate, intuitive, and easily identify the manager's strategy, but the limitation is that it's an overestimation of portfolio diversification, i.e. there's a false sense of diversification, and can actually have very different risk characteristics if you only look at liquidity. Another approach is a macro view. So for example, in an economy with deflation, invest in government bonds. Or when there's moderate inflation, then invest in public equity, private equity, high yield bonds, or private credit. Or in high inflation, invest in alternative investments like real estate and commodities and inflation-linked bonds or gold. But again, there might be overestimation of portfolio diversification in this case. But the benefits are the same, which is that it's easy to communicate with, intuitive, and easily identifies the manager's strategy. Or a third approach is risk-based approach. Risk factor framework allows investors to understand the source of investment risk for each alternative investment so they can tilt toward or away from it. The positive is that it's used commonly across all alternative investment asset classes to identify the risk factors, and it's an integrated risk management. But limitations are that it is sensitive to historical data and the implementation has hurdles, for example, liquidity issues or time horizon issues. And also determining which risk factor to use is subjective. Some things to consider when investing in alternative investments. Risk considerations. Standard deviation is a poor representation of risk characteristics of alternative investments. Returns may be lump sums and not normally distributed. To accommodate the use of MBO framework, you can assign a higher standard deviation. Return expectations. Like with other asset classes, you can use a building block approach to determine return expectations. For example, begin with the risk-free rate and add the estimated returns related to factor exposures and add an, apply an assumption, assumption for manager alpha and deduct the fees like management fees and incentive fees. Investment vehicle. Direct investment in limited partnership is one investment vehicle where the investor becomes a limited partner LP and it's controlled by the general partner or GP. It limits the investor's liability to the amount that they contributed. Each limited partner has a distinct investment strategy, so investors must invest in multiple limited partnerships to diversify. Or fund of funds, or mutual funds, UCITS, which is undertakings of collective investments in transferable securities, or publicly traded funds. It seeks to replicate the same alternative investment strategies of hedge funds, aka liquid alts, which has actually a, only a one to two year time horizon. Or you can invest directly into a separately managed accounts, SMA. It's highly customizable and it's called a fund of one because you are the only single client in that account. In terms of liquidity, with alternative investments, both the vehicle and the underlying instrument may have a degree of liquidity risk. The Private Placement Memorandum, or PPM, details subscription and redemption features. Typically, liquidity provisions include, for hedge funds, subscription, redemption, and lockup, which is usually one year in the US. And prior to lockup, redemption penalty is 10%. And for redemption, it can only happen quarterly or annually, and you need a 30 to 90 day notice before you can redeem. And it may be subject to a gate limiting the amount that can be redeemed. Or for private equity, private credit, 
real estate, real asset funds. There's also a subscription, i.e. the committed capital called over stages over a three-year period. Redemption is similar. And you might also need a GP approval in this case. And lockup, which typically for private equity, private credit, real estate, and real asset funds, it's about 10 years with the option to extend by the GP by one to two years. That's the liquidity concerns or issues of investment vehicles. When it comes to liquidity of underlying investments, equity-oriented hedge funds are liquid, although short positions will be less liquid. Event-driven hedge funds tend to have longer investment horizons, for example, merger arbitrage, distressed securities. Relative value hedge funds invest in various forms of credit, convertibles, derivatives, or equities with uncertain liquidity. If hedge fund managers use leverage, the lender's claims are superior to those of the LPs. Fee considerations. Management fees usually are 0.5 to 2.5% of assets under management. Incentive fees can be 10 to 20% of returns. Normal fund expenses like legal, custodial, audit, admin, and accounting costs can be 0.5% of assets. But for larger funds, there's economies of scale, so it can come down to 0.05 to 0.2% of assets. And then there's also due diligence, research, and brokerage commissions. Taxes. U.S. tax code favors real estate, timber, and energy investments. Some alternative investment strategies can generate unrelated business income tax. Suitability considerations. Investors with less than 15-year time investment horizon should avoid alternative investments such as private real estate, private real assets, and private equity funds. Investors need to understand the risks associated with alternative investments. Investors must be comfortable with less than 100% transparency into the underlying holdings. Ensure that the alternative investment fund has strong governance, including long and short-term objectives clearly articulated, decision rights and responsibilities among experts with knowledge, capacity, and time, a formal IPS to govern day-to-day -day operations, and a reporting framework that monitors progress towards goals. Asset allocation approaches. Alternative investments have some challenges in determining expected returns due to the following and need to be addressed first before asset allocation. One, as we talked about before, appraisal-based pricing and valuation that is stale and smoothed need to be unsmoothed first. Two, skewness and fat tails, i.e. excess kurtosis, choose an optimization approach that can capture this effect. For example, time-varying volatility models, regime switching models, extreme value theory, and other fat tail distributions. To determine what percentage to allocate to the alternative investment asset classes, you can use one of three main approaches. Monte Carlo, portfolio optimization techniques like MVO, mean variance optimization, which incorporates downside risk using CVAR optimization, or risk factor-based optimization. Capital contribution required per year is capital commitment minus paid in capital times the rate of contribution. Expected annual distribution payments is equal to last year's net asset value times one plus growth rate and times that by the rate of distribution. It helps to determine the size of the annual commitment an investor needs to make to reach target allocation of an asset class over the coming years. Run stress tests and different scenario analyses to have contingencies in case there are unexpectedly faster capital contribution calls or no distributions. Monitoring and performance evaluation. The manager needs to monitor the portfolio to ensure the goals are met, which are typically return enhancement, income, risk reduction, or safety. Performance evaluation is done using proper benchmarking, using custom index proxies, peer group comparisons, 
both of these pose challenges because it may not match the accurately and comparing to peers can be inaccurate because of idiosyncratic risks. It's also acceptable to use similar public index as a benchmark. So instead of custom index proxies and peer group comparisons, a more qualitative assessment beyond the numbers is a good way. For example, asking questions such as, what are the expectations of the manager at the time of the acquisition? How does the manager plan to add value to the investment? Or what is the exit strategy? Investors should monitor the following during the investment. Key person risk, alignment of interests, style drift, risk management process, client asset turnover, other client profile, and service providers, both independent and reputable third party. Even though investment horizon for alternative investments like private equity is long, for example, 10 years, economic variables should still be assessed and monitored continuously throughout the 10 years, and investments also should be monitored within that 10-year time frame, instead of just leaving it and seeing what happens 10 years later. Reading 21, Overview of Private Wealth Management. Private clients needs goals, risk tolerance. Information to collect from private individual investors include personal information, such as family situation, marital status, employment and career, retirement aspirations, explicit return objectives, return targets, ESG, liquidity preferences, financial information, such as accounts, ownership interests, life insurance, property, other personal assets, liabilities, annual expenses, tax considerations, and other relevant information, legal stuff like wills. Client goals can be planned or unplanned. Planned goals include retirement, specific purchases, education, family events, wealth transfer, and philanthropy. Unplanned goals can be property repairs, medical expenses, and other unforeseen spending. The wealth manager's role is to quantify each of these goals and then prioritize the goals, and if the client's circumstances change, revisit those goals. Private client risk tolerance needs to be developed and understood, and risk tolerance includes willingness, and risk capacity is the ability, and risk perception by the client. Risk tolerance is conducted, then further risk tolerance conversation is had to understand how financial decisions are influenced by friends or family, experiences that shaped the client's perspectives, past investment mistakes and successes, accumulation of investment wealth, and client's evaluation of investment risk. Note that risk tolerance may vary for different goals. Technical and soft skills for wealth managers. Technical skills include capital market proficiency and asset class understanding, the ability to construct portfolios appropriate for the client with asset class risks and returns, and correlation awareness, financial planning knowledge such as estate laws, tax insurance, even if they're not at expert level, quantitative skills, technology skills, and language fluency. Soft skills for wealth managers include communication skills, social skills such as to deliver bad news, empathy, education and coaching skills, business development and sales skills. Ethical and compliance considerations include fiduciary duty and suitability, knowing your customer, i.e. KYC, confidentiality, conflicts of interest, compliance with fiduciary, best interest rule, reporting, tax, etc. Guiding the client through the investment journey. First, start with the investment policy statement to understand the client's background and investment objectives and their cash flow needs and goals. If retirement planning, then analyze the retirement goals using one of three common methods. Mortality tables, which is the probability to calculate the present value of cash flow goals given by the age. Two, annuities, i.e. price an annuity to determine the present value of retirement cash flow needs which tells you the lump sum at initiating that's required versus spending needs in retirement. And three, Monte Carlo simulation. 
When retirement planning, behavioral considerations in retirement include heightened loss aversion, gap between consumption, actual versus potential, the fact that retired people don't like annuities because they don't like the idea of giving a lump sum in exchange for annuities, and preference for income investment over capital appreciation. At this stage, also include capital sufficiency analysis, which can be done via deterministic model, which is a straight line forecast, or Monte Carlo. This will tell you the probability of meeting the goals, and if the probability fails to meet the range of goals, then potential solutions are to increase the contribution toward the goal, reduce the goal amount, delay timing of the goal such as retirement, or adopt a more aggressive investment strategy to have higher returns. Continuing on with the investment policy statement, also analyze investment parameters that include risk tolerance, willingness and ability of risk taken by the client, investment time horizon, asset class preferences, liquidity and other investment preferences, and constraints. Then think about portfolio asset allocation, strategic asset allocation and TAA, discretionary versus systematic, portfolio management in terms of rebalancing, tactical asset allocation and implementation, wealth manager responsibilities listed, and regular IPS review. Portfolio construction is next, and it can be done through the traditional approach or goal-based investing approach. The traditional approach has the following steps. Step one, identify asset classes appropriate for the client's portfolio. Then develop capital market expectations, such as returns, standard deviation, and correlation. Three, determine portfolio allocations that are optimal. Four, assess constraints. Five, implement the portfolio. And six, determine asset location, such as accounts for tax treatment. Or through a goal-based investing approach, step one, the manager identifies clients' goals and funds that are required to meet those goals. Step two is perform MBO for each goal sub-portfolio. Step three is determine asset classes and constraints. Four, implement. And five, determine asset location. Private client segments include starting with the average Joe that uses robo-advisors, which costs less than traditional brokerage to have an investing account. Then the next step up is mass affluent, i.e. rich people. For these people, they use traditional brokerage between 250000 to a million dollars, and it is discretionary management. Then the next up is high net worth, which are one to $50 million net worth clients. For these people, customize and estate planning and tax planning is done. And then at the very top is ultra high net worth, which are $50 million plus dollars. And for these people, do multi-generational estate and tax planning. Portfolio reporting and review. The manager's report to the client should include assessment of asset allocation, performance, contributions and withdrawals, transactions of which securities and assets were purchased or sold, currency exposure, costs, interests and dividends received, benchmarks, and if it's goal-based, also include the progress towards goals. During the review between manager and client, discuss any changes to the client's circumstances and revisit appropriateness of the investment strategy and suitability. When evaluating the success of an investment program, the criteria should be, is the goal achieved with acceptable amount of risk? Is it a consistent process of investing? Meets expected performance, whether absolute or relative to benchmark? Reading 22, Topics in Private Wealth Management. First, general principles of taxation and measuring tax efficiency. Types of taxes include income tax, including ordinary interest, dividends, withholding, capital gains tax, which is realized return over the cost basis, aka tax basis, wealth or property tax, which is assessed annually, stamp duties, 
which is tax on property or shares purchase, wealth transfer tax, and real estate income tax, which expenses and depreciation can be deducted from before taxes. Tax status of the account can be taxable, tax deferred, or tax exempt. For institutional, tax exempt include foundations, nonprofit, pension fund, endowment, and sovereign wealth fund. Note that insurance companies are taxable. Tax jurisdictions can be a tax haven, which is a country or independent area with no or very low tax for foreign investors, territorial tax system, which is taxed on income earned locally or territorially, worldwide tax systems, which is taxed on income earned worldwide as long as the individual is a resident of that country that follows this system. For example, U.S. residents must report worldwide income tax even if they don't live in the U.S., as long as they claim to be citizens or green card holders. Measuring tax efficiency with after-tax returns. Equity portfolios are often more tax efficient than derivatives, real assets, or taxable fixed income because dividends on stocks receive favorable tax treatment, capital gains are taxed less, and you can sell stocks with flexible timing on your terms. Refer to the formulas for all the tax return calculations, but one thing that will be mentioned here is after-tax excess return is the after-tax return on the portfolio minus after-tax of the return on the benchmark, and tax alpha is pre-tax return on the portfolio minus pre-tax on the benchmark return minus bracket after-tax return on the portfolio minus after-tax return on the benchmark, i.e. this is benefit of tax management. And tax efficiency ratio is how efficient your returns were after tax. So tax efficiency ratio is equal to after-tax returns divided by before-tax returns. Asset location strategies include, if you're tax indifferent, then put 50-50 in taxable and tax-exempt accounts. If the investor is tax-aware, then replace nominal equity and fixed income assets in the taxable accounts with tax-managed equities and tax-exempt bonds. Or if the investor is asset location sensitive, then put the tax-efficient assets in the taxable accounts and put the tax inefficient assets, such as fixed income, which earns interest at ordinary tax rates, in the tax exempt accounts. Again, remember that the less taxes you have to pay on it, put it in the taxable accounts, and the more taxes you have to pay on it, put it in the tax exempt accounts. Capital decumulation at retirement. It's better to withdraw from taxable accounts first and allow the retirement account to continue to compound at a higher rate, since it's not taxed yet. Or under progressive tax regimes, withdraw from the tax-deferred retirement account with the lowest tax brackets first, and then from taxable accounts, since taking money out of tax-deferred will trigger taxes, so you want to use the lowest tax brackets. In some jurisdictions, Appreciated securities can be gifted to a qualified charity without paying capital gains tax. Gift low-cost basis asset from taxable account. Tax management strategies include, for basic types, one, types of investments and accounts. So holding assets in a tax-exempt account versus taxable account, or investing in tax-exempt bonds instead of taxable bonds holding assets long enough to qualify for long-term capital gains treatment, or holding dividend-paying stocks long enough to pay more favorable rates. Or another basic strategy is deferring tax recognition until a future date, i.e. limiting portfolio turnover and using tax loss harvesting to offset gains. More advanced tax management strategies include selection of investment vehicles. In the case of partnerships, Tax liabilities are passed through to partners. For a mutual fund, tax liabilities arise even if another shareholder redeems their shares. Mutual funds provide metrics like potential capital gain exposure, 
PCGE, which is equal to net gains or losses divided by the total net assets. And you can take the PCGE of different mutual funds and compare it across different mutual funds to see how much tax liability is embedded. Again, that's net gains or losses divided by the total net assets. For ETFs, tax liabilities can be reduced or eliminated by delivering low cost basis holdings first during share creation or redemption. In the case of separately managed accounts or SMAs, this is the most flexible for tax management because realized gains and losses can be aggregated across the client's accounts and not just by security. Tax loss harvesting and tax lot accounting. Tax lot accounting helps keep track of cost basis from when you bought shares and how much. So you can effectively utilize tax loss harvesting using the accounting or the ledger of when you bought it at what cost. And quantitative tax management uses a quantitative risk model to estimate risks and correlations of each asset in the portfolio. Then it's optimized is the model to reduce tracking error and be tax efficient. Managing concentrated positions. Concentrated can be subjective and dependent on the asset. For example, 10% in a small cap stock may be considered concentrated, but 10% in a large cap that is risky may not meet the concentrated threshold. Regardless, holding a concentrated position due to its low tax basis or personal association inhibits a diversified portfolio. Risks and tax-related considerations for concentrated single-asset position are company-specific risk, lack of diversification, liquidity risk, and risk of high tax when selling the position. The following are approaches that can be taken to mitigate the risks of a concentrated position for public stock, private businesses, and real estate. Let's first talk about for a public stock. One, you can sell and diversify. Just pay the capital gains tax and reinvest the proceeds from the sale into a diversified portfolio. Two, staged diversification or completion portfolio. Basically sell in multiple tranches, which is the staged diversification, or for a completion portfolio, add an index-based portfolio to the existing concentrated position and use quantitative portfolio optimization to select individual stocks or sector ETFs and also to optimize tax. Three, hedging and monetization strategies. Hedge using derivatives or monetize lending against the value of your concentrated position, which provides funds to invest elsewhere without triggering a taxable event. Four, tax-free exchanges. Exchange assets, i.e. investors each contribute low cost basis stock to an exchange fund and become partners. Each partner owns a pro rata interest in the fund while holding a diversified pool of low basis stocks. For tax purposes, partners must remain in the fund for a minimum seven years. When redeemed, the partner receives a basket of securities equal in value to their pro rata ownership in the fund. Five, charitable giving strategies. Investor makes a donation of shares of a concentrated position to a charitable remainder trust and receive a tax deduction for the gift. Within the trust, shares could be sold and reinvested without capital gains tax. The trust would provide income for the life of the named beneficiaries. Beneficiaries pay tax on the income. And when the last named beneficiary dies, the remainder of assets go to the charity named in the trust. Six, tax avoidance and tax deferral strategies. Holding the position until death allows heirs to receive a step up in tax basis, i.e. a new tax basis valued at the date of the death of the original owner. For a privately held business, strategies include one, sell the company or assets via an IPO to a third party, to an insider, or divest non-core assets. Two, get a personal line of credit secured by the company shares. Then you can diversify the concentrated position in the business with the loan. Three, leveraged recapitalization with a private equity firm. The PE firm invests into the business and takes partial ownership in equity. 
Then, they provide debt with senior and mezzanine lenders. The owner of the business receives cash and retains minority stake. The owner is taxed on the cash received, but tax deferral can be achieved on the stock rolled over into newly capitalized company. Or four, employee stock ownership plan. It may be possible to defer any capital gains tax on shares sold to ESOP. For real estate, strategies include one, mortgage financing, two, donor advised fund charity, which is contributions to donor advised fund can be tax deducted. Then the property is sold by DAF without capital gains tax and reinvested into a diversified portfolio. This is similar to a charitable giving strategy for public stock. Gifts and estate planning. The objective is planning for the process of disposing one's estate, i.e. all the property and assets a person owns during the remaining life and after death while meeting the following objectives. Maintain sufficient income and liquidity for the donors and beneficiaries and pay any estate taxes due. Deciding on who gets control of the assets upon death. Protect assets from creditors and certain family members. Note that forced heirship is a requirement that a certain proportion of assets be passed to specified family members, such as spouse and children. Transfer assets in a tax-aware manner. Preserve family wealth. Set up family governance system. Pass control of the business to the next generation of family. Or achieve charitable goals. Terms and definitions include will or testament, which is what outlines who will own or control the assets. Testator is the person who wrote the will and is disposing of their assets. Probate is the legal process to confirm validity of the will. Intestate is if a person died without a will. In that case, a court decides on the disposition of the assets. Trust, which is a vehicle through which individual entrusts assets to a trustee who manages the assets for the assigned beneficiaries. The trust itself cannot enter into contracts or take any legal formalities. Foundation, which can hold assets in its own name unlike a trust. And testamentary bequest is bequeathing assets in some way upon death or testamentary gratuitous transfer. From a recipient's perspective, this is basically inheritance. Tax considerations. For a non-profit charitable gratuitous transfer, there are two forms of tax relief. One, most charitable donations are not subject to a gift tax. Two, most jurisdictions permit income tax deductions for charitable donations. Whether to gift the assets while still alive or bequesting upon death as part of taxable estate depends on the tax efficiency. This is relative value after tax comparison of gifting versus bequesting. It compares the future value of the gift after tax over the future value of bequest over tax. Refer to the formulas. Common estate planning tools include trust, which can be either revocable or irrevocable trust. Revocable is when the settler, the owner of the assets, has the right to rescind it from the trust. And irrevocable is when a settler cannot revoke and the trustees must report and pay taxes on the trust. This provides greater asset protection against the settler's creditors or bad family members. Or a trust can be fixed or discretionary. Fixed is when distributions to beneficiaries are already specified. Discretionary is when the trustee has the discretion on how much to distribute to the beneficiary based on the beneficiary's circumstances. The main objectives for using a trust is to give resources to beneficiaries without giving them control, protect assets from creditors and beneficiaries, i.e. greedy ones, and lower taxes if the beneficiary is taxed at lower rates. Another estate planning tool besides a trust is a foundation. Foundations are typically set up to hold assets for a specific charitable or mission purpose, such as to promote education or philanthropy. When it's set up by an individual or a family and managed by its own directors, this is called private foundation. It allows the donor to retain control over decision-making and 
and may be required to make certain minimum annual distributions. For example, 5% of previous year is the average net investment assets, i.e. the spending requirement. Like trusts, foundations survive the donor, i.e. the settler, and follows the settler's wishes after death. Another estate planning tool is life insurance. This can pay death benefit proceeds tax-exempt to the beneficiary named in the policy. And another estate planning tool is to use companies. For example, Controlled Foreign Corporation, CFC, which is located outside a taxpayer's home country in which the taxpayer has a controlling interest. Family conflict may arise when it comes to wealth across generations. One way to mitigate as a starting point is to have a family constitution, which is a non-binding document that sets forth agreed-upon rights, values, responsibilities of the family, and other stakeholders. Reading 23, Risk Management for Individuals. Human capital, financial capital, and economic net worth. The present value of an individual's human capital at t equals zero is last year's wage times one plus growth of the wage divided by one plus the risk-free rate plus an adjustment based on occupational income volatility to the power of the number of years you're calculating the wage for multiplied by the probability of survival at that age and do that for every age and sum it up. Clarification, every age until the predicted death age. Financial capital, which are explicit personal and investment assets, include for personal assets, automobile, clothes, furniture, personal residence. Investment assets that are marketable and tradable include money market instruments, bonds, equity. Private and non-publicly traded assets include real estate, annuities, life insurance, business assets, and collectibles. Non-marketable assets include pensions from either employer or government. The net present value today of a pension benefit is the benefit divided by 1 plus r to the power of the number of years times the probability of survival at that age. Do that for every year you will receive a pension benefit until when you think that the person is going to die and then sum it all up. Economic net worth is when you sum all the traditional financial capital and human capital and the present value of pension benefits, i.e. all the extended assets as well, minus all the liabilities, including extended liabilities. Framework for individual risk management include the following steps. 1. Specify the objective. For example, is it to maximize household welfare through balance of risk and safety? Step 2 is identify those risks. For example, earnings risk, premature death risk, etc. Step 3. Evaluate risks and manage them via risk avoidance, risk reduction. Step 4. Monitor outcomes and risk exposures. Financial stages of life. First, there's education. Then there's early career from 20s to 30s, career development from 35 to 50, peak accumulation from 51 to 60, pre-retirement, which is a few years before retirement, early retirement, which is the first 10 years of retirement, and then late retirement. An economic or holistic balance sheet will include human capital and pension value on the asset side, and then on the liability side will also include lifetime consumption needs, present value, and bequests to get the economic net worth compared to just a net worth for a traditional balance sheet, which only considers the financial assets and liabilities. Individual risk exposures. Earnings risk is earnings can be affected due to health issues, unemployment, underemployment, Self-employed individuals are prone to variability in earnings. Premature death risk is when an earnings of an individual are expected to help pay for financial needs of their family, and the person who earns that dies. Longevity risk is outliving your assets. Property risk is if property is destroyed, stolen, lost, etc. 
Liability risk is if legally liable to pay for something like damages to another's property or someone's physical injury on your property. Health risk is medical payments arising from health issues. One way to mitigate is to use a systematic risk management approach to optimize each risk exposure and to help decide whether to accept it, reduce it, or transfer the risk. Life insurance. To mitigate premature death risk, you can transfer the risk by purchasing a life insurance. Two main types, there's temporary and permanent. Temporary, which is also called term insurance, is for a specified period of time, it's temporary, for example, 20 years, and the policy terminates. So if the insured dies during the 20 years, then the insurer pays death benefits to the beneficiary. But if the insured dies past the 20 year mark, then the policy does not pay the death benefit if it's not renewed because the policy has been terminated at the end of the 20 years. Permanent life insurance is when it provides lifetime coverage, assuming premiums are paid over the entire remaining life of the insured. Two common types include whole life insurance, which is fixed premiums during the insured life for an associated cash value, or universal life insurance, where it's more flexible, so the insured can increase or decrease the premiums so that the cash value would increase or decrease. To remember, remember whole, it's already whole, meaning all of the fixed pieces are already completed into a whole and can't change, versus universal is when there's a lot of flexibility because you're taking universal considerations. For both types, a number of potential riders can be added, which are modifications. For example, accidental death rider or accelerated death benefit. You can pay additional premium for those riders. Basic elements of a life insurance policy includes term and type of policy. For example, a 20 year temporary or permanent universal amount of benefits, for example, $100,000. Limitations, for example, if death is by suicide within two years of issuance. Contestability period, which is when the insurance company can investigate and deny claims. Identity of the insured, policy owner, beneficiaries, premium schedule, i.e. premium payments, and modifications or riders to the coverage. Three key considerations in how an insurer prices a life insurance. One, mortality expectations. Life insurance company actuaries use additional factors and make adjustments to the mortality table. For example, the insurer's health history, perceived riskiness. Then they use discount rate. And then they also take off loading or expenses incurred by the insurer to underwrite the policy and manage on an ongoing basis. For example, a net premium calculation, let's say the probability of dying in year one of the insurance premium payment is 0.15%. So the expected death benefit is 0.15% times a $100,000 benefit plus 0.9985 times zero, which is $150 discount each year's expected payout. So in year one, the expected payout would be $150. So you go 150 divided by one plus the discount rate to the power of one. The discount then is $142.18 is the discounted value in year one. So that's the net premium to pay. Then you add the load or i.e. take off the expenses for the insurance company. So 142.18 plus add a dollar fifty, let's say. Then the gross premium is the sum of that, which is 143.68. Build up of cash value in a whole life insurance policy. As the age of the insurer increases, the cash value increases and the insurance value decreases. Insurers are required by regulators to maintain policy reserves on their balance sheet. Policy reserve is basically the present value of the future benefits that they have to pay to the insurers, 
minus the present value of future net premiums that they will receive. So if there is a gap, then they have to make that up by having that in policy reserves on their balance sheet. Life insurance companies provide consumers with cost data to be able to compare policies. The two popular indexes for comparison are one net payment cost index, which is basically when they give you all the information, you use your calculator to put all the premiums and dividends to what the future value is. Once you have that, you divide that net future value cost annually by face value of the policy. And you can compare that to different policies. And the second is surrender cost index. And that's basically the same method as the net payment cost index, but there will also be a cash value for the surrender, which you incorporate into the calculation. Key considerations to determine how much life insurance one needs include immediate financial needs, i.e. funeral costs, legal expenses, legacy goals, income replacement for dependents, charities, bequests, and two approaches are used to calculate these needs. One is the human life value method, which basically replaces the present value of earnings, or two, needs analysis, which estimates the financial needs of the dependents. And for this also, calculate the present value of that. Other types of insurance other than life insurance includes disability income insurance. This mitigates earnings risk as a result of disability. Typically, insurers will cover compensation only up to specific amounts, for example, 60 to 80%, under the assumption that if the insured becomes disabled, other lifestyle expenses will decrease. And also because if it's 100%, then there's a greater chance for fraudulent claims. Other aspects of the disability income insurance includes a benefit period, minimum of five years to typically until retirement, Elimination period, which is the waiting period the insured must be disabled for, for example, 90 days. Rehabilitation clause, which is payments for physical therapy. Waiver of premiums, i.e. premiums not need to be paid if the insured becomes disabled. Option to purchase additional riders. Non-cancellable and guaranteed renewable policy and the cost of living rider, which basically adjusts the benefits to inflation. Property insurance is basically homeowner's insurance. There are two types. One is replacement cost policy, which is more expensive, and this reimburses the amount required to repair or replace items. Or second is actual cash value policy, which is the replacement cost less depreciation. and Automobile insurance is another example of property insurance. There's also health or medical insurance. PPO is preferred provider organization, which has a network of doctors that charge lower. Or there's HMO, which is health maintenance organization, where visits to doctors at no or little cost to encourage individuals to seek help for small issues before they get serious. Liability insurance is used if the liability amount for homeowner or automobile insurance is not enough. In this case, individuals can take out a personal umbrella liability insurance policy. Other insurance includes title insurance when purchasing a home. As a recap for risk management, if there's a high frequency of occurrence and a low severity of loss, then it's managed by risk reduction. If there is a low frequency of occurrence and a high severity of loss, then you would want to manage it by risk transfer. If there is low frequency and low severity of loss, it's just managed by risk retention, basically accepting it. Next, annuities. There are two dimensions of two different types of annuities. One is immediate versus deferred, and the other is fixed versus variable. Immediate means there is a lump sum amount of money paid to the insurance company today in return for specified future monthly payments over a specified period that starts immediately. 
deferred is when you purchase an income stream to begin at a later date by giving the lump sum or making premium payments. And similar to life insurance, the four parties involved in annuities includes insurer, annuitant, contract owner, and beneficiary. When you have an immediate fixed, which is the most commonly used, for a lump sum given today to the insurance company, a fixed income yield, let's say 8% for a $100,000 lump sum that you give them, is paid to the insurer for as long as they are alive. When you have an immediate variable, then the amount of annuity varies over time based on the portfolio performance for a lump sum given today to the insurance company where the annuity starts immediately. A deferred fixed is when a fixed annuity payments starting at a future date in exchange for a certain amount invested today or premium payments made over time. In retirement, the individual can cash out or begin withdrawing the accumulated funds. And a deferred variable is similar to a mutual fund where there is a menu of potential investment options, but it's sold as an insurance product. Its predetermined target risk allocation consists of mix of securities managed by multiple investment managers, and hence the annuity is variable because it's based on investment returns. Advanced Life Deferred Annuities, or ALDA, is a hybrid of a deferred fixed and an immediate fixed annuity. What that means is it's similar to an immediate fixed in that you give lump sum to insurance company, but instead of an immediate annuity payout, payments start later in life. For example, when an individual turns 80. Advantages of fixed versus variable and disadvantages. So first, let's look at advantages of fixed. Constant income stream that's fixed and guaranteed. Fees are lower than variable. But disadvantages are that there is interest rate risk because it's like a bond in that they are fixed yield. And it's similar to interest rate risk in that there is significant inflation risk because fixed annuities are nominal. With variable annuities, advantage is that it has flexibility in accessing the funds, but disadvantage is that it's more volatile in payments. Payout methods that are similar whether annuity is fixed or variable. Life annuity, payments are made until death. Period certain annuity, payments are paid only for a certain period regardless of death, i.e. it's certain only for a certain period. Life annuity with period certain, Payments are made for entire life until death and guaranteed for a minimum number of years even after death. Life annuity with refund, which guarantees that the annuitant or the beneficiary will receive payments equal to the amount paid into the contract, i.e. initial investment less fees. And joint life annuity, which is when payments continue until both couples die. Payout methods above are not mutually exclusive and can be combined. Annuities are a tax-deferred growth because in the US, growth in annuity is taxed only when the individual receives income from the annuity. Annuities versus portfolio fund withdrawal. A retiree has a choice between getting annuities or withdrawing periodically from an investment portfolio. Potential benefits of annuitizing is that each payment received includes principal, interest, and mortality credits. Mortality credits are the money in the annuity pool that belongs to individuals who die earlier than expected. This creates a cushion of more certainty of getting paid the annuities. For an investment portfolio, one should choose or allocate to assets not correlated to human capital. For example, the stock broker should have more investment grade bonds than a salary worker in a medical field because a salary worker has more fixed cash flow just like an investment grade bond. But for a stockbroker, they are dealing more with equity earnings in their day job, so an investment grade bond would have low correlation to their job. Reading 24, Portfolio Management for Institutional Investors. Common characteristics of institutional investors include scale, i.e. asset size, long-term investment horizon, regulatory frameworks, such as investor protection, integrity of markets, etc. 
governance framework, such as board of directors, investment committee, and the principal agent issue. Investment policy overview. First, set out the objectives and the mission. For example, for banks and insurance companies, maximize NPV of assets by balancing returns on assets, expected cost of liabilities, and overall risks and relationships of assets and liabilities. Define benefit pension fund. Objective can be maintain a funded ratio in excess of 100%. Endowment. Maintain long-term purchasing power while providing financial support to the university. Remember that for both endowment and foundation, their objective should be including inflation, i.e. nominal. And for a foundation, the spending rule is a requirement versus an endowment, the spending is not required. Establish risk tolerances in the investment policy, for example, expressed as for banks and insurers, value at risk or conditional VAR, scenario-based stress tests. For DB pension funds, it could be surplus volatility, standard deviation of asset returns in excess of liability returns. Endowments and foundations, it may be volatility of total returns or standard deviation of total returns. Or for sovereign wealth funds, it may be the probability of investment losses over a certain period of time i.e. the probability of not maintaining purchasing power. Then, once desired risk and return profiles are established, set out constraints, regulatory, legal, tax, accounting, unique constraints. And then finally, design the strategic asset allocation, aka the policy portfolio. There are four different approaches. One is the Norway model, which is 60-40 in equity and fixed income, there is little in alternative investments. It's largely passive with low tracking error and use a benchmark as a starting point. Norway model is good because it has low cost, it's transparent and suitable for large scale, and it's very easy to understand. The cons are that it's limited value add, i.e. alpha. Another approach is the endowment model. Endowment model is high alternative investments and its active management, but the active management is outsourced, i.e. the alpha is outsourced. Endowment model is good because it has high alpha potential, but a con is that it's very expensive and difficult to implement, especially for a large AUM. Third SAA approach is the Canada model. Canada model is similar to endowment model in that it has a high alternative investment allocation, and it's also active management, but the difference is that it's insourced. They have an in-house active management team. Pros are that it has high alpha potential, just like an endowment model, and there's a development of internal capabilities. But a con of the Canada model is that it's expensive and difficult to manage. The fourth SAA approach is the liability-driven investing model. It focuses on hedging liabilities and interest rate risk using duration matching with fixed income. It also has growth potential. The pros are that it explicitly recognizes liabilities, but the cons are that certain risks, such as longevity and inflation risk, are not hedged. First, let's talk about pension funds. There are two types. One is defined benefit and defined contribution. Defined contribution is lower risk for plan sponsors because employee is the primary contributor and the payouts are not defined, so the risk is on the employee. Stakeholders for both DB and DC plans include the employer, which is the plan sponsor, employee or the retiree, which are the plan beneficiaries, the government, board of directors, CIO in the case of DB plans. In DB plans, plan sponsor may want to reduce employer contributions, whereas the employees want them to maximize it. In DC plans, although individual makes the decisions on what to invest in, the plan sponsor still has fiduciary duty to oversee and offer suitable investment options. For DB plans, the liabilities are the present value of future payments to the beneficiaries upon retirement, disability, or death. Factors affecting the calculation of DB liabilities include the service and tenure, salary earnings, 
additional matching contributions, mortality or longevity assumptions, expected vesting, expected investment returns, and discount rate. If the funded ratio is less than 100%, the sponsor must increase contributions until assets exceed 100%, and based on plan asset size compared to the rest of the business and the business's cyclicality, they could take more investment risk. For example, if the plan assets are 80% of all the assets on the balance sheet, then they should not take any investment risk. If the plan sponsor can take on more risk, then their investment horizon is longer and can invest in illiquid long-term investments like private equity or venture capital. For DC plans, liabilities are equal to only its required contributions i.e. the matching percentage of the employee's contributions. The investment time horizon reflects how old or young the large proportion of plan participants are. Participant switching life cycle options automatically switch members into a more conservative asset mix as their age increases. Participant or cohort option pools participants with a cohort that has a similar target retirement date. Liquidity needs for both DB and DC plans are driven by the proportion of active employees relative to retirees, age of the workforce, plan funded status for DB, and ability of participants to switch or withdraw from the plan. Legal and regulatory constraints include for capital adequacy, market integrity, consumer protection, reporting and transparency and fiduciary duties. Tax and accounting constraints for DB plan must be on the balance sheet, regardless of if overfunded or underfunded, and they must report fair market values. Factors affecting DB risk tolerance include its current plan status, sponsor financial status and profitability, sponsor and fund correlation, plan features like early retirement or lump sum distribution, workforce characteristics like age and active to retired lives. Investment objectives and asset allocation for DB plans is to achieve a long-term rate of return on plan assets that exceeds the rate of return used by the pension plan actuaries, i.e. return above the discount rate used to value the plan liabilities. For example, achieve X percent over three to five years that meets the liabilities. For DC plans, the objective is just to prudently grow assets. Asset allocation and plan funds differ by country, but some common traits are that they're mostly in equities or fixed income, small allocation is in other, and there's very little in cash. Moreover, rationale for using the different assets as an allocation are that for equities, higher expected return, but more risk than fixed income, so use it in the longer time horizon. But equities also is used as an inflation hedge. Fixed income is good during market stress because it provides interest rate risk hedge, i.e. interest rates falling during market stress, but fixed income rates are locked in, so fixed income is used as a defensive role. And alternative investments and other have low correlation with equities and fixed income, so it's used as higher return source in the case when an investment horizon is long. Except for private equity, there is correlation with public equity, so watch out for that. Next is sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds are state-owned funds or entities that invest in financial or real assets. There are different types. First, budget stabilization fund. It protects the budget and economy from commodity price volatility and external shocks. Because it's there to cushion the shock of instability in the economy, the liabilities are uncertain, there is relatively short investment horizon, and the main purpose is risk management to fund government budget on short term. It must maintain high level of liquidity as a result. The second type is development funds. Allocate to priority socioeconomic projects, usually infrastructure. Liabilities are not clearly defined, but the overall objective is to raise the country's economic growth and develop the economy. 
liquidity needs depend on strategic development initiative. Third type is savings fund. This transforms non-renewable assets into diversified financial assets and create wealth across generations. It transforms the proceeds from the sale of non-renewable natural resources into long-term wealth so that the liabilities are long-term. It's very long-term horizon because it's supposed to save wealth across generations and there's low liquidity needs. Fourth type is reserve funds. The objective is to earn higher return on surplus of reserves, i.e. cash holdings. It tries to reduce negative cost of carry of holding excess FX reserves, nominal or real target rate as liabilities required, and it's relatively low in liquidity needs because it is just to earn a higher return on the reserves that they already have. And the fifth type is pension reserve funds to meet future liabilities from pension related outflows. The goal is to meet unfunded liabilities. Liquidity needs change over time. Stakeholders include the government, citizens, asset managers, investment committee, and the board. Constraints and risks include national legislation containing the fund's mission, contributions, governance, etc. International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds is a self-governing body to promote best practices among so sovereign wealth funds. And SWFs are given tax-free status and there are accounting constraints. Investment objectives of each type is for budget stabilization fund, capital preservation to deliver returns above inflation, mainly in fixed income assets, for development funds, achieve real rate of return above the real domestic GDP productivity growth. For savings funds, grow assets and maintain purchasing power of assets in perpetuity while achieving returns to fund ongoing government activities. For reserve funds, achieve a return above what the government must pay on its monetary stabilization bonds. And for pension reserve funds, Earn returns to maximize the probability of meeting future unfunded pension liabilities tilted towards equities and real assets. Next, we'll talk about university endowments. Endowments are typically funded through gifts and donations and are intended to help institutions provide some of their main services, like operating costs. Stakeholders include current and future students, alumni, current and future faculty and admins, and the large university community. Liabilities of endowments are the future stream of payouts of the university listed in the spending policy, purpose of which is to ensure the intergeneration equity and to smooth out volatility from contributions. There are three different types of spending policies. One is the constant growth rule, which is a fixed amount times one plus inflation every year. Two is the market value rule. For example, four to six percent of three to five years of the moving average of asset values. Or three is the hybrid rule, weighting average of one and two. Forty to sixty percent of the university's operating budget is provided by the endowment, which is about two to three percent of the assets. Investment time horizon is perpetual. There's high risk tolerance and low liquidity needs, since it's only 2-3% to of the AUM. Endowments are subject to rules that require investment committees, officers, board, to invest on a total return basis and consider portfolio diversification. And it requires investment committees, officers, and boards to exercise a duty of care and prudence, i.e. fiduciary duty. Endowments have a tax-exempt status. Donations are tax-deductible. The investment objective of endowments is to maintain the purchasing power of the assets into perpetuity while achieving returns sufficient to sustain the necessary spending levels of the university. Large endowments asset allocation typically invests in alternative assets and equities, foreign assets, and small amount of fixed income. There is 
little to no home bias. Next, we'll talk about private foundations. Private foundations are nonprofits that make grants to those who carry out social activities, educational, or charitable activities. There are four types of foundations. Community foundation, which gives grants to communities. Operating foundation, which operates a nonprofit. Corporate foundation, which is funded and set up by a business. And private grant-making foundations, set up by individual donors or a donor family to support specific missions. There is a Perpetual Investment Horizon Foundation or Limited Life Foundations. There's high liquidity needs. In the U.S., it's legally required to pay out 5% of the asset plus investment expenses on top of that. Foundations usually only receive one-time gift from the founding family, so they're more conservative and invest in more liquid assets. They have to support an entire budget of the organization that they support. Constraints and risks are similar to the endowments in that it's tax exempt and they have specific investment committee, officer, and board considerations such as portfolio diversification and exercising fiduciary duty. Investment objectives of a foundation is to generate a total real return over the inflation of 5% plus investment expenses with reasonable volatility, approximately 10 to 15% standard deviation over a three to five year period. And the asset allocation is similar to endowments in that there's alternative investments and equities, foreign assets, and small amounts of fixed income. Next, let's talk about banks. Stakeholders of banks include external parties, which are shareholders, creditors, customers, credit rating agencies, regulators, and the community. Internal parties include the employees, management, board of directors. On the liability side, there are depositors, individuals, and corporations, municipalities. On the asset side, there are borrowers. Bank assets are typically made up of loans, debt securities, and the remaining in deposits with central bank, currency and receivables, and bullion. Liabilities are made up of deposits, i.e. time or term deposits like CDs and savings, and demand deposits that customers make into their accounts, short-term funding like commercial paper. Investment horizon is directly impacted by the nature and maturities of its asset base and liability structure. Banks must have the ability to liquidate their investments within a certain period to generate adequate cash. Commercial banks have higher cost of funds and lower liquidity than retail banks. There are legal and regulatory constraints that focus on capital adequacy, liquidity, and leverage to mitigate systematic or contagion risk, regulated at the national and state levels, standard financial accounting rules under GAAP or IFRS that oversee communication to shareholders, deposit or policyholders, and suppliers of debt capital. There are statutory accounting rules and current market values of accounting for all assets and liabilities. Investment objectives of a bank's portfolio is to manage the bank's liquidity and risk position relative to its non-securities assets and liabilities. Banks have an asset liability management committee. They set the IPS, they monitor performance, establish policy benchmarks, and provide direction and oversight. Next, we'll talk about insurers. There are two broad types. One is life insurers, and the other is property and casualty. Similar stakeholders, which include uh, the external and internal parties as banks, but customers are the policyholders. Typically hold separate accounts for policyholders and a general account to fund future liabilities. For life insurers, liabilities are based on the primary makeup of the policyholders. It's more predictable than PNC insurance liabilities and has a long investment horizon of 20 to 40 years. But for property and casualty insurers, liabilities are more volatile, but they have lower probability of occurring 
but also a potentially high cost, and they have shorter time horizon. For both, ultimate time horizon is perpetuity. And for both, they need internal liquidity, i.e. cash, and external liquidity, i.e. the ability to issue bonds and access credit lines from commercial banks. During high interest environment, policyholders may surrender their policy and request cash out so they can earn yield at higher interest rates. So at this time, insurers face a net cash outflow risk. To manage this risk, insurers have two portfolios. One is the reserve portfolio with which they invest conservatively. And the other portfolio is a surplus portfolio with which they intend to earn higher expected returns. Insurers have the same constraints as banks and the investment objectives of insurers is also similar to banks in that it is to manage their investment portfolio with a focus on liquidity while managing interest rate, foreign exchange, credit, and other risk factors. Insurers provide high transparency to their portfolio. And typically there is an investment committee on the board that oversees the IPS, procedures, strategies, and monitor performance. Banks and insurers balance sheet management, i.e. investing assets while managing liabilities. It's based on the simple framework that assets equals liabilities plus equity, or equity equals assets minus liabilities. We can see that all changes in assets must equal to the sum of changes in the value of contractual claims and ownership interest, i.e. equity capitalization. Even small losses in the market value of assets can have a big negative effect on the equity capital account because of the leverage factor. Conversely, a small gain in assets can have a big positive impact for equity owners. To understand the impact of a change in interest rate and market value changes, the modified duration of equity capital formula is used. Refer to the formulas. Also, for the volatility of the underlying assets and liabilities using leverage, refer to the formulas. The proper way to maximize long-term economic earnings is through raising leverage through the acquisition of portfolio assets, underwriting liabilities, and the repurchase of capital stock. Reading 25, Trade Strategy and Execution. There are four motivations to trade for a trader. One is profit-seeking. Active managers seek alpha returns from what they believe are mispriced. In order to prevent information leakage or having to disclose information about their trades, they transact in multiple trades or trade in the dark pool venues, i.e. unlit venues. Although there is a higher likelihood that trade is unfilled in dark pools. Or to capitalize on their view, they must trade the order fast, i.e. they have trade urgency. And if they delay their trade, then their alpha decay is high. For long-term profit seekers, their positions are held for months or years, so minimal trading is required. Second motivation to trade is risk management or hedging. For fixed income portfolio rebalancing to match the target duration over time, which the portfolio could deviate from due to changing interest rate environment, a change in the benchmark index, or just time. For equity rebalance, to target a beta of zero relative to equity market, i.e. remain market neutral by hedging market risk. For quantitative funds, it could be to match target risk levels, so adjust the portfolio risk back to the target volatility. Third motivation to trade is cash flow needs. Depending on the circumstance, cash flow needs might require high trade urgency. Collateral and margin call could require close to immediate liquidation. Fund redemption from a long-term client might be low trade urgency. And to minimize cash drag, Fund's inflow of cash may be equitized using futures or ETFs. In most cases, client redemptions are made according to a schedule and there are lockup periods. Redemptions are based on the fund's NAV calculation, but in some cases, if cash inflows are not enough, some of the fund's holdings must be liquidated. Fourth motivation to trade is corporate actions, index reconstitution, or margin calls. These include dividend or coupon reinvestment, 
distributions, margin calls, expiration of derivative contracts. Managers try to time these activities by when they receive cash inflows, like, like contributions, but it doesn't always happen that way. Again, motivations to trade include seeking profit, rebalancing, which is risk management, because they need cash flow, or there are corporate actions or index reconstitution or margin calls to meet. Trade strategy inputs, which strategy to select. Once the manager has decided they need to make a trade, they need to make a selection on which trading strategy to follow. This decision is based on the inputs they are working with, which include order characteristics, such as side of transaction, whether it's buy, sell, cover, or short, size of the order, relative size of the order, which is percentage of average daily volume. If prices are rising, a buy order may take longer than a sell order. Larger order sizes take longer and can create a greater market impact, i.e. adverse price movement caused by trading. To have a consistent order size, Managers often divide the order size by ADV, the average daily volume. Or two, security characteristics. What type of security is it? Is it the underlying stock, ETF, ADR, etc.? Short-term alpha expected after the trade to exploit mispricing. Price volatility. Liquidity of the security. For example, what's the ADV, bid-ask spread, average trade size? Depending on alpha decay expected, manager can assess whether trading more urgently versus slowly makes sense. Or price volatility affects the execution risk, i.e. market impact because of trade and its inherent volatility. Three, market conditions. Liquidity conditions, for example, if a company gets added to an index, their shares become more widely held, so liquidity improves. Or for traders' risk aversion. For example, if more risk averse, then they are more concerned about market exposure risk, so they tend to trade with urgency to avoid market risk. But trader is faced with the dilemma of trading fast in order to avoid market impact versus trading slowly, exposing them to market risk. Reference prices for benchmarking. These reference prices are used in determining trade prices for execution, strategy, and trade costs. Pre-trade, intraday, post-trade, and price target. Pre-trade is a decision price or price at the time the manager made a decision to buy or sell. Previous close is also pre-trade. Opening price is also pre-trade. And arrival price, which is the price at the time the order is entered into for execution. Use pre-trade for post-trade evaluation. Intraday is VWAP, volume-weighted price of all trades executed over the day or trading horizon. TWAP, which is the equal weighted of all trades executed over the day or horizon. And use TWAP as a benchmark to exclude outliers. Post-trade is the closing price used by the index, managers, and mutual funds that wish to execute transactions, and used in computing tracking error. Price target, if the manager is short-term alpha seeking, they may set a price target. Trading strategies based on type or rationale for trade. The primary goal of executing any trading strategy is to balance the expected costs and risks associated with trading the order and meeting the trading objectives. One, short-term alpha trade strategy. For example, the manager believes that market overreacted to an earnings announcement earlier and expects it to neutralize. There is some trade urgency because the alpha will decay over time. The, they wouldn't trade in dark pools because it might not be filled then. And it can be executed using algorithmic trading. Two, long-term alpha trade. Expects a gradual, slow price correction. There's no order urgency in this case, so it can be executed over a period in batches, varying the amounts sold in order to reduce information leakage. Three, risk rebalance trade. For example, target risk level is 10%, 
but volatility has increased to 14%. The manager doesn't have a view on whether prices will go up or down, but they just want to reduce the volatility. It's tricky though if the portfolio is net beta of zero in terms of market exposure, because trades could throw this balance off. Trade passively without urgency as long as the volatility is within policy guideline range. 4. Client redemption trade or cash flow driven. The client wants to redeem their position and to meet the required cash, the manager sells a position. For example, 0.1% of every position held in the fund. Use the closing price as reference price. 5. New mandate trade. Let's say the manager is awarded X million dollars of new mandate to track a benchmark or invest in XYZ. The mandate will spell out if trades should be executed quickly and buy near the end of the trading day and execute over time since the amount is large. Trade execution. Trade implementation or execution choices range from human involved higher touch approaches to fully automated. Under human involved higher touch approaches, there are principal trades which are broker executed and assumes all risk associated with trading the order, or agency trades, where the broker finds the other side of the trade. In these trades, market makers and dealers act as the counterparty. Includes quote-driven, OTC, or off-exchange markets. Dealers may work for commercial banks, investment banks, or broker-dealers or proprietary trading. Quotes can be requested in a variation of quote-driven market via request for quotes, RFQs. Under fully automated implementation execution, there's electronic trading, which includes alternative or multilateral trading venues, ATS or MTF, direct market access, DMA, and dark pools. In these order-driven markets using algorithmic trading, there are a set of instructions with the goal of executing the order successfully and or seek profit using an algorithm. These example set of instructions include VWAP algorithm. Trade X number of shares between a certain time period sliced into smaller orders, of which the volume for each order follows volume weighted average order size profiles historically. Usually higher percentage of orders are at open and at close. 2. TWAP algorithm. Trade X number of shares in smaller amounts equally specified schedules. 3. Percentage of volume or POV algorithm, aka participation algorithm. Specify the participation volume trading schedule, for example, buy or sell 10% of volume until fully executed. 4. Liquidity Seeking Algorithm, aka Opportunistic Algorithm. Trades faster when liquidity exists at a favorable price and on multiple venues, including dark pools, and it's good for when there are large orders that need to be executed quickly and if liquidity is relatively thinly traded or episodic. 5. Arrival Price Algorithm. Trades close to the price at which the time the order was placed for execution. Arrival is also called order. So trades more aggressively at the beginning of the trade. This is also called front-loaded strategy. 6. Dark aggregator algorithm, which is execute away from lit venues to prevent information leakage. Used when order size is large relative to the market, illiquid, or have wide bid-ask spreads and do not all need to be filled because dark venues or dark pools tend not to be filled 100%. And seven, smart order routers, SORs. SOAR, smart order routers, will determine venue with best market price and highest probability of executing the order. This is good for small orders. Market orders that are small and small limit orders, both. Trade implementation for different markets. For equities, They're generally traded on exchanges and dark pools. More than 40 dark pools and alternative trading systems exist globally. Algorithmic trading is common. Most trades are electronic. Large, urgent trades, particularly in less liquid small cap stocks, 
are generally executed as high-touch broker, tra- broker risk trades, where the broker acts as the dealer and the counterparty. Versus large non-urgent trades are executed on algorithmic trading. For fixed income, they are generally traded in bilateral, dealer-centric market structure. Investors will get quotes from dealers, often banks, which act as the market makers on chat via Symphony or Bloomberg or electronic RFQ platforms if small trades or large urgent trades. There's some algorithmic trading, but still not much. Exchange-traded derivatives, similar to exchange-traded equities, the market transparency is high. Large urgent trades sweep the book where the market depth is good, meaning the order is filled immediately based on best possible price. Large non-urgent trades are generally implemented electronically through algorithmic trading and direct market access. OTC derivatives are opaque markets with little public data. Trading takes place through dealers. Trading sizes are large. Large urgent trades done through broker risk trades, i.e. risk is transferred to broker who takes the contract into their inventory. Large non-urgent trades are done using a high-touch agency trade where the broker attempts to match buyers and sellers directly. Spot foreign exchange currency? There's no exchange that exists. It's entirely OTC market. At the top level, large international banks with financial institutions as dealers. Extremely large orders. These are called interbank markets. The second level is when small and medium-sized banks that turn to dealers in the interbank market. And the third level, one level down, is when commercial companies and retail traders that turn to the second level institutions to be dealers for their currency needs. Electronic trading has grown in parallel with algorithmic trading of equities. For large urgent trades, RFQs are submitted to multiple dealers competing for a trade. Large non-urgent trades are executed using algorithms, for example using TWAP or High Touch Agency. Small trades are done in the direct market. Trade governance. Trade policy is mandated by the SEC and needs to include these key aspects. Meaning of best execution. This considers execution price, trading cost, speed of execution, likelihood of filling the order, order size, and nature of the trade. It must specify the criteria to achieve optimal order execution for each asset class. The urgency of order, profile of securities being traded, for example, their liquidity, execution venues, investment strategy objectives, and rationale for trade per asset class. Listing of eligible brokers and execution venues. Based on the quality of service, financial stability of the brokers and venues, reputation, settlement capabilities, speed of execution, and cost competitiveness are all detailed out. Process to monitor execution. That check execution quality, balance between trading costs and opportunity costs, keep trading records, and evaluate the success client regulator concerns. Trade cost measurement. Implementation shortfall, there are three types. Refer to the formulas. Evaluating trade execution, aka trade cost evaluation, trade cost analysis, post-trade analysis. It evaluates and measures the execution quality of the trade and overall performance of the trader, broker, and or algorithm. It evaluates against a benchmark or a reference price. The cost can be expressed in dollar, dollar per share, or BIPs. For a dollar, it's basically the average execution price of an order minus the reference price times the shares. Basically, it tells you that you wanted to sell it or buy it at the reference price, but you couldn't, and you could only do it at the average execution price, so what's the difference that cost you? And for a per share cost, you don't multiply it by the number of shares. And for BIPs, you divide the execution price minus the reference price, divide it by the reference price to get the percentage, and then you multiply it by 10,000 BIPs, or 10 to the 4.
and the cost is positive for a buy order or negative for a sell order. Positive value means underperformance compared to the benchmark. Negative performance means savings were accomplished, and vice versa if it's a sell order. P star, the reference price, can be any of the following. Arrival price, or also called order price, is the price when you put in the order. When you use it to find the trade cost, it basically tells you the cost of the order incurred outside of your control while waiting for the order to be filled. Don't confuse order price or arrival price with decision price. VWAP, when used in the trade cost calculation, measures whether they received fair and reasonable prices over the trading period when used in the above calculation. TWAP, similar to VWAP, measures whether you received fair prices over the trading period. Market on close, used primarily by index managers and mutual funds that wish to achieve the closing price on the day and compare their actual prices with the closing price. This is because for mutual funds, they execute the trade after the close. Taking it a step further, the manager can use the market adjusted cost to understand whether there was trading cost due to the general market movement rather than specifically the security they are trading i.e. the price drift that would have occurred in the security even if the order was not placed in the market. Market adjusted cost is equal to the arrival cost in BIPs, which is the executed price minus arrival price divided by the execution price, minus beta times the index cost in BIPs. Beta is just the stock beta to the index, and index cost is equal to plus or minus for buy or sell, times index VWAP minus index arrival price divided by index arrival price times 10 to the 4 pips. Another measure of trading cost is comparing the arrival cost to an expected pre-trade cost calculated using a model that factors in order size, volatility, market liquidity, investor risk aversion, urgency, market conditions, etc. Added value in pips is equal to arrival cost minus estimated pre-trade cost. Reading 26, Portfolio Performance Evaluation. Performance evaluation has three components. Performance measurement, which is the overall indication of the portfolio's performance relative to benchmark. For example, absolute return, excess return, VAR. Performance attribution, which is what portion of returns was driven by active manager decisions versus not the result of their target. It helps to explain why the portfolio over or underperformed the benchmark. And performance appraisal, which is the quality of the portfolio's performance. This is used to distinguish the manager's skill from luck and the likelihood they will generate superior performance again. For example, sharp ratio, sortino, capture ratios, etc. Under performance attribution, there is macro versus micro. Macro attribution evaluates asset owners, tactical asset allocation, and manager selection. Macro attribution measures the effect of the sponsor's choice to deviate from the strategic asset allocation and manager selection decisions. And micro attribution is when you look at the individual manager's impact of their allocation and security selection decisions on the total fund performance. Also under attribution, returns-based attribution uses total portfolio returns to dissect because the underlying portfolio holdings data is not available. Holdings-based attribution only looks at the beginning of period holdings to analyze the return. Transaction-based attribution looks at holdings and new transactions over the period to analyze returns. Equity return attribution. Arithmetic attribution is the portfolio return minus the benchmark return, i.e. the excess return. Geometric attribution is when you take the portfolio return, add it by one, and divide it by the benchmark return plus one, and then minus one of that is the excess return geometrically found. Security selection return answers the question, was the return achieved by selecting the securities that performed well relative to the benchmark, or by avoiding benchmark securities that performed poorly? 
and asset allocation return answers the question, was the return achieved by choosing to overweight an asset category, for example, economic sector or currency that outperformed the total benchmark or underweighted an asset category in the benchmark that performed poorly? The BHB model for dissecting return attribution breaks the attribution into three parts, allocation effect, security selection effect, and interaction effect. Allocation effect is the weighting, and security selection effect is the actual securities that the manager chose or not chose compared to the benchmark. And interaction effect is the leftover. Security selection and interaction effect are usually added together. To calculate the allocation effect for each sector, subtract the weighting of the asset in the portfolio minus weighting of the asset in the benchmark. Multiply that answer by the return of the asset in the benchmark. And for the entire portfolio, do that for each sector and then sum it up. For security selection effect, take the return of the asset in the portfolio minus by return of that asset in the benchmark and then take that and multiply it to the weighting of the asset in the benchmark. And for the whole portfolio, do that for each sector and sum it up. Then for the interaction effect, it is the weighting of the asset in the portfolio minus the weighting of the asset in the benchmark. Take that and multiply it by the return of the asset in the portfolio minus the return of the asset in the benchmark. And do that for each sector and sum it up. Using the BF model, the Brinson Faulkner model though, it's the same calculation for the security selection effect and the interaction effect. The only difference is for allocation effect, you take the weighting of the asset in the portfolio minus weighting of the asset in the benchmark, take that and multiply it by the return of the asset in the benchmark minus return of the total in the benchmark. And the BF model is assumed to be used unless otherwise specified. So make sure you multiply the weighting difference for the asset by the asset's benchmark return minus the total return of the benchmark. Another equity return attribution is factor-based called Carhart four-factor model. It explains the excess return on the portfolio in terms of the portfolio's sensitivity to a market index, market cap, book value to price factor, momentum, and unexplained error. So the return of the portfolio minus the risk-free rate, i.e. the excess return, is equal to the alpha return in excess of returns given exposure to systematic risk plus all of the explained returns, which are from the beta, i.e. the sensitivity, times RMRF, which is the return on the value-weighted equity index, plus beta 2 times the SMB, which is average return on three small market cap portfolios minus average return on three large cap portfolios, plus beta 3 times HML, which is average return on two high book to market value portfolios minus average return of two low book to market portfolios. Plus beta four times WML, which is the return on portfolio of the past year's winners minus the losers. And then finally, plus the error, which is not explained by the model. Again, the four factors are valuated equity index, SMB, which is market cap based, so small minus large, and HML, which is book value to price, i.e. high book value to low book price, and finally for WML, which is winners minus losers for momentum. Next, fixed income return attribution. There are three typical approaches. One is exposure decomposition duration based. It's a top-down attribution analysis, similar to the BF model for equity return attribution. You group the portfolio and the benchmark returns and weights by type of fixed income asset, similar to the sector, but additionally subgroup by length of duration. Then analyze the return attributable to duration, yield curve, sector allocation, interest rate allocation, bond selection, etc. 
Two, yield curve decomposition, duration-based. It's either top-down or bottom-up, uses duration and yield to maturity, and further broken down into yield curve and spread factors to calculate the returns attributable to changes in the yield levels, slope, and curvature, and how manager made decisions among these available bonds. For example, return from income plus return from price appreciation is kind of equal to minus duration times the change in yield to maturity. And three, yield curve decomposition, full repricing. Recall that a bond's price is the sum of its cash flows discounted at the appropriate spot price using a zero coupon curve for each cash flow maturity. Each discount rate at different cash flow maturity can be repriced for incremental cash flow and basically explains the attribution of where the return comes from. Note that these fixed income return attribution analyses approaches will be presented in tables and for the curriculum we just have to interpret the data that's presented and do not need to calculate them. So for example, given the tables with the portfolio weights and the benchmark weights and the portfolio duration for each sector and the benchmark duration, questions might infer about why the manager made decisions. For example, higher duration for the corporate bonds in the portfolio than the benchmark means that manager likely expected the interest rates to fall and took a bullish position on long-term bonds by increasing the exposure to the long end of the curve. Or if the corporate sector is overweight compared to the benchmark, it might be because the manager likely expected credit spreads to narrow. This makes the contribution to duration higher and increases market yield fluctuations in the corporate sector. And the data can be presented in a slightly different table where for each duration bucket, short, medium, long, and for each sector, whether government or corporate, it can also show the duration effect, curve effect, interest rate allocation, sector allocation, and bond selection. So this table would show the attribution of the manager's decisions of performance versus the table discussed above or before would show the weighting differences. Duration effect is the sensitivity to changes in the interest rate, and curve effect is the sensitivity to changes in the yield curve shape. Sector allocation is the weighting differences, overweighting or underweighting compared to the benchmark, and bond selection is the manager choosing different individual bond selections compared to the benchmark. So for example, if under duration effect, the total has minus 0.62%, that might mean that 62 bips were lost by taking a long duration position when yields increased. And how do we know if the yields increased? It would be given by the overweighting in the long duration bonds in the other table. We can also decompose the yield curve by the maturity of the bond in order to analyze active return contribution. For example, you might have a table with government bonds of different maturities and corporate bonds with different maturities, and the return attribution can come from yield, roll, shift, slope, curvature, spread, specific, residual, or total. Yield explains the return attribution from investing in bonds with longer maturities or shorter maturity. Roll return attribution is from overweighting on the part of the yield curve where it's flatter or steeper. Shift comes from overall duration being higher or lower than the benchmark. Slope is due to flattening or steepening. Curvature comes from reshaping of the curve resulting in larger return changes as the yield changes. And specific is due to that specific type of bond. Risk attribution. Risk attribution identifies the, sor the sources of risk. For absolute mandates, it identifies the sources of portfolio volatility. For benchmark relative mandates, it identifies the sources of tracking risk. 
Managers seek opportunities for profit by taking exposures to risk. Risk attribution explains only where risk was introduced into the portfolio. Risk attribution needs to be combined with return attribution to understand the full impact of those decisions. Selecting the appropriate risk attribution approach. For a bottom-up investment decision-making process, if the type of attribution analysis is absolute, then look at the position's marginal contribution to total risk. If the type of attribution analysis is relative, i.e. versus benchmark, then look at the position's marginal contribution to tracking risk. For a top-down approach, if the type of attribution analysis is absolute, then look at factors marginal contribution to total risk and specific risk. And if it's relative attribution analysis, look at the tracking risk attribution relative to allocation and selection effect. And if it's factor-based, then for absolute attribution analysis, look at the factors marginal contribution to total risk and specific risk. And for relative, look at the factors marginal contribution to tracking risk and active specific risk. Note this is in a different section, but when you are looking at excess return over marginal contribution to total risk, the portfolio is efficient if that is the same for all of the assets and equal to the Sharpe ratio. Return attribution analysis at multiple levels. We looked at this before, but there is macro attribution where the fund sponsor, such as a university endowment or a DB pension plan, they select multiple investment managers specializing in different asset classes and styles and analyze their return attribution. Versus a micro attribution, it goes down even further into each manager's style and approach. Asset-based and liability-based benchmarks. Liability-based benchmarks focus on cash flows that the asset must generate to pay specific future liabilities. A well-diversified portfolio of individual bonds that minimize idiosyncratic risk could be used as the benchmark. More recently, there are liability-driven investment indexes. Asset-based benchmarks. There are seven types. There's Absolute return benchmarks, for example, minimum target return that the manager is expected to beat, or it can be stated as a minimum percentage or a spread above a market index, or determined from actuarial assumptions. They're expected to be insensitive to broad equity markets. Second one is broad market indexes. Third type of asset-based benchmark is style index. Fourth is factor model-based benchmarks which is constructed to more closely capture the investment. To determine factors, use regression analysis of the portfolio returns against the factors. Fifth asset-based benchmark is returns-based or sharp style analysis benchmarks. This is similar to factor-based, but it uses optimization procedures to force the portfolio's sensitivities to be non-negative and sum to one. Manager universe or peer group is another asset-based benchmark, group of managers performance with similar investment disciplines. Weaknesses of this approach are that some may have tilts or constraints that create a different portfolio holding than the median manager. And finally, the seventh asset-based benchmark is a custom security-based benchmark, more precisely reflects the manager's investment discipline because it's constructed by selecting securities and weightings consistent with the manager's investment process and client restrictions. It's also called strategy benchmarks. Benchmark properties, evaluating benchmark quality and choosing the correct benchmark. A valid benchmark must satisfy the following criteria. One, it's unambiguous. Individual securities are clearly identifiable. Two, it's investable. It's possible to replicate it. Three, it's measurable, possible to measure the benchmark. Four, it's appropriate, consistent with the manager's style and area. Five, it's reflective of current investment opinions. Six, specified in advance before the evaluation period. And seven, it's accountable. The sponsor assumes the responsibility for any discrepancies between the targeted portfolio for the fund and the benchmark and the manager assumes responsibility for tracking error in the performance. 
To evaluate the quality of the benchmark, we can decompose the portfolio return to find what the investment manager's style return is. Portfolio return is equal to the benchmark return plus the active return. If you introduce the market index return by adding it and subtracting it, so that portfolio return is equal to market index return plus the benchmark return minus the market index return again, so they cancel out, plus the active return. The two middle terms, which is the benchmark return minus market return, is the manager's style return. Then we can run correlations to search for systematic biases. A good benchmark will have a statistically significant positive correlation coefficient between the style return and the, and the portfolio minus the market return. Importance of choosing the correct benchmark include, if benchmarks are misspecified, the performance measures will be incorrect, attribution and appraisal analysis will be useless, and it can lead to mismeasurement of the value added by the portfolio managers. Benchmarking alternative investments. For hedge fund investments, benchmark used include a risk-free rate like LIBOR plus a spread, for example, three to 6% spread. In the case that the hedge fund is levered, adjust the spread upward. You can potentially use a peer universe as a benchmark, but it has limitations in that the risk and return characteristics will vary, it will suffer from survivorship bias and backfill bias, and it's often self-reported, so it may be inaccurate. For real estate investments, numerous private real estate indexes are available as benchmarks, but limitations include it's based on a subset and not fully representative of the asset class, it's biased because it's manager-reported performance, it's based on smoothed appraisals, it has varying degrees of leverage in the underlying, and it does not reflect the high transaction cost and limited transparency and lack of liquidity. For private equity, calculate their own IRR from expected cash flows at the inception of the investment and use that as the benchmark. Or Cambridge Associates provides IRR estimates for PE funds. Limitations of peer comparisons though, include valuation methodology used by managers being different, IRR can be influenced by early loss or win, provided data can be from different point in time of the investment stages. Public market equivalent or PME has been developed for PE IRRs to compare to. For commodity investments, indexes based on the performance of futures-based commodity investments tend to be used as indexes. Limitations of that is use of derivatives is not representative of the asset class, varying degrees of leverage among funds, and discretionary weighting of exposures within the index. For managed derivatives, indexes do not exist for derivatives. Benchmarks are typically specific to a single investment strategy, and it's mostly based on peer groups. For distressed securities, it's difficult to find suitable benchmarks it takes a very long time for strategy to play out. Performance appraisal, risk-based measures. Appraisals are used to rank investment managers who follow similar investment disciplines, whereas return attribution provides more detail about the manager's investment decisions. Performance appraisal distinguishes investment skill from luck. You should know the following appraisal measures. Refer to the formulas to know what the formula is for each. Sharp ratio measures historical risk-adjusted excess returns. Limitation is using standard deviation as a risk measure, which assumes that the investor is indifferent about upside or downside volatility. Trainer ratio measures the excess returns per unit of systematic risk using a market benchmarks data. Information ratio assesses performance relative to benchmark per unit of tracking risk. Appraisal ratio, aka trainer black, analyzes annualized alpha per unit of annualized residual risk. It measures the reward of active management relative to risk of active ma management. It's used to evaluate whether excess return warrants the additional non-systematic risk taken in the active management. 
Sortino ratio is a modification of sharp but only looks at return above a minimal acceptable return f for the target return. And risk measure is only the downside risk, aka target semi-standard deviation. It's useful for investments that have skew, i.e. not symmetrical. It's used when a primary objective is capital preservation. The minimal acceptable return is investor specific, so it's difficult to make it applicable to investors. Capture ratios look at upside capture, which is the geometric average of returns in a period only when it's positive, and downside capture, which is the geometric average of returns in only the periods where it's negative. And for the upside and downside capture, you take the geometric average of the upside or the downside returns of the portfolio and do the same thing for the benchmark and divide the portfolio by the geometric average of the benchmark. For upside capture, if it's over 100%, it means there was outperformance relative to the benchmark. For downside capture, if it's less than 100%, it means outperformance relative to the benchmark. And capture ratio is when you take that upside capture and divide it by the downside capture. If it's above one, then it means positive asymmetric or convex return profile. And drawdown measures the cumulative peak to trough loss in a continuous period. Recovery, aka drawdown duration, is the trough back to zero. Some notes on drawdowns. Limiting, limiting drawdowns can result in better absolute and risk-adjusted returns in certain markets. Drawdowns are stress tests of the investment process and provides a natural point to evaluate and improve processes. Investors with shorter investing horizons or lower risk capacity may bias toward selecting managers with shorter expected drawdowns. Reading 27, Investment Manager Selection. Framework for Manager Search and Selection Step 1. Define the universe of investment managers that fit the portfolio needs, including suitability, style, active versus passive. Step 2. Quantitative analysis, including attribution and appraisal, capture ratio and drawdowns. Step 3. Qualitative analysis. Investment philosophy. What is their strategy that captures market inefficiency? Process. Is the process able to exploit their strategy sustainably? People. Do they have expertise and experience? Portfolio consistent with philosophy and process? Operational due diligence. Process and procedure. Strong back office? Firm. Is it profitable? Does it have a healthy culture? Stable and committed? Investment vehicle. What are they using for the investment and is it suitable? Terms. Are they acceptable and appropriate? Monitoring. Are they good at the monitoring process? Defining the manager. Search starts with choosing a benchmark that you want, which will represent the new manager's role within the portfolio. Once you have a benchmark, assign available managers to a benchmark by categorizing the manager based on a third-party database, which assigns the manager already. Analyze the manager's actual return and do a returns-based style analysis to determine their style or do a holdings-based style analysis of the manager's portfolio to determine their style. Assign a style that manager follows based on their experience and expertise. Most commonly, a hybrid approach of the above is done. Once style and strategy of managers is determined, then pool the similar managers together. Type 1 and Type 2 errors in manager selection. The null hypothesis is that manager is not skillful. Type 1 error is that they hired the manager, but they underperformed. Type 2 error is that they did not hire the manager, and it turns out they outperformed. Note, see if the question is asking if the error already happened, or if the error is at risk of happening in the future, because the answer will be opposite from each other. Type 1 errors tend to worry decision makers more, because psychologically, people seek to avoid feelings of regret, and type 1 errors actually create explicit costs. Type 1 errors are relatively straightforward to measure, because they're still with you and it shows up when calculating their compensation. More transparent to investors as well for type 1, so you have to explain your mistakes to the investors. 
When type 2 errors are a consistent pattern with your fund, it shows weaknesses in the manager selection process. You have to monitor managers hired and not hired in order to determine any consistent factors overlooked, are the factors consistent with philosophy and process, are there any patterns or correlations the decision maker keeps making decisions on? The objective of monitoring is to avoid making decisions based on short-term performance and to identify behavioral biases in evaluating managers during the selection process. Quantitative analysis. Performance appraisals and attribution capture most aspects of quantitative analysis, but equally important is a manager's risk profile, i.e. what risks do they expose their portfolio to? This is expressed in terms of their investment style. The manager's style analysis will also help determine if they are consistent with what they say their investment philosophy and process are and their risk management. Tracking their style over time also allows you to see if they have a style drift. The two style analyses that we've already talked about are returns-based style analysis or holdings-based style analysis. Returns-based is top-down approach that involves estimating portfolios sensitivities to an index using factors and their actual historical returns regressed. It's imprecise and might not reflect the current portfolio style. Versus holdings-based is bottom-up approach because you're basically opening up the kimono and seeing what's there. It estimates the risk exposures from the current or a past point in time portfolio. It's easier with equities, but it's complex in computation. Holdings-based analysis tends to be more accurate. To be meaningful, style analyses must be meaningful, i.e. source of performance is important, accurate, consistent, and timely, i.e. it's not stale data. Analyzing a manager's active share and tracking risk also helps you determine what type of manager's investment style is. Active share is the difference between the portfolio holdings relative to the benchmark. If the active share is low and the tracking risk is low, then they are a closet indexer. If the active share is high and their tracking risk is still low, they are diversified stock pickers. If the active share is low and their tracking risk is high, they are sector rotators. If their active share is high and their tracking risk is high, then they are concentrated stock pickers. Next, qualitative analysis. When doing due diligence on the manager's investment philosophy, ask questions such as, what does the manager believe is causing market efficiencies that they can exploit to make excess return on? Behavioral inefficiencies of market participants or structural inefficiencies by external or internal rules and regulations? Are these beliefs reasonable and credible? Have the managers consistently had these philosophy? Does the manager even have enough capacity to deliver on these philosophy beliefs, i.e. team and other resources? Is the inefficiency sustainable and does it provide enough opportunity in terms of level and frequency to cover costs and fees of acting on the beliefs to exploit the inefficiency? Next, investment personnel. Does the team have expertise and experience to act on the beliefs? What is the level of key person risk? What's the turnover of personnel? Are there incentives to attract and retain key employees? When doing investment decision-making process, there are four elements. One is signal creation, idea generation. Ask yourself, how are investment ideas generated by the manager? Does the manager have unique information? Do they have timely information they act on? Do they interpret information in a unique way to their advantage? The second part of the investment decision-making process is signal capture, which is idea implementation. Ask, is their process to turn idea into investment position feasible, repeatable, and consistent? Who is responsible for approving the investment position? Step three of the investment decision-making process is portfolio construction. Ask yourself, how are the allocations set and adjusted? Are, is the manager's portfolio construction consistent with the philosophy and process? How has the portfolio changed with asset growth? 
Does the portfolio use stop loss to manage risk? What types of securities are used? Does the manager have expertise and experience investing in these? Are hedges used? How? What percentage of portfolio can be liquidated in 5 days or 10 days? Is there any suspension from trading? Any holdings across portfolios that are at least 5% of market cap? What's the firm's trading strategy? And step 4 is monitoring and portfolio performance risk profile and construction. Or I should say monitoring the portfolio performance risk profile and construction. There are external considerations such as economic and financial market environment and also internal considerations. Now, next is operational due diligence. Regardless of if the investment process is good, funds are still a business, so they need to be assessed for the business's integrity. Businesses need to have strong back office and a robust training process that reduces or eliminates human error. What's the firm's trading policy? Are they compliant if the firm uses soft dollar commissions? How do they protect against unauthorized trading? How are fees calculated and collected? Is the allocation method objective? What IT offsite backup facilities are in place? Is the firm's infrastructure capable of implementing different strategies? Is there cybersecurity protection in place? If they use third party service providers, are they well known and respected? Do they change frequently? If, it, if that is the case, this is a red flag. And in terms of their risk management function, does the portfolio have any hard or soft investment guidelines? Do they have a risk policy manual? How are these guidelines monitored? Who is responsible for risk management? Is there an independent risk officer? What is the procedure for curing breaches? When it comes to doing due diligence on the firm, look at total firm AUM and AUM by investment strategy. What's the firm's break-even AUM? What's their ownership structure? Is it close to new capital? How much is the new capital that the firm is raising? Alignment of interest for the firm and the employees? Are there any legal battles or track record of both firm and employees liabilities? When looking at investment vehicle, it can either be separate managed accounts or commingled vehicles like mutual funds, ETFs, hedge funds, exchange traded notes. Separate managed accounts advantages include each individual investor owning the securities directly. So if there is a liquidity event, then firm wide, then individual is protected or investor can customize and it's more tax efficient because it's only taxed on their own capital gains realized. And there's transparency on what they own in the holdings. But disadvantages of SMA is operational burden on the manager, which translates into higher costs for the individual investor, because there's no economy of scale, tracking risk created by investor constraints rather than the manager's decisions, and potential micromanagement by the investor. Investment terms in the prospectus, private placement memo, and or a limited partnership agreement lists the liquidity terms, such as the investment time horizon, redemption frequency, notification period to redeem, lockup, gates, which is our limits of amount that investor can redeem at a time. For SMA accounts though, this doesn't matter because the investor can sell any time. And finally, management fees. There can be assets under management fees, which is usually a percentage of AUM, performance-based fees, which can be structured as a symmetrical structure where the manager is fully exposed to the downside and upside, i.e. base fee plus share of performance. Two, only share in the upside, i.e. base fee plus share of performance only if it's positive. Or three, share in the downside or upside up to a limit i.e. base plus share of performance up to a limit only if it's positive or downside. Performance fees are typically paid annually or less frequently, may include maximum or high watermark or clawback. The next few readings are case studies, so there are no notes on that, but a few things to remember from reading 28 
is liquidity management tools include doing a ca- time to cash table, which classifies assets in a portfolio based on liquidity and liquidity profiling. Rebalancing and capital commitments is another liquidity management tool. Stress testing to understand how liquidity profile changes and use of derivatives. Next, ethics. Specifically, code of ethics. There are six to remember. One, act with integrity and in an ethical manner. Two, place profession and clients before the personal interests. Three, use independent and care in investment analysis and recommendation. Four, encourage others to act ethically and professionally. Five, promote integrity of capital markets. And six, maintain and improve competence. As for the standards, there are seven. Remember the numbers 425-3332. The first three numbers, 425, add up to 11, and the last four, which are 3332, add up to 11. Those are how many sub-points there are to remember for each of the standard. For example, the first one, professionalism, has four sub-points. A. Knowledge of the law, independence and objectivity, misrepresentation and misconduct. 2. Integrity of capital markets has two subpoints: Material non-public information and market manipulation. 3. Duties to clients has five sub-bullets. Loyalty, prudence and care, fair dealing, suitability, performance presentation, and preservation of confidentiality. 5. Duties to employers has three subpoints: Loyalty, additional compensation arrangements, responsibilities of supervisors. 5. Investment analysis, recommendations, and actions has three sub-bullets, diligence and reasonable basis, communication with clients and prospective clients, and record retention. 6. Conflicts of interest has three points, disclosure of conflicts, priority of transactions, and referral fees. And 7. Responsibilities as a CFA institute member or candidate has two sub-bullets, conduct as participants in CFA Institute programs, and reference to CFA Institute, CFA designation, and the CFA program. Next, Asset Manager Code. There are six to remember and basically are a variation of the standards. A. Loyalty to clients. B. Investment process and actions. C. Trading including market manipulation and priority to clients. D, risk management, compliance and support. E, performance and valuation. And F, disclosures. But it is for the firm to adopt, not for a member. Next, some notes on the global investment performance standards. First, the scope. Only investment management firms and asset owners that manage on a discretionary basis and compete for business can claim compliance with GIPS. If they don't compete for business, then there is a GIPS standards for asset owners. If they're not asset managers, then they may not claim GIPS compliance. Firms may claim compliance only on a firm-wide basis, not not on just some of their composites. The five objectives of GIP standards are to promote investor interests and instill investor confidence, ensure accurate and consistent data, obtain worldwide acceptance of a single standard for calculating and presenting performance, promote fair global competition among investment firms, and promote industry self-regulation on a global basis. Note that GIP's compliance is only for how the information is presented and not on the accuracy of the calculations that are presented. There are eight sections of the GIPS standards. One, fundamentals of compliance. Two, input data and calculation methodology. Three, composite and pooled fund maintenance. Four, composite time-weighted return report. Five, composite money-weighted return report. Six, pooled fund time-weighted report. 7. Pooled Fund Money Weighted Return Report, and 8. GIPS Advertising Guidelines. Under the fundamentals of compliance, you have to know how to define the firm. And it's basically when a distinct business entity, or if a business unit, 
has been segregated from other units and has total autonomy over the investment decision-making process, including the traders who just take orders. Total firm assets is the aggregate fair value, remember fair value of all assets, whether or not it's discretionary or fee-paying. Both discretionary and non-discretionary portfolios and fee and non-fee-paying portfolios are included in the total firm assets, but when including in composites, only discretionary portfolios are included. The JIP standards requires the use of time-weighted returns. During a period, if there are no external cash flows in or out, then simply the time-weighted return is the value of the portfolio at the end of the period minus value at the beginning divided by value at the beginning. If there are large external cash flows, then the methodology is again V1 minus V0 over V0, but you take out the large cash inflow from the V1 and you measure the V1 and V0 calculations every time there was a new external cash flow and then use geometric return to link those together. If the cash flows, external cash flows are small, then the methodology to use is the modified Dietz method. That is V1 minus V0 minus the cash flow received divided by V0 plus the sum of the number of days that the cash flow was in times the cash flow in. And there's the modified IRR method where the internal rate of return for the period is measured, adjusting to take into account the timing of the cash flows. A firm can choose to use the money-weighted returns instead of time-weighted returns though, if the firm has control over the external cash flows and the portfolios are closed-ended, fixed life or fixed commitment, or they are for illiquid investments. Note that returns for periods of less than one year must not be annualized. Returns from cash and cash equivalents in the portfolios must be included in all total return calculations. The returns must be calculated after the deduction of transaction costs incurred during the period. These costs include brokerage commissions, exchange fees and or taxes, spreads from either internal or external brokers. And for private investments, they also include legal, financial, advisory, and investment banking fees. Custody fees should not be included. If there were investments considered but did not make it into the fund, then transaction costs associated with those investments should not be included. If there are bundled fees and you can't separate that out for composites, then the entire bundled fee should be deducted from the returns or bundled fee that includes the transaction costs, just the portion of that. GIPS requires that fair value is used. If fair value methodology via an objective, observable, and unadjusted quoted market prices are not available, then the following alternatives can be used in order of rank. One, quoted price for similar investments in active markets. Two, quoted prices for identical or similar investments in markets that are not active. Three, market-based inputs other than quoted prices that are observable for the investment. And four, subjective unobservable inputs that the firm determines as fair value. A composite is aggregating one or more portfolios that are managed according to a similar investment mandate, objective, or strategy. To prevent only presenting the best performing portfolios, GIP standards require that all actual fee-paying discretionary segregated accounts must be included in at least one composite. And actual fee-paying discretionary pooled funds must also be included in at least one composite if they meet a composite definition. Non-fee-paying discretionary segregated accounts and pooled funds may be included in the composite, but additional disclosures may be required. For example, this can be a public service or pro bono non-fee-paying discretionary account. The firm does not need to create a composite for a strategy if it is offered only as one pooled fund. Time-weighted composite returns must be calculated in one of three ways, 
asset weighting the individual portfolio returns using beginning of period values, or using a method that reflects both beginning of period values and external cash flows, or using the aggregate return method. If a client's constraints does not allow the investment manager to use discretion and is considered material, then the manager may include that portfolio in a composite with other similarly constrained portfolios or classify it as non-discretionary and exclude the portfolio from all composites altogether. A hypothetical or a simulated model portfolio must not be included in any composite and must not be linked to any actual performance. This can be shown as supplemental information, but not in the actual presentation of the portfolio's returns. On the other hand, if the firm actually created a new strategy and used its own seed money, then it can be included in the portfolios and the appropriate composite. To summarize, all actual fee-paying discretionary segregated accounts must be included in at least one composite. Discretionary segregated accounts that are non-fee-paying may be included in composites, but neither non-discretionary nor simulated or model portfolios may be included in any composite. Pooled funds must be included in any composite for which they meet the composite definition. A composite must include all portfolios that meet the composite definition. Firms can also define the composites based on the portfolio's benchmarks, as long as the benchmarks reflect the investment strategy and the firm has no other composites with the same characteristics. Firms must include terminated portfolios in the historical performance for the appropriate composite until the last full measurement period in which the firm had the discretion to manage that portfolio to the strategy. Portfolios must not be switched from one composite to another unless there are documented changes in the portfolio's investment mandate, objective or strategy, or the redefinition of the composite makes it appropriate. The historical performance of the portfolio must remain with the original composite. A portfolio can be switched from one composite to another if the client revises the mandate, or a portfolio can be reassigned to another composite if the original composite is redefined in such a way that the portfolio no longer fits. In the event of significant cash flows, a portfolio may be temporarily removed from the composite, or firms may use temporary new accounts to remove the effect of a significant cash flow. If a portfolio is removed from a composite because it fell below the minimum, its prior performance must remain in the composite. There are two types of GIPS reports. One is the GIPS composite report and the other is GIPS pooled fund report. And for each GIPS composite report that includes time-weighted returns, the standards require that firms show at least five years of annual performance unless the composite has been in existence for less than five years and that the GIPS compliant performance must then be extended each year until at least 10 years of performance has been presented. The required elements of a GIPS composite report are composite and benchmark annual returns for all years, the number of portfolios, if six or more, in the composite at each period end, the amount of assets in the composite, the amount of total firm assets at the end of each period, a measure of internal dispersion of individual portfolio returns for each annual period if the composite contains six or more portfolios for the full year, and if monthly composite returns are available, a three-year annualized ex-post standard deviation of the composite and benchmark return as of each annual period end. Note that internal dispersion means a measure of the spread of the annual returns of individual portfolios within a composite, and it indicates that acceptable measures include, but are not limited to, high, low, range, equal weighted, asset weighted standard deviation of portfolio returns. So again, if there are six or more portfolios in the composite, the two elements that need to be included are the number of portfolios and a measure of internal dispersion, but these two are not required if there are five or less portfolios in the composite. If a firm acquires another firm, in terms of 
portability of past performance. The requirements apply on a composite-specific basis, and substantially all the investment decision makers need to be employed by the new or acquiring firm in order to be able to port it. The decision-making process remains substantially intact and independent within the new firm. The new or acquiring firm has records that document and support the reported performance, and there is no break in the track record between the past firm or affiliation and the new or acquiring firm. If there is a break in the track record between the past firm and the new firm, and if the three, first three portability tests are met, then the performance from the past firm may be used to represent the historical performance of the new firm, but the two performance records may not be linked. GIPS does not require verification, but they recommend that the firm undergo verification. The verification process provides assurance on whether the firm's policies and procedures related to composite and pooled fund maintenance, as well as the calculation, presentation, and distribution of performance have been designed in compliance with the GIP standards and have been implemented on a firm-wide basis. Again, verification is not for the accuracy of the calculation, but whether the firm is in compliance or not.